Well, they, they're not either a health care worker and they're not in an assisted living or they're not in an emergency. And so, therefore, they don't qualify. <laughs> for the ID now. For the ID now. They so, so we're – but Annette's point is I wouldn't even use it for those groups if I can't show – that a positive is a positive and a negative is a negative. Absolutely. So I think that this has been a really good exercise and a lot of the interesting how did we get from here to there and uh, where we're going, which is we are getting more kits. But So when we use the word kit, just remember that word, what kind of kit? What do you really mean? It's just an interesting word to say I need the resources, right? But there's so many resources that are needed in a biological lab. And when all this is over, Annette, we want to, I've had the chance, but I want the commissioners to meet the people behind the hazmat suits because um, if any kids are listening out there um, for their government projects, it is very cool to be in science. It is. And it's very cool to listen in biology class so that you know what RNA and DNA is because it turns out that's the kind of stuff that will save your life. That's right. So, so anyway, I'm just going to end by saying, so once the results are, are out, they give them to us at the DOC. If they're negative, real easy, we call and tell them they're negative. They're excited. We're excited. Everything's good. If it's positive, that's when we start our contact tracing. So we start talking to them about who are your family members, and then we talk to each family member as well. And then if we find somebody that's sick, because it's not just their family members, it's where do they work. You know, right now with the stay-at-home, it's gotten a little easier for us. It was taking us four or five days for some of those at the beginning because there was so much travel. But now it's gotten easier because most are home. But if we find anybody in that pool that's symptomatic, so the symptomatic person becomes our PUI, they go through the drive throughs and then we follow their contacts. So it's a, it's a cycle that we go over and over again. So we've had a couple of negatives the last couple of days, and we've been very, very excited about that. Uh, but, you know, we have another drive through tomorrow, so we'll see how things go. But we're not the only ones that get positives. Positives are reported for all of Nueces County. Any physician that has a positive, any hospital that has a, a positive, by law, they've always reported positives to the health district, and they continue to do that. So people say, well, you don't have any positives, so how did you get a positive? Well, we got a positive from a hospital. The person went into the hospital, and they tested them, and they were positive. So there's other means of getting positives besides our lab. But they're doing a great job, and I'm available if you all have questions for me. Yes, commissioners. I'm going to just where I saw first. I think everybody might, but Commissioner Chesney. Sure, just um, a few. Thank you, Annette. I appreciate you being here. And, and Judge, I, I think it would be really good um, if we had this just every meeting and, and we could do it with the regular agenda item sure. out that was put on just because I think this is really helpful. It's hugely helpful to me, and I think it's very helpful for the public to watch some of this as well um, because – there's a lot of there's so many things that I hear on face see on Facebook and all the yeah. social media. So the first thing you addressed, Annette, which I, I appreciate you addressing, is the travel. Can you tell me when the travel element went out of this? Because that there was a lot of confusion where people were saying they couldn't if they didn't travel, they couldn't get tested and and I knew that wasn't the case anymore, but I don't know when that changed. So I, just so I can have that answer. Well, basically what I'm saying is when they started staying at home they were traveling less. We're still seeing people that are uh, traveling, like they're going to Houston or they work in Houston, then they come back and they're sick. So, But when they started uh, staying at home, social distancing, doing all of those, those things, we started seeing the calls coming down. But, um, you oh, know. I, wait, I'm, I'm sorry. I may not have asked that the right way. Maybe I didn't hear what you said the right way. I thought you said at one point they couldn't be tested if they hadn't traveled. Did I misunderstand that? Oh, yeah. You, no, you didn't misunderstand. At okay. the beginning, the very beginning. Okay. Uh, when did that change? Because people are still under the impression, because I'm still seeing posts and different things that we all see that say, you know, if you don't travel, you if you haven't traveled, you can't get tested. That's ridiculous. And I keep trying to say no, that's not the case. But Well, it's fairly recent. Change? You know, okay. I mean, it's been, travel has been in the equation since the very beginning. Right. And it was just specific to China initially. Okay. And then the guidelines were expanded, and so they started saying – to any uh, area, a geographical area that was highly infected, which are all the areas, all over the United States, all over all the countries, you know, practically. And so uh, travel was always a question, but then we started asking additional questions, which were, were you exposed to a positive COVID-19? That was the second question that came up. 
Then the third question was, do you have other comorbidities? Do you have anything else going on? And then the last one was, do you have a disease, you have some kind of illness and you don't know what the cause is? And so you, we can be tested. So now they're saying, if you've traveled to a community acquired place or you're in an environment that's community acquired transmission, and we do have community acquired transmission here locally, and you have these symptoms and they're not in conjunction with each other, they can be separate you can actually still get tested. That's recent, probably in the last week. Okay, so at the end of the day, today, or for this discussion, you do, not, you do not have to have traveled outside of the Corpus Christi area or the Coastal Bend area. If you have the symptoms and tested. whoever evaluates you thinks you have the symptoms, then they're going to test you. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. And, and I just think that's really important for anybody who's watching to know and for any media who's covering this to, to clarify it. Um, the number of tests, we always, again, I'm just, these are things that always I'm getting pounded on. How many, why don't we, do we not have enough tests? You know, someone, I post every day the update. I usually put the chart. I want to, Peter is very kind to send us all that every day. Maggie sends us a lot of information too, but that update that Peter sends every day, I cut, I paste. I sometimes add the chart. Sometimes I don't. I, I, I don't respond to all the comments because I really don't have time. I'm just trying to get information out, but I'm always getting questions. Well, the only reason we're low is because we don't have any tests and we're not testing and we don't, we don't have enough tests. So I know we've had problems, like every place in the country has had problems because no one was prepared to test the number of people. But as we sit today, are we denying people now because we don't have tests? No, we're not denying because, and we really never were denying people. Because uh, while we may not have enough of the collection kits, we still, uh, we don't bring the collection kits to the drive through Spawn does in Driscoll, and he told me, however many people you need, we'll find them. We will get them. And so they've always had enough for the drive through Once we get those, if we, for whatever reason, we don't have extraction kit or whatever, we could still send it out. So it wasn't like that was a barrier, you know. So we have never not had enough tests to test people. If if they had the symptoms if and qualified to test, we have n not in any way, shape, or form had to deny anyone because we didn't have enough tests. No. And that's really important. And I know you guys have your press briefings every day, and I'm sure you all said this, and maybe, but I just think any, as much as we can pound all this into people, because, again, I, I hear that all the time. Well, the only reason we're low is because we don't have enough tests. No. Well, okay, that's not what I've been told. And but I, just, I do say that, you know, that there is not enough tests to test everybody. I mean, no, we right. don't have to Just to say, I, I, right. very good point. In You're other words, if you want to say just test everybody in the room right, right. now that doesn't have we a don't symptom, have we don't have that. And right. that, just because you have it, and Commissioner Chesney is good about posting, tell him what the total number is as of today, and I can bring it up if you don't have it. We have uh, 90 cases, and we've had, uh, we've tested. 90 cases of what does that mean? Positive COVID. Oh, oh sorry. I thought yeah. you were talking test. My bad. No, no, no. We've, we've run, you know, we run different amounts every day. Uh, yesterday, we didn't run any test in our lab. But that wasn't because of the drive through that we didn't have. That's because the community didn't need that. The hospitals didn't send us any. The physician's offices didn't send us any. So they didn't need any of those tests yesterday. Because people say, well, why don't you run every day? Because we don't have right. anything to run. There's no but is the total 1,450? Yeah. Sorry, 1,600 now? Yeah. Oh, that's right, because we did 101 yesterday. And the New Plus the 50, yeah. Medical Society has also been getting some of the numbers as well. So right, so approximately, Brent, 1,600 could be a good use for today's purposes of total tests. And, 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 that's, and that's really, really important to note because, I, and again, and I don't mean to keep beating this horse, but I, every single day I get a, someone that says, I mean, it's literally every day that says, we don't have enough tests, that's the only reason we're low, we're not testing enough people. And, and that's not happening, and I think that's really important for people to note. No, we don't have enough tests to test the entire city of Corpus Christi or the Coastal Bend that, that are asymptomatic, but we have enough tests to test anybody who is symptomatic. There you go. And, and that's really important for people um, Correct. to know. Um, okay, thank you very much. And then the extraction kits, uh, kits the, uh, the judge was kind enough to explain that to me as in regards to we had some shortages there, and our legislative delegation got involved, and that they were very helpful. So. While we're thanking people, I want to reiterate what the judge did earlier and thank our legislative delegation because I know they were on it and, and I did have some communication with Todd Hunter on that when, when that was being worked on and the judge then was kind enough to say the legislative delegation 
did their job and really helped us out, so that's really good. Judge, I'm really, a comment, I'm really happy to hear you say to not split up the health department. That's come up several times in my tenure on the commissioner's court, and I've never been favorable to doing that because maybe it needs to be tweaked, maybe there's some things we need to work on, right. but to me, having the city county health department as a city county health department i think is incredibly important um again uh, and so i'm really happy to hear you you, you say yeah. that because I, I think it needs organizational restructuring i'm okay with that yeah. that's that's and a whole we all agree that that's a modernization of almost everybody's life you know in department but when you go through something like this that's why um i just wanted to say you should feel proud as county commissioners that this is our department too. I want you to know that the most important thing about uh, the city county health is that we do divide 60-40 on dollars, but we divide 50-50 on decision making. And, um, and so every press briefing, every text you get from me about health or from Peter is a joint text. It just, we don't take the time to say, it's city county, it's city county, it's city county. But I want the public to know it is a city county health department and, and we could use modernization, and we'll get to that, as they say, when we get to it. But this has been an, an, an incredible exercise in working together. And I, pre I really do appreciate that. I wanted to mention that. Annette, there was a story on the media where one lady tried to get in five times and didn't get in, and when she finally got in, she had it. Um, I just I kind of caught the tail end of that. So what, what can people do to avoid that situation is how and how might that the situation have happened that we could have done that better because we certainly don't want to deny people that have symptoms right because right obviously this lady did and I'm not being critical here I'm really just trying to ask questions to make it better so how, how do you and you know it's a great question and I actually reached out to the individual myself and spoke with them and she I was asking you know what were those things that you were calling in talking about like your symptoms if you don't mind me asking and so at the beginning they were more like um, upper respiratory infection those that we don't count those for running them through the test. I never said anything on the symptoms about having a cold, and that's what it was. It was like an upper respiratory um, infection. What this one really is, COVID-19, is a lower respiratory. It affects your lungs. So we know when you have that deep cough, when you have you know that shortness of breath, it's in your chest. And so I was saying, well, you know, if that was early on, they would have denied. And, and, you know, they understood completely. She said, yes, I understand, but then I called back. And so, you know, we went through those, and I apologized for that happening. It should not have happened. And uh, we tested subsequently uh, family members, which, thank goodness, came out negative. But um, now we're not going to have that issue. I don't see that as an issue because we have all these other symptoms. If you have any of those, you're able to come in and get tested. If you have the regular flu, and we're still at the tail end of the flu season, we're seeing the numbers come down, uh, you know, still, but we're still at the tent tell in you could have the flu that's just like you have a cold you have a lot of mucus and stuff that's not the COVID-19 so awesome thank you that, that that's very helpful um, the other issue is how tests get reported so I know that the mayor signed an order that had to be signed that said all tests um, from the private labs had to be reported uh, so that uh, that was helpful that was great um, and maybe the judge did too I'm not sure I'm not trying to leave anybody out it, uh, some order got signed and uh, so my understanding is is that the private labs and the county, city county health department report the number of tests given and that if anybody registers a positive no matter what it has to by law be reported so if they're not reporting those tests and they are violating the law with very harsh penalties associated because it's a communicable disease and has to be done. That's correct, right? That's correct. So it's updated in the communicable disease report that DSHS put out, and they have 24 hours, as we do ourselves. When we have a positive in our LRN, we have to report within 24 hours to DSHS. Okay. Now, the question that still comes up, though, is, is everybody reporting the number of tests that they're doing? Like, we know the private labs are, and we know we are. But someone said, if a doctor does a private test, I would still think that goes to a private lab, but I guess they could do them in their own office. Well, and so, and that's a great question. So here's the issue. We've never asked them to report negatives. So, so that's a new, you know, we want like the denominator. Right. We all understand that. So uh, 
we wanted that number as well, so we reached out to some of the other health districts. And so what Laredo was doing was they were actually just asking the hospitals, tell us your numbers. And so that we did the same thing, and the hospital said, absolutely, here are the numbers. Because we know that they're going to be requesting the most number of tests probably locally. And, you know, so, and so we did that. But when the orders went out, the orders went out early on, and they were like, um, I think it was requesting from all the commercial labs my understanding and so if I was a physician I wouldn't report it to anybody because I order it through the commercial lab so in their minds probably the commercial labs reporting it and so um, the commercial labs have been so busy and so they haven't reported directly to us they report to DSHS every day they give the numbers for the whole state of Texas they tell you how many tests that they've all you know uh, run for the state of Texas and so we've all been asking can you break it down by and there's only like 200 and something counties right and they're like yes we're gonna get it we just don't have it yet that number but what the hospital is ordering is also commercial lab and so the hospital won't have to give us those numbers at that point so do you understand kind of where the there might be a little shortfall from the physician's offices because they think the commercial lab's reporting it too. But Brent, they're not running any labs in the physician's offices at all. So there's no labs. The only thing the physician can do is get it to a lab. So the, the, the disconnect may be that the hospitals are all reporting but some of the private labs maybe aren't yet well they are negatives, right they? exactly there could be a gap but what we said was we're tired of arguing with you so we're going to get the numbers straight from the hospitals and that's really helped a lot and just so you know this was a huge issue that we also went to the legislative delegation over five weeks ago and they said we'll solve it immediately and guess what they couldn't and we went back and they went to the governor's office and they said, we'll solve it immediately. And then they didn't and they couldn't. And there is a major disconnect between the, you know, as they say, when the resilience plan gets written, there'll be a whole chapter dedicated to private labs. So couldn't because, not because they didn't try, because legally they couldn't? That's correct. Okay. And I think that's, so basically what we're saying is, if anything, there are more negatives that have been not been reported. All the positives have been reported. Not in our area. Oh, wait, well, uh, there could be as well. There could be, you're right, but also remember hospitals also test for other areas besides Noises County. So. But, the, but, the, but the ones that we are reporting from the hospitals, are, those are Noises County ones, Well, right? positives. No, no, for no. negatives. Every day on that chart it says uh, hospital test 122. That's all combined. That's all. That could be. We're just asking right. them for one number because we know they're busy too. We're just saying give us one number of that all the. That could be more than Noises County. It could be, sure. yes. Probably very few though. You know, it might be one or two. I don't think nobody's traveling. Or so something. Christus is an exception to that rule because Christus has Christus B, Christus Alice, and Christus Clayburg. So theirs could be. So they have a regional approach for Christus, okay? So I, HCA, and Dr. Papanini's here, and he can throw this in later, but HCA sends all their labs to Houston, okay? So I can give you a good breakdown, but I would say that you should feel really comfortable that our numbers are pretty strongly accurate. You might have a deviation, standard deviation of 1% to 2%. But the deviation is going to be on the side of more tests, not That's right. It, it, which, which is a right, but it's it's for example, urgent care, okay? That's a whole new ball of wax. <laughs> and the, it, they're doing antibody tests, okay? The question is, should you count those or not? They are highly the serology blood tests right, the are not all they can also give a ton of false information. But I wouldn't think y'all are counting those at this point, right? Or we're, we're not. That's what I'm saying. So they, may, yeah, you might right. hear that docs are doing tests, but you have to ask yourself what kind of test. As far as the gold standard tests, we I feel like we have a good handle on what those are from but from the fact that the hospitals are really cooperating with us. And don't get me wrong, a lot of the private labs, I mean, the governor ordered them to share the information. And it's just that there's some practical difficulties to some of that. But for the most part, I think we've got a good handle on how many tests we're doing. And to give you an indicator, I'm on a call once a week with all the county judge from Senator Colcourse uh, uh, district. So it's like 20 counties, and they go from here all the way up to, you know, Matagorda. And in Matagorda, for instance, uh, as of a few days ago, they were already up at 2,500 tests. So it gives you a sense of the difference in homogenous 
um, we don't have a homogenous amount. It doesn't go on population or even on labs. Matagorda doesn't have a lab. Let's take Abilene, take Taylor County. That was the one that we got dinged for in the news. Well, in Taylor County, they got hit with a, with a nursing home situation. So, from, so did they do a ton more tests? Yes. Why? Because they had the emergency, they had an assisted living center, and they had a population that stuck in between the Permian Basin and Dallas to travel-related areas. It was a completely different scenario. But, of course, nobody asked us. They just write these opinions, right? And so when I, when I was tough with him, the reporter that wrote that later, I said, you should have asked. He said, well, that was my opinion. I said, well, opinion requires at least a predicate. And the facts are very important here. So I just want to say that I feel like the numbers you're getting are pretty close. But as you point out, are there 50 that we don't know that could be negative? Possible. But I think that what, what we do know is that we have a cooperation. It's pretty unprecedented between our local hospitals and the health uh, authority. And, and I appreciate that. And that's Does really that helpful. help? It helps a lot. No, I mean, all of this really helps a lot. And I think um, this is some of the stuff that, that we, like I said, that we need to keep that regular agenda item on regularly just because, uh, you know, this is going to be part of our world for a while, it seems, and maybe forever, who knows. But um, I, I think it's, and I think it's also important to point out how well we've done in Nueces County um, because we have socially distanced. Most of the people have followed the rules. Um, and I think that's a very, very important part of why we've um, done so well. Um, so I, I appreciate all your efforts. Those are really all the questions I have for you. I may have some more later, but I'll let other commissioners ask. So thank you very much. Thank you. We do, Annette, if you don't mind, if you're still good on time, we have Commissioner Vaughn who'd like to ask a question next, and then um, perhaps the other commissioners have a few things to say. Sure, no problem. Thank you. First, thank you, Judge, for holding the workshop. I You're think so it's welcome. Very valuable to the community community because I think more information causes less fear. Right back. Yes. And Annette, thank you. I know you've had a difficult job. This was something unprecedented. So thank you. Um, Brent asked some of my questions. Thank you. That's the Sorry. problem about going second or third. Um, <clears throat> but I, I was asked a couple of questions by the public. I think you pretty well answered them. But in the beginning, you had four things in order to get tested. Now you named a bunch of things there. What were the four things that you specifically said you can get tested for? If you have the symptoms, fever, and travel. Symptoms, fever. The, it was fever, travel. With, yes, fever, symptoms, and travel. So those were all in combination. This, all of them had symptoms and fever. And then okay. the first one was travel. And was now you have lessened those to right. what? So any one of the symptoms, because before you had to have the fever with the symptoms. Now you can just have fever alone, or you can just have diarrhea alone. You know, any one of the symptoms. You don't have to have it in combination with the fever. You have to have fever and travel, or you have to have sy symptoms, fever, and COVID-19 exposure. So you have to have okay, so the question is going to be, why, if it, you needed for those symptoms there, can we lessen them now? That's going to be the question that's going to be asked. You know, uh, probably as we're getting more tests, you know, I think they were more restrictive early on. It was only travel to China at the beginning. So that was it. It wasn't, you know, symptoms even. And then we added the symptoms and we added the travel and we added, we keep adding as CDC guidelines change. And so I think early on we all knew, you know, we didn't have a lot of those tests. Uh, and so those were the guidelines and we followed them. And so now it's more... Um, labs are getting their EUAs and they're coming on board so they're loosening the guidelines if you will plus there is community acquired transmission and so you have to look at that as well I think it was so important this morning that you showed how the tests are done I do too because, because people do not understand that mm -hmm. and I wish the news had been here for just that small segment and it's a shame that one of those news channels won't have you on there and do that because I think that's where the fear is coming from because we're hearing just ridiculous stories about bleeding and could be, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to know. You can tell that later. But um, the other thing I think I want to ask you is um, do we know, because the governor came out, and Judge, this may be your question, came out that he's sending 25 squad units, whatever, to different areas. 1,200. 1,200, and they can do 3,500 a day. Do we know and when the list is going to come out that will tell us whether or not Nueces has been chosen? So um, he is targeting rural areas, as best I can say. I'm going to throw that back. Sorry, Gary. I'm going to throw that back to you when it's your turn. Gary Barney's here with Texas Department of Emergency Management. 
he probably has more updated statistics. I was on a call yesterday with Tatum and with the chief of our kind of big, like his boss. <laughs> and, and so we, we do know about the uh, National Guard units. What they're trying to do is really get into small rural areas. If part of the western part of Nueces County qualifies for that, I have not been alerted. But let's talk to Gary or maybe he can send some texts about that. So we're going to punt that question to the right person. And, and you have time to text if you don't know, as they say, if you don't know the answer, we'll give you a lifeline. We'll give you a phone call. Uh, but that is definitely happening all over our, and I'm so grateful. And by the way, the other thing we learned is that not only are they deploying the guard to do this in the rural Texas areas, but they have a time frame. So they're going to get back to the governor by May 4th. It's pretty tight. So that means the governor will get data to help drive his decision making too. And I just want to say your question's excellent. And I'm going to, is it okay if I go back and hone in on something? So you asked a question about, okay, so you res you've eased the guidelines. So when Annette said to you the first guideline was um, travel to China. And then I remember the day so clearly because we had a group of students had, who had gone, um, in fact, they were from Corpus Christi. They had gone to study abroad. Uh, you know, through a, through a spring break type of, you know, people to people type of, uh, and they happened to be in the hot spots. And so we wondered, could we get them tested if they come back? You know, we had kids in Europe also on programs in college. And so I remember the day they took it from China very clearly because we needed that because we wanted, and these parents wanted these tests to be done. So I just want to hone in that at all times, I wish I had done this, I'm going to try to get it done by the time we do our next workshop. I want you to see how many times the CDC has changed their guidelines. I want you to know how many times we've had to, and it happened to me yesterday. I'm literally about to leave the courthouse. It's 429, and then boom, new guidance from the governor's office. Well, on what? On something important. Oh, my God. Will somebody read it? You read it. Okay, you summarize it. You give me your talking points. Okay, then let me make three phone calls so I can say that I've actually talked to somebody who understands the application. And then, oh, by the way, go get in front of the cameras at 5 and tell everybody about it. And don't forget to tell your commissioners, your legislative delegation, your partners at the city, your partners at DEDM, your EOC write-out team, and all of that has to be done in 30 minutes. And I promise you what I think the public would be interested to know <laughs> is how many times the CDC has done that to us. And, and it's not like they're picking on us. They're having to change because the data changed. I'm going to give you a great example, um, and I don't want to dwell because we've got other awesome speakers, but we had our first COVID death, and it was really hard for all of us because cause we prided ourselves on the fact that we were able to heal so many people and it just bothered me. And I was asking Annette, I was almost, I was angry because she really didn't die of COVID. She died of something else, but it was COVID related. And I was still very reticent. And it was because of Aunt Annette's good judgment, she called dishes. So guess what happens? I start Googling and start seeing from the CDC, I start Googling, and what we're seeing is that you can have somebody weeks later have cardiac arrest, blood clots, and stroke. And so the reason DISHES wants that isn't because they're trying to say what the cause of death is. They're trying to say that COVID is, we're seeing data points that are showing that blood clots are a big deal. And I bet Dr. Papanini is about to come tell us that he sees that too in his, in his patients. And so what's happening is, is that we only know enough for the moment. And I know it's very unsatisfying. But then, like this, we now know something else. But everybody has somebody they report to, and Annette reports to DISHES, and they report to the CDC. And so I'm just grateful that we have this forum to say, guys, it wasn't us that wanted to keep you from it. It was we who were trying to follow the guidelines that are set for all our safety. But the minute they gave us more latitude, so we went from here to here to here to here. And now we're at the point where if you feel like you're sick, we should be able to test you as long as you have these symptoms. Is that a fair assessment? I mean, not trying to blame the CDC. I'm trying to show how many times, you know, 
because you don't want every jurisdiction to come up with their own rules. Otherwise, we'll never have data or research that we understand. And it made sense. They had to change. You know, uh, China wasn't only the hotspot anymore. It was more. And so it was good that they did. I'll be honest with you. Our staff, I'd say 80% of our staff are women. And we all had stomach aches after the long days, you know, because we're talking to all these individuals and all of this information. And people are sick, you know, and the guidance is changing. And so they would say, I feel nauseated. I said, I know. Stay calm. Just talk to them. You know the guidelines. And we'd be passing out new guidelines, you know, because the phones are still ringing, you know, and so they're nervous because normally we have time to train to do those things. We had trained for China. We didn't train for the rest of the world. And so, you know, it, it was very nerve wracking and they did an awesome job, but you had to understand that they, you know, they felt it too because it's a lot of responsibility on public health with calls coming in and people sick. So made us nervous. I have one last question real quick. Um, and I think you covered it pretty well, but one concern was why did we not partner with Quest or LabCorp to get the test? And you kind of covered that. But then you said that um, 1,000, I think I've got these numbers this morning, 1,159 were private tests. I think the judge is saying that they got, did the doctors get the test from the hospitals or did they have the test that they could perform? Did they have their own um, vendor that they got them from? Our very first uh, uh, positive was actually a physician. So the physician actually, you know, did the visit and actually collected the specimen themselves, had all the appropriate PPE, knew about the COVID-19, which was interesting. Uh, a lot of people still didn't know it was local, but they were looking for it. And so it was a physician. But it's like the judge said, a lot of people have the misunderstanding. I can go to Quest and they're going to collect the specimen. No. Quest has never collected specimens except for blood. So no, and, and that's what the public needs to know. And the other thing, why didn't you ask, you said in the beginning, you said we didn't ask for the negatives to be reported. It seems like that would be really important so we would know how many tested didn't have it. So why wasn't that asked? It's just not a number that er has ever been given to us. We get all the positive of all communicable diseases. Mm -hmm. We don't get any of the neg negative of communicable diseases. We get positives. The negatives are reported to the state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. but not to the locals. And so, yeah, so Annette always maintained, hey, look, I'm the health director. You know, this is what I can ask for, but I want you to know, Peter might remember this. Most people remember when I go ballistic. I went pretty much ballistic about lab reporting early, early on. And I will say that we asked for it. The county through EOC asked for it. I would say weak like I'm talking probably before the hood came up, before we had the Vena hood done. So whenever that Vena hood was in, it was the week before that. It was when we were still meeting at City Hall and... March 23rd. You know, way, I, I think it's even before that because right, March 23rd was the hood. But the hood. early, early in March, because we had our first index on the 16th. So this was February, I mean, way back when. We said, we have got to get a handle on these private labs. And we tried. And it was shocking because even our delegation tried. But I, as I said, when we go back to the lessons learned, um, we're going to have to require that these private labs. But, you know, and they pled HIPAA, Carolyn. Everything was HIPAA. I mean, they used HIPAA like if it was like an like a, an invisible shield. You didn't have to have their name. You just no. needed a number. No, we didn't. And we pointed that out. And But I, I remember early on saying, we have here was the bad thing. We had relationships at the hospitals, so that's where we went. We had no relationship because they're, some, they're monsters. It didn't matter if you knew who was running your local lab quest or your local, I'm sorry, your local lab core or your local quest. It didn't matter because they answered to Big Brother way, way up in the sky. But we knew we could call Dr. Blow, Eric Heyman, and Randy Morrissey. At the time, it was Jay Woodall. And that's why we got what we got. And so it's it, – but the health department's job was just to say, hey, give me what the law requires. But we as a county, through our emergency operation, Billy Delgado, Chief Rocha, myself, and Melissa – we all, and Atita will remember, I w we were very adamant about getting, because, again, for me, data is everything. All these models and stuff, I love them because I, I think it means something, and it didn't mean enough at early on. But just so you know, today I do believe we have a good reporting system. But you're right. 
how can we make that better? I think it has to, we have to go to the legislature. And I, I think that's a really important uh, statement that you made because your numbers, you're wanting the numbers, the city was wanting the numbers as well. But you have to remember the commercial labs did not start first on this. This was CDC. That's they were the only ones doing for all of the United States. And then it went to the state's Department of State Health Services, and then it went to the locals, and then it went to the commercial labs. So they were at the end when normally they're at the beginning, and we augment them. And so this has been very backwards for us. And so they were saying, we need the, the negatives. And I'm like, forget the negatives. You can get the negatives. I need the positives, and I have thousands of calls coming in with all sorts of questions from physicians, hospital, nursing homes, everybody, you name it. And so you, I understand the importance of the negative, but I also understand the importance of COVID-19 death-related deaths to be on the death certificate because that's what DISHES, Department of State Health Services, uses for statistical purpose to try to get ahead of this disease. Right now we're still behind, but to get ahead of it and actually figure it out and find out why does it do this, how does it work, what's the pathology of the disease, and if we don't have that on the death certificate, we're doing the community a disservice. So it needs I to be agree, but to get ahead of it, you also have to have the numbers that don't have it. Absolutely. So That's right. I agree with you. So I'm just like, I love everybody and, else. And I think I'm going to have, you know, PTSD after this. But, <laughs> I, you know, I just thought about something when you said the CDC. It just, it feels like an eternity. It's only been eight weeks, but for me, it's been like an eternity. And I'm remembering now the gentleman that waited 14 days to get the, to get the specimen because he was one of the very, very first ones. And so we, this was before our index patient, we had a gentleman who was waiting from CDC for over 14 days to get the lab results, and he was in the hospital. And, and, and that was a travel. Right. And, and so, I mean, I think back and think, oh, my gosh, we have progressed. So in the early, early days, our samples went to Atlanta. Then we transferred that to Austin, and then we transferred it local. And now it's a combination depending on what the protocols are. But I just want you to know that people want to know why is this considered an, a, a local disaster and a state disaster and why is emergency management involved? These are the reasons it, we had no ability to go procure any of this on our own. Health departments couldn't do it. Doctors couldn't do it. And let me tell you one thing, we haven't gotten to it yet. Hospitals can't do it. So when, when Annette told you that it was the hospitals that gave us the VTM, she's right. But what she, what she didn't tell you is that it was working with our EOC that we got the hospitals to get what they needed. In other words, if we need something, we go to the state. If a hospital needs this stuff, which they do, they, have, they go to CBRAC. And CBRAC has its own mechanisms of getting them the VTM, the swab, the PPE, and, and other things. I'll just leave it at that. So you have to understand who who's moving who. And we helped, the county through our EOC, made it possible that um, that the hospitals got what they needed. I mean, we CBRAC can also run into brick walls like TEDM did. So we used our congressional delegation, Congressman Cloud and Congressman Vela, to scream about spawn getting the VTM because they were bringing that VTM to our drive-through testing. <laughs> so it's been, it's been a, a real interesting um, association in order to understand who gets stuff for who and how, and there's been many times where, like you said, we've never run out, but Brent, we have been so close and, and so close that it was really, really uncomfortable. And even though Spawn was able to get through, it was because of Congressman Cloud's vigilance to get what they needed. And then, of course, once he, once they opened the flood, you, you move from there's no way to get it to 500 are coming. And if you linger too much in here and ask, well, how did that happen? Don't ask. Don't ask. Just say thank you. Don't even worry about it. Just move on. Because it probably means somebody gave it to you. Somebody somebody took from another spot and said we need to the proportions are not right right so i just i just want you to know that you still these workshops are going to going to really as they say i hope bring the public into outside of facebook facts 
which are usually not factual, and inside the realm of what is real and what might seem a little frustrating and maybe even scary. That, But what you're hearing here is going to be the gospel <laughs> from, from folks that are in uh, the position of understanding it, like your local health authority. So, okay, Commissioner Mattis has a question as well. Thank you, Judge. And, Judge, you kind of already addressed it, and so did you, Annette. But, um, you know, in trying to, and I appreciate the, the updates that we get from uh, the city manager and from the health district uh, daily. This helps us reach out in social media and keep the constituents updated. They can go to many sources now to find the actual uh, information. But one of the things I posted a couple of days ago was that first related COVID death and uh, got a lot of a lot of flack for that basically because people maybe not knowing all the facts but saw it as well it was other conditions it wasn't necessarily related to that and so if there is a a link or email or some official document that we can refer back to just to explain I mean, I'm still getting people going and talking about that on my feed from two days ago. And normally you, you post something that dies after a few hours. People have still been looking, and, and a lot of people are very bothered by that interpretation. And I tried to explain to them, first, that was not anything that the judge, the mayor, city manager, you, any of us decided. Right. That was something that was told to us by the state agency in charge of this. So right. is do they have that on their website? Is that something I can reference people to? Was there an email or a document that you have that we can kind of show people? And I know some may still turn their nose at it. But for those that really want to truly understand the why. And uh, I have not seen a document, but I definitely will look. But I know from previous uh, diseases and like H1N1 or like Zika, you want to have that on there. But I did uh, have a conversation with the Department of State Health Services, and they said since she was positive, even though she was also negative, you know, weeks later, she was negative, you still, and then she subsequently died because a lot of people were asking us the same thing, you know, she could have died of this or that. You still want to list that on the death certificate for statistical purposes. And all you're putting is that not under number one, the cause of death, death is going to be ARDS or, you know, whatever it is, you know, acute respiratory distress, whatever the cause is. And you could also put there the comorbidities, diabetes, hypertension, whatever those are. But on the number two, at least list previous COVID-19 positive. Otherwise, you will lose the statistics in all the death certificates, and that's very important. Everybody has their, you know, they want the baseline. We want the, the statistical uh, data for COVID-19 or any other communicable disease that can cause something like this. So if this death that happened here in Oasis County would have happened in, um, say, Travis County, it would have still been listed the same. Yes, yes, yes. And had this case happen outside of the state of Texas, would it had still been listed the same? Do you know? I believe so. I don't know that for fact. Because it goes back I, to what I think the judge is saying was that, you know, the data, you're, they're trying to keep it all the same so there's the same standard. Yes, yes. So I just want people to understand that now and if given the opportunity to try to explain on an individual basis the reasons for that and that we're all f going by the same standard, at least here in Texas, so that we're all keeping the stats for the same reason. And like you said, there's there's other reasons that may lead to a person's death, diabetes, everything else. So, okay, good. And, and with some of our talk kind of reminded me of some other issues. One, uh, I appreciate you keeping uh, Mayor uh, Gomez updated now, especially after well, since his first death was yes. within the city of Romstown. So I thank you for that. But one of the discussions we had, and I don't know if you covered it with him, but if you could at least look at it, you don't have to report it here. But the 78380 cases mm -hmm. and the city of Robstown cases could be two separate items. They right? are. Because 78, right. 78380 is such a huge zip code in our county. Right. It covers unincorporated areas and it covers uh, the private uh, prison, the GEO prison that's out, not even technically in Robstown. It's outside the city limits. Right. It's in unincorporated county. Yet when we hear the media reporting, and maybe they're just looking at the zip code themselves. But if we can get that separation, I think that's just really important because I think it also goes to kind of a false sense of security that you just think, okay, it's not in my city limits right. that I'm okay, even though it's a mile or two away. Uh, it's not too far from you, and you do need to practice to be, you know, to be healthy and safe. 
So if you can just consider that if you haven't already. And then the private labs, that was my issue I had at the beginning, and I guess I'll ask you or, or the judge, has that improved? Because I know that the, the private labs and the hospital testing were, there was, I mean, I guess first few weeks especially, everyone was so fever pitched as far as wanting just to know how many more cases have we gotten, and, and there was, seemed like there was a delay in, or possible delay in those right. reports coming to you or to the health department. Has, has that been taken so care of? Well, to some extent. Was but it never an issue? It, well, no, it was an issue, but it's almost an issue that you can understand. So if I go to a private lab through my doctor, I'm sorry, I go to my doctor, and then my doctor sends my specimen to the private lab, he, th that, doc, that lab will call the doctor and say, that person's positive, Barbara is positive. Then what you get is the doctor normally calling Barbara, the patient. And the, what, what we go off is the printed lab slip that the health director gets from the lab. That could take, let's say the doctor calls me on a Sunday night and says, I need you to isolate immediately. Immediately. Okay? But Miss Annette, now I know that from the grapevine, I call my mom, my mom calls so-and-so, next thing you know, it's on Facebook, everybody pray for Barbara. And then, but Nanette only knows it from the grapevine. It takes her the next day, could be at Monday at 3 o'clock, to get the printed out slip. Now, why is that? Because you it's, you, it's your body. It's your right. It's your doctor. It's your life. So you should know first. Why would Annette know first from the private lab? Now, what if it's a county lab? Well, Annette's going to know first because she ran the test, right? So that's where the disconnect was. So in these early days of... How could you not tell us we have a right to know? I, I'm going to err on the side of no. I have a right to know. <laughs> Me first. Why? Because you've got to isolate. Now you've got to separate yourself from your spouse, your children, right? So you can't wait for the slip. But why does Annette wait for it? Why doesn't, why doesn't she just believe the doctor? Well, I'll tell you why. Because she has how many years? 21 years. <laughs> 21 years of experience. And you know what she knows? I've made that mistake once. So. And it's it's an irreversible one, it's and it's an inf it's an unforgivable sin. Right. So she can't do that. She's got to wait till the lab confirms. What if the doctor said, "Oh, I was tired. I didn't mean Barbara. I meant Mary Jo." What? Well, that's what happens. So it's it. We have protocols, and if you follow them, people stay safe. But you couldn't. The so I think that's where we got into problems with the public early on, including the newspaper for which I was unmercifully, unmercifully harsh with them. Because I said, you're wrong. Nobody's hiding anything from you. That doctor has a relationship with that patient, and they have a right to have that conversation first on a Sunday night. But Miss Annette has to follow her protocols, and it isn't real until the lab confirms it. Absolutely. Not what somebody here says. And that's where we got into the problems early on. Has it finished? Has it rectified, John? I don't know. I can only tell you that I know my ears hear every problem there is, and I haven't heard of that problem since week one or two. The early days, yeah. The early, early days. And that's because we're a lot more proactive about them getting the information on the, 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 the slip to us. I think that would be a fair assessment, Annette. It is. It is. And, you know, so she's right. Uh, just like she said, they notify the person. They tell them. But the other part of that is the lab doesn't actually notify us. The doctor notifies us. But they didn't have that initially. They didn't have that within 24-hour, you know, stipulation. That came later. There was a 24-hour turnaround time. And so physicians' offices are a lot of times closed on a Sunday. So while we heard, we would hear Rob's down or we'd hear Port A, we'd hear from the community, and I thought it's probably true, you know, talk to the physician, it sounds like it's true, but until we have that lab slip in the physician's offices, will fax it to us, they'll send it to us or encrypt it. And so once we receive that, even the first one, we're talking to the lab, does this actually, is it actually a positive? Because it's written out so differently as well. And so, yes, it is. Okay, this is actually one. So that's how it works for us. The doctor's offices will send it to us because they know the importance of us getting it. But on the weekend, they're closed. And so, well, they, and so we had physicians going in on the weekend to get us these to send them to us. So, yes, that problem fixed very quickly. 
Thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner Gonzalez. <clears throat> well, I'm going to kind of go a little different note here. I just want to say that uh, this thing that's happening right now, there's a lot of parts to it. You know, and I just want to say uh, thank you to the city and the county and the health, de health department, city health department. I mean, that working together as a team, and, you know, and I, I'm not mean working together as a team because that's the only way it's working. I know there's a lot of obstacles and a, and a lot of probably questions about things that we're still learning. Uh, but I think that, you know, I, I don't know how to thank the city for the crew heads out there at 5 o'clock in the morning, at 5.30 in the morning, you know, the police department, sheriff's department, Edwards, a team out there at 5 o'clock, 5.30, setting everything up. You know, this this is what makes it work out there. Mm -hmm. The health department teams out there, you know, they get there about maybe 6.30. And uh, the spawn, you know, I mean, uh, the health district's been there, the hospital, the Driscoll Hospital's been there a couple of times because of children. Mm -hmm. But all the other times have been spawn, you know, and I can't thank spawn enough for stepping up and, you know, and taking the bull by the horn and, and providing the test kits and providing the nurses and all this that they have done, you know. It, it's amazing, and, I, and, and we say a little prayer before we get started sometimes and just to give them a little courage and, you know, hopefully they, they, they pull it through the day because they got to go back to their families too, you know, and they're in the front lines, you know, and, uh, and, and afterwards, you know, the cleanup and, uh, you know, disinfection and all these other things and, and you know, Edwards crew does, the city does, and, you know, uh, and I know that Annette has gone through, you know, we talk a lot, and I know it's going through a lot of things, and there's some changes all the time, and, you know, the, the people there in the phone, you know, phone centers are stressed out, you know, they're, you know because they work two-hour shifts, you know, and, and I can understand that, you know, what what they're going through. So sometimes we talk about heroes and all that. I think this this team that is working out there at 5 o'clock in the morning, 5.30, you know, they're, they're heroes right now because somebody's got to be out in the front lines, you know, and, and they're the ones in the front lines right now. They're taking the chance of, of them going home sick or them something happens to them, so... Uh, I just I just want to thank Annette for for everything you guys are doing. I mean, thank you for all your your leadership out there. Thank you for working, you know, with, with your team. The, the city manager, thank you, sir, for all the work that you guys are doing out there. And you know, there probably people don't see because they're probably still in bed, you know. <laughs> and uh, but Edward, thank you for your team. You know, and I worry I worry about your team a lot more because I mean they're in, they're really. In, in the areas where they have to clean up and everything else, so it, sometimes we, for, you know, we forget a side of what how this thing is really working, you know. And, and there's ups and downs, you know. And uh, and I know that sometimes my, when I when I say the right thing at that time, but because things change, you know. But it's not because I don't think it was meant deliberately or by malice or anything. I think the, sometimes it just there's a lot of answers to some of these questions, you know. And, and, and like you said, Jeff, it might. Be, might change by five o'clock. It changes, you know. And so we said something. That we said something at nine o'clock in the morning. By four o'clock, it changes. So I said, "Hey, wait a minute. You told me this. Well, right. when it changes up there, it changes down here, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to really look at that and you know how things actually really work. So I just want to say today, I just want to thank you for the for the team that's out there, you know. And I know, you know, we we went from testing uh, a, few. <laughs> a few, you know, in an hour to you know we tested one a minute. Mm -hmm. One a minute. One a minute. Wow. And then you know because we they have changed the style you know, they've changed the, the process you know and it, it takes it took a little while you know with one tester now there's two testers maybe tomorrow no will be three testers because they rotate so you know it, it took it took a little coordination out there too so I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for all the citizens and I ask the citizens of this community to 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 you know be patient you know and 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 do the orders that the judge has to stay home order do follow those you know follow all the things you have to do. Let's stay safe, you know, you know, let's keep our family safe, you know. But remember, there's always somebody out there trying to help you, trying to help your family from getting sick. So I just want to say thank you, sir. <clears throat> thank you. And we're going to hear more from Edward later, so I'm going to so save my praise for later. But I, I ditto everything. And I know that it's getting late, but uh, Manager Zanoni has been here patiently since 9 o'clock, and I'm going to ask him to um, really just, if he had anything to, to add, because I also want to echo Commissioner Gonzalez's thanks, you know, I mean. Well, I uh, just need to say thank you to Commissioner, because he said we say a prayer. That's because he's there. I know. Every day, and I'm like, that's you know, right. he brought me a mask, and he's just, he, he's always looking out for us. So he is. There, there's no doubt. And, and you know, <laughs> I try to keep the, 
you know, you're great, we're great out of commissioner's court because, you know, public just wants to let us just do your job, but thanks to the sheriff as well because his deputies make us safe on the perimeter of testing. We've, we've, we've tackled the item on workshop COVID testing, and so in that vein, you have to have a perimeter up, and that perimeter is secured by CCPD and by our Nueces County Sheriff's Department. So for the public to know how we keep people safe away from that area so they're not entering and not obstructing, that's how it's done. And, and manager, um, I may have called you manager Zanoni maybe uh, eight weeks ago, but now it's just um, thank you, Peter, as a, a colleague and as a friend. Um, I, I cannot thank you enough. Sometimes I just really want to scream, and it's, it's good knowing that I can call someone over there and say, what do you think? And you've been that uh, counterpart for me. As the CEO of the county, um, it's nice to, to be able to talk to the CEO of the city. Yeah, I appreciate that, Judge. Thank you. And uh, what I want to echo is what the judge said and what Commissioner uh, Gonzalez said, which is that uh, the joint effort that the city and the county has had through this pandemic is, is really a, a bright uh, star and everything. Uh, recently, we, we talked to the, to the uh, Caller Times, their editorial board, and uh, between the judge and I and, and the mayor, and we listed out everything we've been doing as a community to save lives, right, to keep people healthy and to save lives during this pandemic. And uh, some of those highlights include being the second location in the state to do drive-through testing. We were the second one down here in New Oasis County. Another one when it comes to communication, just, just what you're doing today and getting information out to the community, but also amongst yourselves, is having those joint city county press briefings every day. We were probably one of the first in the state. San Antonio did it a couple weeks after we had already done ours for almost two weeks in a row. Uh, having a joint city county website where we're putting information up constantly and, and refreshing and putting new ways of showing that information and adding information like zip codes of where the persons are positive. This is all things that have been done. Uh, these are all huge accomplishments. Um, having the joint City County Health District is another one, but of all those, I think I'd like to highlight today that the, the work with the county, uh, the city working closely, not just at my level, but at, at all levels, persons working with Edward, the police chief working with Sheriff Cooper, um, our teams in the Parks Department working together, uh, us at a leadership level working together, the commissioners working uh, with the council members, that's uh, something to really be proud about. And it happens because of all of you here at the day. It's not just the judge, and it's not just Commissioner Vaughn, it's not just me, it's us collectively working together. And I think being in government for 22, 23 years, uh, you don't see that often, right? In the, in the state of Texas, especially, there's territorial uh, jurisdictions that people sometimes can't break down and work together as teams, especially in the county and cities. And so I think we need to be proud as a community that the two governing bodies working closely together uh, lockstep has really benefited the community. And I think we have more more safe persons out there today because of this. And so I want to commend the, the Commissioner's Court for, for being that strong partner. Uh, when we look back over the past seven days, and this is not to let our guard down, but some of the policies that you all have had to take, you all have had to make the tough decision on to include some of those stay-at-home orders and the social distancing and closing businesses and not going to the beach. Uh, during, during Easter and some of those great parks that we love to go to. Uh, that has making a difference. And if you look back over the past seven days, when we report out how many positive cases we've had, uh, four of those seven days, we've had zero new cases. And starting last Thursday, it went from four to three to one, and then with three days in a row with zero. We know we need to do more testing, uh, but guess what? People know to call. And as Annette told us, the call volume is dropping. And so, again, these aren't signs to say, hey, okay, we're fine, let's get back at it. But I think these are some uh, good takeaways to say that what we're doing is working. Uh, some of the tough decisions you have had to make are working. I think we need to keep at it. We're going to see what the governor does on Monday. Uh, Annette knows probably better than anybody here that we can't let our guard, guard down yet, maybe too early. Uh, but we can see some positive results. I think the community uh, should see this and talk about it. And I just want to commend you all for the work that you've done uh, to make that happen. So those those Thank are my you. only comments, Judge. And Thank I just you. want to uh, point out, we, while we haven't really worked out all the logistics, um, Manager Zanoni and myself and the mayor are going to uh, answer questions live um, sometime between uh, Wednesday, April 29th, and Thursday, April 30th. 
I mean, again, I need to get all the logistics, but it's going to air on prime time at 7 p.m. on April 30th. We're going to actually film um, hours before so we can take everybody's questions and they can be edited for television in the same, you know, so the slot doesn't, so you can marry yourself to the slot with commercials. But we're going to get that information as soon as we get it to all of you commissioners, not only to be able to post about it, but to be able to receive questions. And you might be the best way to create that sieve and say, hey, look, we really want this question answered. I've talked to my constituents, and this is the one you really need to answer. And um, because of this relationship, we can do that. And they've done this in other urban counties, and it's going to be on uh, Channel 6, Channel 10, and on Caja. So we're actually going to do it in English, and then we're going to repeat it in Spanish. This takes a lot of effort, a lot of time, but we think it could be very valuable. It doesn't have to be the only one, but it's a great beginning. And um, Katia Uriarte is going to moderate it. And it's we're also going to have um, a, a medical uh, expert on, and we're also going to ha <clears throat> have a member... Um, we hope of the state or the federal delegation. Those calls have gone out, so we're waiting. But this is something that doesn't happen unless you can say to somebody, hey, can you do this? And they don't have to, like, you know, think about it too hard. It, the, the answer is, of course. You know, if it's, if it's getting info to people, the answer is, of course. So anyway, I just want to say thank you. That's upcoming, and we'll get more information out to you about about all of that and then also want to say we didn't address it but it's part of the workshop um, Peter can come back later on another workshop and as we get more um, information yesterday the federal uh, government acted again to to put more dollars into um, the hands of small business and because the city has a recovery task force and we have a recovery task force opportunity as well uh, something I'd like to talk to the commission about creating, about how we're going to create this new life for us ourselves, including the new um, courthouse, the new city hall. He's already made changes. I know because I go over there every week, every day, and we're going to have to do the same. You know, can jury panels really have 500 people downstairs ne next to each other? The answer is that would not be prudent. But how do we get back to to having juries? Right? We're going to have to think about that. So he's got that. I'm sorry, Peter, what is it yours called? You have a task force for this. Uh, we have uh, the one for the small business. So well, I was thinking about the, the, new, the new, the way you're doing business at City Hall. Right. So I have, I have two city employees right now that this is all they're doing. Is, and we're going to share this with the judge. I told her yeah. we're not, we're not going to keep it for ourselves. But it's uh, how do we as a city with 32 different lines of business and many locations of where the employees work from and out of, uh, how do we operate when we get back to running our business, you know, at full steam? So uh, it's things like uh, room setups like this. Just yesterday in, in one of the conference rooms on the fifth floor, we removed 60% of the chairs, 70% of the chairs, and we only have four or five chairs in there now. Uh, we're looking at rooms where you can hold meetings, where you have that social distancing space. Uh, we've already done a lot of protocol change in our public safety. The, the firefighter and, and police officer wear protective masks and gear. Uh, when they show up to places, uh, how do our street crews, how do our folks uh, in all our lines of business operate uh, tomorrow uh, when we all get back to, you know, some type of normalcy? Because we know that this is going to be with us for a year, year and a half right. maybe. And so that's something we're looking at, and we'll share that with the county. Uh, it's something that probably persons that have been out of the, the working from home telecommuting, they're not thinking <coughs> about how they can come back to work on Monday and some Monday come back to work and it's going to be business as normal, right? So we have to help them realize, no, it, it can't be this way. We have to do it, this new setup. So uh, so that task force I have is working with that. They're going to be working with all the different departments uh, to see what is their setup, what do we have to do differently. Yeah. And and I don't want to, I want to keep keep moving, but because information is so valuable, but one of the things that <clears throat> I want us to talk about as a commission is, you know, how we're going to do it. Now, we have... Um, through our EOC and just through the regular county, we have uh, Timothy Everest, right? He's our he's our um, risk management uh, department head. So of course it's going to that's a natural place, but he's going to need a lot more. I mean, we're going to actually have <laughs> a lot to think about: courtrooms and 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 jail visitation and jury rooms and selection. How about our JPs that are at the front of our building? Oh, by the way, how do we tackle security and 
and it's 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 a it's a daunting task so I just want you to know that the purpose of today is not just to receive information it's to allow 20 light bulbs to go off in each one of your head I value each and every one of you I mean more than you know more than you even believe just trust me when I say it because you understand the business of government John you've served in government care what how much luckier could I be as a county judge I don't have uh, uh, what do they call them neophytes I have seasoned public servants every is that, one of is you that another way of saying we're old judge I'm yes sure it is <laughs> me included the point is is that we need to think about it now the city has already started so let's let them Peter do you mind me asking when will you get us something we'll have we'll have some initial stuff this Friday and okay then, and then early next week so if, yeah we'll have so so back to your point Brent on keeping this uh, go ongoing we need to keep the information going we need to take care of our own house before we start telling everybody else how to live let's figure out how we should live first okay so we're gonna do that now we all know that we're pivoting as a state to open up business because we're having another disaster inside of a disaster and we got to find ways to mitigate um, well I call it locking in our gains we have to lock in the gains we've made if you think that zero numbers by accident I can assure you it is not it's it's by deliberate decisive action and tremendous social responsibility of our citizens and the reward is is that we have kept our numbers relatively low but we cannot claim victory because the family of that woman who passed away doesn't feel victorious this morning so and the people that are in ICU don't feel victorious and the people that have been on ventilators don't feel victorious so this is an insidious disease and we need to make sure as we open business that we're taking care of our business so I'm I can't wait for the Friday but um, so we're working together in that and then we're also working together by uh, sharing information how small business can recover they have their own program and they're sharing that with us and we're putting it on our Nueces County platform so they're actually taking city money and giving funds available through application process through the lift fund and what we're doing is sharing that on a huge platform and, and is that fair that's a fair assessment yes and so mm -hmm. the, the judge on, on behalf of the county is, and other folks from the county are on a it's about a 30 member small business recovery task force and we're focused mostly on the city of Corpus Christi uh, but uh, we want to focus on Nueces County as well we know people live uh, outside of the city limits that may be a business owner and so uh, since I am here if I can take a you minute bet. to explain the uh, just this week at the type A meeting uh, we re we redirected three million dollars that uh, was kind of on hold for the courthouse the Nueces County Courthouse uh, the key thing though is that we're going to recommend at the next council uh, next uh, type a b board meeting uh, that three million in type b monies which are economic development be pledged uh, for that for that project so just a big point of clarification for you all I know there was some uh, text information over the weekend and a couple of phone calls uh, that three million dollars out of type a was we can use quickly uh, for small business loan recovery program uh, the, uh, the type B funds has more restrictions you have to hold a public hearing wait 60 days before you can use the dollars the state wasn't able to relax those regulations so we use that type A money that's where the pledge was for the county courthouse uh, what we put what we said on the record on Monday though at that type A board meeting is that at the type B board meeting in May uh, we will make a recommendation to dedicate the type B funds and the board chair uh, the board members are the same on the type A and the type B and uh, they were in support of that agreement one of them asked that I tell personally come over here and tell the commissioner so I'm here today to tell you that that'll save us writing you all a memo Thank uh, you. so we'll recommend mm -hmm. that next month that uh, that three million dollars be pledged out of the type B and this there's uh, plenty of uh, funding there to do so thank you yeah so that's it I think so communicating with you all is something that's important to us and uh, and I appreciate judge your comments and kind of shaping this work session that you're doing yeah because uh, it's about getting ideas but also sharing information and, and we're, we're doing this all for the benefit of the public and uh, judge was saying this frequently in the beginning which is this is about saving lives and really that's what this is about saving lives and keeping people healthy 
And uh, I think you all are doing a great job in doing that, and we're, we should be proud as a community. So thank you. Thanks, Peter. And I know you're always available for questions. I'm going to let him get back to what he I know he's got another pressing engagement, but I know that he's also available to all of us. If you'll just send your questions to him directly, um, if, if that's okay, we'll let Annette, she's got to get back to the health department and, and Peter as well. Um, Mr. Sononi, uh, will they, they submit applications to the city itself, the small business? The small business to the LIF fund, LIF fund. Is it just like liftfund.cc.com? Yeah, I think it's liftfund. Here, let me get that. I, yeah. I have it. I think it's liftfund.com. Uh, they have to go to the lift fund. There's a there's a lift fund office here at the Del Mar uh, Economic Development Building over there off of uh, Staples. Mm -hmm. So they can call the, the lift fund. Yeah, liftfund.com. Uh, yeah. And then the application's online, liftfund.com. So uh, we the lift fund received applications over 200, totaling 5.7 million. Initially, there was 1.7. So between the Type A board meeting and council's action yesterday, another million has been allocated with another million or so available. Uh, so we could be as much as 3.8 million available for loans. And those helps the small businesses through this transition time up to $25,000. Uh, the good thing about it is zero interest. The city is going to cover the interest costs over the three-year period and also no payment for the first four months. Right, so we encourage those small businesses. There's plenty of, uh, of opportunity still available there. I think they have to get their material in, make sure they have their paperwork in, and uh, check that out, though, the lift fund. And there's a representative you can call. There's two or three working, uh, eight to five every day. And it's in English and in Spanish. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, thank thank you, you. Thanks yeah, so thank much, you, Peter. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Annette. There are so many people here, but what I'm going to do is try to finish the health piece of it because the next piece, it has to do with treatment. And um, I really uh, would Judge, love... Would yes. there be any way that we... I know we have some people sure. here for that other agenda item. Is there any yes. way to compress okay. that and move them up too so they can get out of here also? Sure. I know it's behind the consent Tell agenda. Me. Oh, well, Mr. Rose, um, Laura, Mr. Taubman, may I... And may I um, just trying to figure if there's a way to not make them sit here for another hour. No, I know. I know. Um, who would you like? Uh, we to give you five minutes to who speak, would, and that's it. Who would you like? No, uh, what was Dr. Rose and Mr. Taubman and whoever okay. else might be here for those things? Right, so let's do the doctors first, okay? Let's do um, Dr. Papanini yeah. um, and Dr. Rose. Just give him a heads up. I don't see him, but I'm sure he's in the hallway. Oh, my gosh, Keith, forgive me. You're right there. It's uh -huh. just that it's a, uh, you're hiding over there in the corner. Okay, um, Keith, do you want to? Come on up, and then we'll do Dr. Papanini. Forgive the, the insolence. It's just Keith and I have known each other for, oh, my God, at least decades. Um, but Dr. Keith Rose. Um, as a citizen of Corpus Christi, and this is, full disclosure, the first county commissioner's meeting I've ever attended, I um, try to stay away from city governance as much as possible and I know that what you guys are dealing with right now I can't only imagine thank you but I would like to bring some levity to this and more importantly like you talked about judge because I have immense respect for you the data I have been blessed to work with some of the smartest minds on the planet in dealing with this COVID-19 I'm working with an informal group of Nobel laureates epidemiologists doctors, statisticians, both in this country and internationally. One gentleman pulled this all together, and we've been compiling the actual data. So what I'm going to talk about now is not what if, because when this first came out, it was a novel virus, which means it was new. We didn't know what it was. So we had to say what if. And the initial models by IHME said we could lose a million, two million. We were looking at death rates. CFRs, case fatality rates, in the 2, 3, 4%, which would mean millions. But now we've shifted to what is. And our response, with all due respect, is not correct. What is, is that this disease, based on the actual data and numbers, is looking at a CFR right now, with all the recent reports and peer-reviewed literature of 0.1% percent or less and that's trending down there was a report yesterday from Santa Clara County in California the first death of coronavirus wasn't at the end of February and early March 
it was February 6th, based on autopsy results. Which means that the virus seed date, and it's important for people just to understand the basic progression of a virus, you have a seed date, that's when it got here. And we all thought it got here, it, we can't think it got here because our first official positive case was January, end of January, because that would be intellectually dishonest, because we know now from studies in Thailand, from studies in China, that it was back there in November and December. So we now know, based on the studies from the health department in California, and from the leading epidemiologist, John Ioannidis in Stanford, and I will produce every one of these studies for you guys if you want, that the seed date was most likely December. So when we started our shelter in place or our mitigation strategy, while well intended, we were way down the curve here. And what I mean is, we weren't saving anyone by no sheltering. We were saving our own at the time I didn't disagree, I mean, we didn't know, but now we do. We also know that we had spring break before we sheltered. We had thousands of kids coming from all over the country and we didn't see any blooms or hot spots. We didn't see anything. We have one death in this city from it, in a city of over 350,000 people. We have a port that's international. I know because our clinics take care of the folks that come off that and they're from the Middle East, China, other countries, and they traveled freely for a long time. So I understand why we did it initially, but where we are right now is completely different. No one's talking about the testing, the specifics of it. The PCR testing has up to a 48% false positive rate. We don't know what that test even means. That's why we call it a vanity metric. Dr. Ioannidis, who is the most published man in the space on this, and another virologist out of Bonn University, I believe, in Germany. Both have said, we're looking at the wrong data. The antibody tests are the right data. Because the antibody tests tell us, do we have an active infection? Or do we have someone that was exposed or had the infection? And we just got back a lot of antibody tests. And you know what it shows? Roughly a third of all those people tested are showing to have had the disease. They just published, and it was actually in the national news, they tested a homeless population in Boston, and 38% of the homeless cluster they tested was positive, and none had symptoms. So where we started, and I'm here because I have great respect for this council. I'm here because I have great respect for my city. I live here, and I have a horse in the race because mi suegra, my mother-in-law, has emphysema. And if she gets this, it'll kill her. So when I tell you my recommendations, and I like my mother-in-law, so it's not like, you know, some of those guys, my mother-in-law can cook, and judge, you know that. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I love my community, so I, I wanna give you guys some hard facts. It'll just take two minutes. And then make your decisions based on the facts. I know a lot about the CDC, and in full disclosure, not a lot of you may know my background, but I worked Ebola in Africa. I worked H1N1 in the Middle East. I trained part of the first plastic surgery residents after the war in Afghanistan. And we had dealt with bird flu. We dealt with all kinds of stuff that you can even imagine. I worked with people from the World Health Organization and I'm badged with the World Health Organization. So when I speak about this, I'm not just talking about it like a, someone that just read some material. I'm talking about someone who's lived it. I'm also talking from the point of I own four urgent care clinics in town, even though I'm a surgeon. And we see a lot of Corpus Christi patients. We provide a lot of services for companies in Corpus Christi. So I get to look at this from the point of a provider that cares about my community, that cares about my family, and that, you know, just cares about my country. So where we are right now, we now know that through antibody testing, more people were exposed than we know, and we think as we do more antibody testing, that's even gonna drive it up higher, that number. And what that does is that affects your case fatality rate. Your case fatality rate is the whole reason we started this. Because initial IHME models said everyone was gonna die. Those were based off assumptions. The interesting thing is the working group, the second working group the president put together, can't even figure out where they got those assumptions. Because they've had to revise them every time because they've been off by up to 400%. But where we know now is we're at 0.1% and we're approaching regular flu. Now everyone, I, I 
I grieve for people that die. I've lost loved ones. But I got to tell you, in 2018, we lost 10,000 Americans a week to the flu. 10,000. We had 77 to 80,000 people die in 2018. We're not going to hit those numbers with coronavirus. It's not what we thought it was, and that's good news. We also have recent studies out that show it dies in heat. It doesn't linger, it dies. The biggest study that was just published was out of Bonn by a German virologist who's a Nobel laureate, I believe, and probably one of the most respected men in the space. And he went in and tested the surfaces of people that were in, that were actively had infection. He went in and tested all the surfaces and then looked at the survivability of the virus. He couldn't find it. What he concluded is, unless someone coughs in their hand, touches the handle, and you come right behind and touch it and touch yourself, the chances of you getting it, his words, not mine, are almost zero. And therefore, he concluded, it's not community spread like we thought, which is good news, because we didn't know. Now, I did see a paper in one of the medical websites that said it was aerosolized, but it cited two pre-published studies that they wouldn't even give the data on, and the author didn't even list their credentials. So I find that suspect. Because all the data I have are in peer-reviewed journals. And it's important to note, and it may be this way in the legal profession, when you present a paper in a peer-reviewed journal, because I published 15, you have to defend that paper, and you have to also list your conflicts. Like, I took money from this company to do this study, etc. The gentlemen that are out here in front that are given this information don't have conflicts. And with all due respect to Dr. Fauci, he has a few conflicts. And I'm not knocking him, not knocking the CDC, but I do go to their website because judge is spot on. They changed that website so many times, it's not even funny, but I have screenshots and I have their website. And their recommendation up until a week ago was don't wear masks. That was their recommendation on the site. So why, when we're trending down in numbers, down in deaths, down in everything, are they telling us to wear masks? And we have now peer-reviewed studies that say it doesn't cause community spread. It doesn't mean we don't be careful. It doesn't mean it's not serious. But we don't shudder a community over it. Because I will tell you, while the models initially were on assumed data, there is actually published data, not assumed, but evidence-based medicine. That's how we practice. Anyone in medicine will tell you it's evidence-based. And it, we don't do assumption-based medicine. And evidence-based medicine published in the Lancet Medical Journal and for um, the, the Economical Research Journal, the United States Economic, uh, Economic Research Journal, states that for every 1% increase in unemployment, you have a 3.3% increase in drug overdose and a 1% increase in suicide. And those families grieve too. So if we're gonna make people stay home, we better have a good reason. If we're gonna make them wear masks, the data doesn't support it. And just so I wanted to double check this before I came, I looked on the WHO website that I have access to and I printed it off. The World Health Organization does not recommend wearing a mask unless you have an infection. It doesn't recommend healthy people do. And as a physician, I can tell you that fear releases a lot of cortisol, stimulates the body to decrease your ability to fight infection, and can cause a lot of death and morbidity. And the patients that die from this, almost 99.9% .9 have comorbidities. And now, and I'll leave you with this, they just put two studies out. The likeliness of someone dying from coronavirus, and I, this is a simplistic way, and I'll give you the studies, is the same thing you would have from crossing the street with your comorbidities, meaning the coronavirus, if it gets you, it's based on your comorbidities, not the virus. So while we live by what if for such a long time, I think we need to start acting on what is. Because this economy, no matter how much money and governance we pump into it, is not coming back unless we release people and to shop, not catch it at the curb, but have that retail therapy. People are suffering. And there's also another thing, Sweden, South Korea, all these countries did not do lockdowns, and Sweden has a low CFR than anybody. And that's all over the medical literature right now. I have all these studies for you, and I know you guys are dealing with an insurmountable issue. 
But this isn't the sword of Damocles that's going to stab Corpus. It's a political Gordian knot that's beating the hell out of our community. Thanks. Hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Don't go. Dr. Rose, if you don't mind, yeah. Commissioner Vaughn. Um, I want to clarify something. You were actually on my agenda item, and I appreciate you bringing that up, Brent, to bring them forward, Judge. Thank you. I was going to ask when I got a time uh, to break in. That is probably one of the best presentations I've ever heard. And I thought it was so important for the public to hear other opinions because we've really not done that. And, and I agree with what you're saying. I think we've overreacted on some things, and I think that the judge has had to do what she's had to do because of the information, no doubt, that she's gotten, and so has the city. But our economy is going to go down, down, down if we keep continuing what we're doing. And I believe, too, that this was around before because I've talked to some people in my area, daycares, that they think they had it in December. Well, the, the, the CDC data, Judge, and I went back and we pulled it, and I can give you guys the data. It was real interesting in January, the last week in January, the first two weeks in February, we had a 3 million case spike in non-influenza viral pneumonias. And I believe that was our spike. The thing is, and there's a lot of papers, papers that support this, this is just like the flu. The interesting thing, though, is it doesn't affect kids and it doesn't affect young adults. And the clarion call from the medical community is we need herd immunity. We may or may not have a vaccine in a year, year and a half, but that's okay because we have people now. Even Dr. Fauci said it the other day on an open mic. Yeah, you develop immunity to this. We need to open the schools. That's a CDC recommendation, by the way. We need to open who? I mean, the World Health even recommends opening the school based on, and this is the interesting part, what your community is facing. And our community, by y'all's great work, is at minimal infectivity. We, we rake on the, the CDC gives a scale, and they break it down into three parts. We're at the lowest. They don't recommend masks, except for the other day, which don't ask me about that. Who doesn't recommend them? They don't recommend kids not being in school. You see, we're talking about this like a clinical patient. I mean, people need community. <laughs> they need to, go, my wife needs to go to the nail salon, or she's going to kill me. I mean, you people need to go shopping. They need, people need to feel like they're coming back. We don't want the strong hand of government. We can self-govern. It's the whole reason this country was founded. We can govern ourselves with good leadership. And this, is, and this isn't easy. I, I wouldn't want to be sitting in your seat, and I respect that. But there is nothing on the planet that supports what we're doing as a city. And why don't you guys be the first in the space to stand up and go, you know what? It's okay. We were wrong. No one holds, I mean, everyone was wrong. And the funny thing, doctor, <laughs> doctor told me the other day, a really famous guy, I don't want to embarrass him, he goes, everyone's going to be wrong and then everyone's going to be right. Or, or reverse. So it's, it's, not, it's a novel virus. No one's holding it. But if you continue down this path, here's a statistic for you. 60% of the nurses and hospital workers in this town have been furloughed because the hospitals are so short of patients. Our clinics, hardly anyone goes. This town's dying, and it's, we're committing suicide with the data now. And I will, I will make myself available to you. I will bring in the studies. Hell, I'll bring in the smartest people in the world that, you, that have more diplomas on the wall than wallpaper. But there's some smart people out there that know what's going on, and none of them are tied to big government. But they are tied to community. And we, we elected y'all. And the, and the thing is, the CDC always says recommendation. And if you go to that site, it says these are not orders. These are recommendations based on your community. And you guys are leading our community. And people are going to die, but not from coronavirus. And I'm sorry to say that, but it's already happening. A buddy of mine the other day's friend committed suicide because he couldn't go back to work. So don't kid yourself. There's blood out there. You don't want it on your hands. And there's nothing you can do now but open this community, let people go back to work. They know to self-distance. I, I, it's social distancing. We get it. The beaches aren't going to be a problem. That's going to relieve a lot of stress. Let people go fish. Big venues, I'll leave that up to you. Movie theaters, I'll leave that up to you. But the, uh, <laughs> the initial studies came out that if you have, if Brent and I bump into each other and I have a bad infection and Brent doesn't, there's only a 0.5% chance that he's going to get it from me. But if Brent and I are brothers and we live in the same house, that goes up double to 1% chance that he'll get it. Keeping people at home doesn't flatten the curve, it broadens it. They gotta get out and develop that herd immunity. 
So I don't own any vaccine companies, so I think we should all have herd immunity. I think it's my opinion doesn't matter, but the data does. And I and I'm you know again I will support this community. I have immense respect for all of you. But as a physician, we're always taught, you know, pretty much non, you know, okay, first do no harm. And closing this community harms it. Locking, making people wear masks harms this community psychologically when it's not indicated. And the good news is you got it this far, open it up and let's just pray we can recover. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Rose. Can I ask a question real quick to oh, Keith? I'm sorry. Um, I don't know if you're, I don't know if you're finished or not, Carolyn. Um, the, and, and I was going to go back to it a while ago, but I know if I was waiting. And, and John uh, or Commissioner Miles was was kind enough to re remind me uh, in regards to what he was talking about with the, the the death that was associated with the COVID. And I know you're here to listen to that. Um, that was a little frustrating um, for me because, um, you know, the question becomes: At what point do you? I mean, how how do you make recommendations? to where we can get to a point where we know what really is a COVID related death, because, you know, I've heard rumors about what might or might not have caused this. that actually. And I, how do we get there? Because does it mean if someone had COVID tested negative and then six months later, or a year later passes away, then that becomes COVID related. You, how do you do it? Well, I, I can answer this with just the facts. Um, and I did a fellowship in critical care at the Shriner burn hospital. And I studied, um, lung injury models, we use high frequency ventilation. And I've been working with a gentleman named Tommy Yeager, Thomas Yeager, Dr. Yeager, Cedar Sinai out in California. And this guy is brilliant. And I can put you in touch with him. And any doctor in this town that wants to talk to someone that's brilliant, that's been treating this with a 100% success rate, he's the guy to talk to. The bottom line is he's discovered, and I'm sure a lot of other people have discovered different things about this, but a cytokine cascade, a big inflammatory reaction. We had a patient that tested positive at our clinics. They came in with active asthma, shortness of breath, and we were concerned. They tested them, they tested positive. They went home, sheltered in place because they weren't, you know, crank cratering or anything. And we called them when the test came back positive. We just sent them home because we didn't have the test back yet. It takes four or five days. And we called her, she's like, I'm fine. Everything's great. Now I can tell you, she was a false positive because she would have died if she had had it because she had all the pre-existing conditions. So that was a PCR test was a false positive. When you, what they're finding out now is people in New York, they've lifted the, they have it in Texas, thank God. They've lifted the coding requirements for medicine. Where we don't even have to list, they don't even have to list treatment or anything to support a diagnosis, which is not really ethical, but they're doing that in New York. So to answer your question, the studies that have the hard data from the smarter people than me say that 99% of those folks all have pre-existing active conditions that would have, the flu would have tipped them over. I'm not saying this isn't serious. I'm just saying a bad case of the flu would have tipped them over too. The, the good news is I do think we need to mitigate the people that are at risk. I think we need to provide for them. I think we need to bring things to them and set up safe zones for them. You know, maybe a certain time where they can go do things, have a store. I mean, let's help the people that are actually at risk and let everyone else build up the immunity. It's much easier to take care of the 0.5% than it is to shut down 99.5% because I own small businesses. I, I have businesses in 12 states. <laughs> Country, this economy is not coming back with wishful thinking and government money. It's only going to come back if people believe in it and get out there and do something. And we can protect those people now. We know how. We know how to treat it with the hydrochloroquine and other, other treatment regimes. So if someone had it tested positive, then tested negative and died from something else, you couldn't say that was a COVID-19 death. But you, you might say, did it weaken their immune system and cause contributing factors? I think that's a fair question. I mean, I, I think, you know, I'm not going to make a comment because I haven't seen this patient's chart. I don't know their vitals or anything going on with them. But... I can tell you from the doctor that I talked to in California that's dealt in the ICU and he's gotten every single person well, this is what he described to me. And they're finding out, we're going to find out more about this. But what we're finding out is it's not as bad as we thought. And that should be something for ce you know, celebration and taking the foot off the gas than pushing it on. And I hear about a second spike. Officially, we hadn't had a first spike yet because we don't know the seed date, and that's just intellectually dishonest to say that we do.
But if you look at the CDC actual numbers, I believe, this is my opinion, but some other people are writing on it, that it was back in January. And Corpus being in the heat, South Texas, there's a reason why we don't have many cases in Africa which has open flights to Wuhan and all their major cities. South America hasn't been hit hard either. So the data is coming out. I'm part of this working group. I literally get reports every day of the most recent data. You give me your email, I'll send them to you. I mean, I, we are, we can use the data, and and be a beacon of light. Honestly, better than the governor's doing. Because I'm not real pleased with the way he's rolling it. I think I think judge, you could do it better. We have the data to support it. So, but I'll be here. Whatever you guys need, I'll help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for waiting too. <clears throat> um, I'm going to ask Dr. Papanini also to come and give some remarks, and then Commissioner Chesney. Who else do we need to move along? I have Mike Fuel. Okay. Then he, Jim Cobb, and of course. We'll do them next. Is Mike here? Yes. Okay, Dr. Papanini, and then we're going to follow it with Andy and Mike and Gary Barney. Okay, let me get the state. Uh, Andy, is that all right if we ask Dr. Papanini and then we'll get to Gary Barney? He has to go. And listen, I know this is, okay, so we won't, we run our own science experiment this morning. And this is what I've discovered, is that people love information. People crave it. And it's good because there's so much to give. And we need to do this a lot. And we will. And if you guys, commissioners, will just help me create the schedule because you know we have our normal court schedule but we can work with Tyner we can do more of these I'm not trying to shortchange any of us I just want you to know that if if you're wondering why it's taking so long it's because it's valuable and it's important to hear from everybody and it's important to hear different perspectives and so uh, welcome Dr. Papanini with that introduction I met Dr. Papanini because of COVID-19 um, but actually, I first heard his name when I was, um, along with City Manager Zanoni and Mayor McComb, working on the health, the local health authority. After decades and decades of Dr. Bergen being our local health authority, he was in his 90s, and uh, we were searching for our new successor. And in that vein, I had the opportunity to see Dr. Papanini's CV, and I, I can certainly get it to you, but as they say, will you trust me when I tell you that you're, he's super impressive. And you've been in the infectious disease, as uh, you've, you're an internist at HCA and a hospitalist, but you've been involved with infectious disease for 20, sorry to date you, about 23 years, somewhere around the, the two, a little up between the two and the three decade mark. And so I met you at that, and I want to thank you because you have been helping us on the front lines, not only at HCA as a physician, but as actually helping our local health department. Uh, we have multiple, when we saw thousands of calls coming in, we didn't have the staff uh, in the doc, we didn't have enough doctors to really help um, Annette uh, in what they call that operation center. So Dr. Papanini, Dr. Janiser, uh, Dr. Ramash Graduni, and others helped uh, Dr. Onifrak and I'm Dr. Alito, I think is our epidemiologist. Those are my ones that I have memorized. But So Dr. Papanini has been helping us uh, really understanding the type of calls that are coming in from one angle and the local health authority. And then he's also been on the forefront of um, treating people. So anyway, Dr. Papanini, you came today and I, I, I wanted to make sure we had some medical, you know, expertise in the room from our own current treatment and what do you um, what can you offer us here today as far as the, some of the treatments that have been going on I, I I was because of you doctor that I got on the star request for hydroxychloroquine zinc sulfate and um, azithromycin and I don't know if words will ever be able to describe uh, the thanks that I have for you talking to me about that because once you give me an order, I'm an excellent soldier. And I went and got that through the process of EOC, Tetum, Gary Barney, man, we must have said that word a hundred times, hydroxychloroquine, and then through the governor's tr strike force. But it was you who first told me about that. And because you were seeing something extraordinary happen in Florida that, that really concerned you. And I hope that that's a good intro for you. Thank you. 
opportunity. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm Dr. Padmini. I came to Corpus about 15 years ago, straight out of my residency, and uh, yes, just a little closer because we're on the. Mike, I'm sorry. We're on the. Uh, and fell in love with the city, and uh, I've been here since. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of medicine, and I teach residents and uh, medical students. Uh, I've been working in the emergency room, in the ICU, and on the floors. Uh, have been involved from day one. And uh, uh, basically, first, I'd like to thank the city and Judge Canales and the county commissioners for an excellent job. That stay-at-home order came in at the right time. That is why we did not see the spike. That is why we did not see many cases in the county. And I'm really, truly thankful. Um, basically, I feel like we are not out of the COVID-19 tunnel, but heading in the right direction. Next few weeks of extensive testing and data collection will show us how far we still have to travel. What we are seeing on the front lines, you know, I've been on the front lines from day one, um, is that the patients present not just with the typical symptoms. This is an evolving situation, right? Nobody knows. Nobody really knows. Initially, we did not know. We thought patients are presenting with fever, cough, shortness of breath. Then we are thinking, hey, this patient may have corona virus or COVID-19 virus. But later on, we kind of, some patients presented very atypically. They could be presenting with a diarrhea. They could be presenting with a stomach ache. Sometimes they're presenting with even uh, clots, and they could be having coronavirus too. Um, so the treatments that are available right now, there is no set treatment that is available. We're kind of a trial and error. So we need, we're trying for the mild cases, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, and for the serious cases, we're trying remdesivir. And our county, because of Dr. Ram and the health department, um, we were the, one of the first ones to give plasma treatment. That seemed to have worked. You know, some of the patients came off the ventilators very quickly. And uh, we are also trying steroids on the patients on the ventilators. That seemed to have helped. Initial data showed the CDC recommendations and the WHO said, don't use steroids. So we weren't using them. And then the treatment changed a little bit later. We are using steroids and patients are getting better. So there are three things here. One, is the pandemic over yet? Um, we're in the middle of it. Like I said, we're in the tunnel, COVID-19 tunnel. Um, we're heading in the right direction, but we're not there yet. We're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, but we're not there yet. Dr. Papanini, um, one of the things that and I, and I am glad to hear different perspectives. I mean, that's what government's all about. It's not about one way or the highway. It's about all of our views, right? But one of the things that I wanted to bring up, just because I'm so sensitive to numbers, and, um, and I don't mind sharing this with Dr. Rose, because like I said, I've known Dr. Rose for many years, but when he said that it's like the flu, I have to say that I disagree but not because I'm a doctor, just because I wanted to disagree on the numbers, and, and I don't mind sharing this with him, but I think Johns Hopkins is a pretty reputable resource, as well as the CDC on 2018-2019 influenza. And, of course, um, those numbers indicate that there are 12 to 61,000 uh, U.S. deaths per year from the influenza, and that's based on not only Johns Hopkins reporting, but they, we tend to use Johns Hopkins. If you look at all your charts, they always say Johns Hopkins there at the bottom because they're uh, obviously a world-class research facility. And then also the CDC. So right now through April 22nd, we have 45,000 deaths already. Of course, the flu, 12 to 60,000, but that's an entire year. And uh, yesterday, I think we hit an all-time high of 9,000 deaths in a day. So... We have eclipsed, coronavirus has eclipsed any other disease as being the, the largest attributable cause of death for Americans. And so I think when, when we look at that, do you concur that the flu is different 
for many reasons, including the R naught or the spread of it. What what is it that you can tell us as an infectious disease specialist? Because I do believe that there are things that possibly we can agree on from the presentation that we heard earlier. But there are things that I certainly disagree with respectfully. But I would rather the audience hear it from you, not me. Although I'm happy to flip around my screen and show them the Johns Hopkins and the CDC statements. But I I think that you are on the front line. So what would you say to that about the flu versus coronavirus or COVID-19? Well, Judge, uh, thank you for that question. That's an excellent question. And one, I'm not an infectious disease specialist. I'm an internal medicine. Um, but my primary interest is infectious diseases. It is, it is different than flu. Symptoms may be similar, like flu patients will get fever, cough, and if it progresses to pneumonia, they'll have a shortness of breath. The similar way, coronavirus also, the patients will have fever, shortness of breath, and cough. Symptoms-wise, but the disease itself is very different. The, what's different about coronavirus is it's so contagious. Initial data, what we have seen, it's only been eight weeks. 10 years down the road, we'll have a perfect vision, 2020 vision. We'll all know the data and everything about coronavirus. But this is, right now, it's being in the battle, in the front lines. You don't know. You're learning every day from the data. So what we know so far is this disease is very contagious. The initial r naught ratio is about 3. r naught is like how much, if one person is infected, how much infectivity, how many people can get infected with this. But the real world data is showing that the r naught ratio could be even higher. More people get infected very quickly. If one person is infected, it could spread to four or five people and to 22 people after seven days very quickly. That's what we're seeing. And the thing that is different from the influenza is that influenza is r naught ratio is about one. The infectivity is less, so it spreads a little slower. The coronavirus, what's dangerous is it spreads super fast. If one case is positive, four weeks down the road, we could have 10,000 cases. That's what is dangerous about the coronavirus. And of those 10,000 cases, we may have 10% that are sick enough to come to the hospital. And that means if 10,000 are infected, 10% 10 is 1,000 patients. And of those 1,000 patients, we're seeing about three to 400 requiring ICU care. That overwhelms our healthcare systems. That's what is dangerous about the coronavirus. And is this is this contagious, this highly contagious nature is why, sadly, my friends in Midland, who I'm very close to, they had an outbreak in one of their assisted living or nursing homes. And, of course, we've seen this in pockets around the country, but it's always painful for us to see that happen to, to a Texas county. And so you can see situations where you can have it perfectly. You think, I'm doing great. But then if that virus enters a certain arena, yep. you can see that sad Any case. which spike very quickly. Very quickly. In New York, January, everything was perfectly fine. February, it started spreading. March, late March, now we have over 200 to 300,000 cases in a span of four weeks. It's not the disease itself, the how much the kill ratio, what we call it is not high, but it, the spread is the one that we are worried about, the contagiousness. That's where your stay home order came into effect. Uh, so Doctor, judge. let me ask you, the, the, and again, this is from one case, and I, you know, we, we, we've all learned as we go. Mm -hmm. My concern is, are, are all of these deaths really related, or really COVID deaths? Because I think we now have pretty good empirical data to know what a flu death is. But based on, and I know it's one case in Robstown, but there's a lot of question over really whether that was a, a true, I'm not saying it wasn't, I don't know, COVID death. So how do we know, you know, that's, that's what makes society so skeptical is you hear one of these things, and that may be the exception. I may be just totally an exception. But if this is how they're reporting COVID deaths around the country, then in theory, 20 or 30 percent of these could not be, let me take away a number, I always hate to throw numbers out, that's not fair, a, a percentage of these deaths could be not COVID deaths. Let me understand the question. Um, 
So what you're asking is, How do we really let's say know? if they're reporting 100 deaths, are those 100 deaths are really from coronavirus, or right. COVID-19 deaths? How do we know? Are they coming from other countries? Is that the... Yes, sir. How, how, how does society get a grasp on this? Because, you know, we, we, don't, we, know, we don't know so much about this. We know flu, and we can pretty much, I think, say that's a flu death with some confidence. It's hard for me to listen to these cases and say that was a COVID death with confidence. I'm not saying it wasn't. I'm not a doctor. How do we as a society get comfortable with knowing whether all these deaths that have been reported are really COVID deaths? How do we I, get there? In my opinion, I do believe they are related to COVID-19. And in fact, if you look at the data, it is being underreported. Initially, the people are dying, and they, we didn't know it is COVID-19 positive the first few months. And now, some people may pass away from other conditions, and then you're testing for them. And if it is COVID-19, it may be the complications from COVID-19. We're learning about the disease. Right, we're still in the learning phase. It's it's only eight weeks, right. so COVID nineteen does not cause. I mean, it causes respiratory failure, and it is also causing other complications like formation of blood clots in the lungs, formation of blood clots in the legs, and other complications. It's causing uh, heart attacks. So, is the heart attack the cause? But the primary cause is the infection that led to the heart attack or that led to the respiratory failure or that led to the blood clot. Does it make sense? Yes. And it's just, it's, it's, it's interesting to hear two doctors in two days or two different presentations yeah. say two pretty different things. That's what makes this, I think, hard for everybody to... Yeah, if you look at Wuhan data, the China changed their yes, data. Sir. You know, that was a big news mm -hmm. last week. That was because they only reported the positive cases in the beginning. And then they went back and they modified the data. Okay, anybody that died with these symptoms. You know, I, I was born in India and I'm following the cases over there. They had a strict lockdown for the last three weeks. It started 500 cases three weeks ago. And talk about warm and humid climate, it doesn't get any more hotter and humid <laughs> than India. Right now it's 20,000 cases as of today. And the quarantine is throughout the country 100 times stricter than what we are having right now. Make sense? And, and let me just say that Dr. Ramash, and I apologize, um, you're right, you're not, you're an internist, but you have a, as they say, an affinity for infectious disease, and that's kind of where your, where your practice has, has tended in, in internal medicine. Dr. Ramash Graduni is an infectious disease specialist, the only one in Corpus Christi, I believe he and his partner, and he is working for us at the local health authority. And what I can tell you is that while I appreciate the different perspectives, and I truly do, that's not the first time I've spoken with Dr. Rose, okay? So I already knew what was coming. But what I can tell you is that Dr. Papanini, Dr. Ramash Graduni, and others are actually treating the actual people who are on ventilators and who have been on ventilators and they belong to a hospitalist group of over 300 physicians across our nation, and they were heavily concentrated in Florida. And we got the recipient of that data as it happened two weeks before it even hit here with our index patient, okay? And to speak, uh, to be honest with you, again, was I resistant to the cause? I don't want anyone, particularly the state, telling our doctors, what the cause of death is. But make no mistake, it's critical that we capture this data. And but for her fragile state in COVID, which she never recovered from by her own admission, I mean, it's not a court of law, but I will tell you that we know this from talking with the local health authority. This woman did die of COVID complications, or I'm sorry, the proper way to say it is COVID relationships, because she never felt well afterwards, and but for that experience, she was okay. And I'm not, I, right, I'm just I saying, I'm but there's always that, but let me tell you how I think you can satisfy the, the desire is all you have to do is turn on the news and to see the tents that have become morgue trailers in New York, in Albany, Georgia, in Detroit, Michigan, in Louisiana, 
New Orleans, in Washington State, and others. And what's really frightening is that through county judges' calls, because we're all the emergency managers flowing from the governor, we, we hear of the horror stories where your numbers are low, but for the fact that you have 40% of your numbers coming from that one assembly line, like in South Dakota, over 600 people. or So this virus is so different than the flu because of that nature. And it takes one time for one infected person to be in a vulnerable population to create havoc for your hospitals or for your community. And that has been the fear. And that's genuine and real. And I don't think that Dr. Rose and I would disagree on that because he mentioned the vulnerable populations. He and I agree on that 100%. And I also agree with him that data should drive decisions. But I also believe that you have to have faith in the organization. And our organization is the CDC. And at every turn, I've really followed the governor and the CDC. And to much extent, in the beginning, the president, who initially put the 15-day stop the spread in place. And I, I understand his perspective, but Dr. Papanini, before you go, one of the things that I wanted to say is just mention the, a lot of people don't know about the plasma. Would you just tell the commissioners again, we were on the forefront twice, three times. Yes. We were on the forefront for drive through testing. We were on the forefront of hydroxychloroquine because of you and your colleagues. And we were on the forefront of convalescent plasma. The hydrochloroquine, just so the audience knows, is a is a drug. Is that correct? Yes, uh, it's hydroxychloroquine is a medication. Normally, we would use it for rheumatoid arthritis or as lupus patients. Some of the data, we did, we still don't know whether it works or not. But some of the data, what we have seen is, if somebody is infected, and they have mild symptoms not serious symptoms, when they have mild symptoms, early on, if you give them hydroxychloroquine, there is a chance, but we believe they may not progress. They may not need ICU care. That's what we're doing right now. If somebody is having a mild symptoms, we're giving hydroxychloroquine. That seems to help. Again, I'm not sure. At two years down the road, we will have the research data to say for sure, but it's anecdotal data which we are believing in. And as far as the plasma, uh, Judge Canales, we are one of the first counties in the entire country to start doing that. But again, we, it's, it's again from intuitiveness, like basically if somebody is infected with the virus, two weeks after the infection, they develop antibodies. So what we do is we uh, take plasma from a recovered patient and we give it to the sick patient that's on the ventilator, hoping that these antibodies will fight the infection and makes the patient better. And we have tried that on several patients here and seen a rapid improvement. Patient was able to come off of the ventilator very quickly after we gave the plasma, two rounds of plasma treatment. And we are the one of the first counties to do that. Yeah, and I just... I and we shared that information right. with, actually, Dr. Ram has sent that information to... Uh, bunch of physician groups in San Antonio, and they started doing that. We even shared the data with the, our experience to other counties and right. to other places. We Right. So I, I was going to say, I always, maybe this is the lawyer in me, but I do try to find things that I can agree with, even with people I disagree with. And that's another area that I agree with Dr. Rosen, is that I do believe that our county has been a leader. We haven't stayed in our lane when I didn't feel it was in our best interest and our team didn't feel it was in our best interest. We went to Tetum, and he'll tell you that shortly, and we said we want to go out of our lane and go into the hydroxychloroquine because we believe our doctors are telling us that's the best thing. And we did, and it was good. And the same thing with convalescent plasma. So I, I just want to say thank you to that. I gave a lot of praise early on for Christus. You come from the HCA group, and I'd also like to pay it forward to HCA for, for their for their great minds, because it's it really has, everybody's had such a different opportunity. So let me ask commissioners, before I let you go and bring Tita up, we just need you back. We just need to keep doing this. But you talked about the hospitalization, I'm sorry, that the treatments. Is there any questions? Okay, let me have Commissioner Vaughn talk about the treatments. Yep. I tried to bring commissioners different experts for different things. I hope you can see that. 
And Dr. Papanini really has been treating these patients, and so that's why he knows so much about the treatments. Go ahead, Commissioner. Okay, just a comment. Um, thank you for bringing him. That was a good presentation. I think it's so important to have two different opinions because I think you could put 10 doctors in this room and you could have half and half or different opinions. They would have studies that would support what they believe. And this way, the public, I like the different opinions because I do agree with some you've said, probably most of it, but Dr. Rhodes, I agree with a lot as well. Um, this is not so much a treatment, but, at, but I want to get your opinion before you leave. He said that the heat kills the virus. Do you agree with that? No. Okay. There is no data. No data to prove that. There is no data to prove that. We were hopeful, weren't we, doctor? We were hopeful. <laughs> Initially, everybody was hopeful. But um, again, this virus was discovered in December. There were a lot of theories out there. Some people were saying humidity will kill it, heat will kill it. Um, current data from WHO and CDC clearly shows that that may not ha temperatures and humidity may not have an effect. One thing I know that will work is social distancing, washing your hands, taking general precautions. That works. That much I know. But as far as the humidity and the heat, that's just a, you know, oh, wishful thinking, I guess. Okay, so if, say, I were to get the coronavirus today and I were to go in the hospital, what is the most effective treatment that you would put on a patient? And I know the treatment's going to be different if they're on a, other things, but um, what, what, what's the most effective that y'all are using? So the question is, if I get a patient with coronavirus, what would I treat him with? Is, is that the question, Commissioner? So it depends on the severity. Um, for instance, if 100 people were to be infected with coronavirus, I believe 50 of them will be asymptomatic. Means that they may experience a little mild symptoms. They may not even know that they have an infection. They'll go on living their life. And about, I would say about 30 patients may get cough and fever and mild symptoms, can stay at home, no treatment needed. And about 10 patients that will get sick enough, they'll start to experience shortness of breath. Once they experience shortness of breath, that means the infection is affecting the lung lining. That's when I know this patient needs a hospitalization, needs a monitor. So again, out of 100 patients, 10 will come to the hospital. And depending on the symptoms, I would start them on hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin in the beginning. And what we have seen is five out of those 10 would recover on just hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. And remaining five may need ICU care. Once they are in the ICU, depending on the severity, means what we call it is if they're requiring a ventilation, we're giving plasma treatment, means that plasma donated by the recovered patients, steroids, and a ventilator treatment, and a supportive care, general supportive care in the ICU. Does that answer your question? Well, if you said that cough and mild, they would get mild treatment, they would get to stay at home. Yes. Okay. We, so do, we do not recommend them coming into the hospital. Have you had any that you allowed that to happen and then they ended up getting worse and would it have been better just to put them in there and watch after them so they wouldn't have gotten worse? So when a patient experiences mild symptoms, the first precaution we give is monitor yourself. The moment you feel shortness of breath, you need to call us. That's when we know to bring them into the hospital. That's the trigger. That's the trigger. And the trigger for me to bring them into the hospital yeah. is shortness of breath. And you know what? Or if they come to the hospital, what we can do is a pulse oximeter. We can measure their oxygen saturation. If it's starting to fall below 90%, or, or, or we're even keeping 92%. Normal, if you check anybody in this room, they'll be around 99%. But if we start to see that number drop, on the pulse oximeter below 92%. That's when I know to put them in the hospital and monitor them closely. So we've got, the judge has got someone taking temperatures downstairs, which is appreciated. But I think my point is, or what I'm trying to say is, we've got, people could be coming in here that don't have fever. Yes. Could be a carrier. Yes. So what right. good does that do? Again, Commissioner, we're learning about it. Like I said, 50 of them could be asymptomatic. Maybe walking around carrying the virus and no symptoms. Yeah. Or if somebody is exposed last week, 
they may begin to experience their symptoms 14 days later. That's what makes this virus so dangerous. For 14 days, they may not have any symptoms walking around. Yeah, and yeah. that's such a good point. So what I've done is tried to think of ways that I can, as they say, there's a great cartoon and all the water's coming. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, the, the, the feet, the toes are pulling some, and the fingers are pulling others. The nose has got one, and that's what I was doing with the fever check is – is that by doing the fever check, it's taking out one of the symptoms. The other thing I've done, and I'd like your help on this, because you have such great platforms to constituents, is tell them, shortness of breath, call 911, yes. and tell them that you think you're experiencing COVID-19 symptoms. That triggers our EMS folks to be dressed properly and to attend you properly. But it's the shortness of breath, that difficulty breathing, is the big one and we're now pivoting towards that the other thing is is that i know this is funny but a lot of people don't know they have a fever if it's at that hundred you know uh ask a lot of middle-aged women <laughs> you know you just don't know that you don't have a fever and so that's important to, to mitigate that we haven't gotten here dr papanini and i've got to get gary on yeah. but i don't want to let you go either without talking about masks and we talk about this is a perfect segue I want to see the business disaster rectified, right? I want to revive our economy, and I want to keep people safe. It's pretty simple. A question before we go to the mask. Sure. Dr. Um, Dr. Rose mentioned about a, if a person has the virus and goes outside, doesn't spread it to, you, to somebody else, but if he goes to his brother because they live together, he spreads it to his brother. So if that to me, I see the person that has it. If he, if you open everything up, they're both in the community now. So can they both spread it? Okay. Um, question is that if there is an infected person out there, can they spread in the community? Is that the question, Commissioner? Absolutely. Yes. That's what I'm worried about. Um, if we let, – let me track back a little bit. Commissioner, your question was – if somebody is asymptomatic, what good are we doing, right? What are we doing? So that's where the social distancing in the stay at home come, helps us. Because we don't know who is asymptomatic, we don't know who has the virus. So only thing that helps us is for them to not come out into the community, stay at home or practicing the social distancing, wearing a mask, washing your hands, the, the, we're doing these things because of these asymptomatic patients, because we don't want those asymptomatic patients spreading it. Does, does it help? My big concern was you're sending them home when they've got that and they think they've got the COVID or they do have it. And my concern is, would it not be better to bring them in? I know you said shortness of breath. I get that. But when you know, and, and the reason you're getting these questions from me is I'm just a normal citizen. And I know, yes. I know I, I'm you glad you're asking these questions. I'm, I love it. So <laughs> simple. Yeah. Here I am, I'm sick, I've got the virus. You're sending me home. I'm going to get worse when you could have put me in the hospital so I wouldn't get worse. You see what I'm saying? So. When you hear that news. Yes. That's got to be very scary and fearful. So I'll give you a, let's say, 20-year-old healthy patient was tested positive for corona, and he calls us and says, I have cough and fever. Most likely, I would not treat that patient. We would not give any medication to that patient. We will tell the patient to stay at home and quarantine themselves. The likelihood for them to progress into a serious situation is very, very less. Does it make sense? Well, and, and I guess thinking you don't want to fill the hospitals with people that don't have more severe symptoms when they, you think they can recover at home. Am I correct? That's, that's what we have seen on the front lines is that Majority, 90% of the people will recover if they have mild symptoms, yes. And all, you did a great presentation. And all the things that you've talked about today, do you have any kind of um, research that would substantiate what you've said too? Yes. Okay, yes. great. Yes. I mean, we, we're learning last eight weeks, like, to see what's happening with, the, with our patients. And if they have mild symptoms, there is no need for them to be in the hospital. If their pulse ox is showing 99%, most, most likely they will recover. But it's that 10% of the patients that are showing shortness of breath or a drop in the pulse ox. That's 
who we, we would like to monitor them in the hospital very closely. My, let, me finish, let me finish my, uh, the, what I hear you saying, doctor, is you're not, you're not, in your opinion, we shouldn't just open the doors and everybody out. I can't advise you on the policy, commissioner. I'm just a physician. I'm just uh, giving you a scientific data on this. But uh, as a physician, if it's up to me, um, I would recommend, you know, relaxing, but do it in phases, slowly, and education, like, hey, this is not over yet. We're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, but let's just not open everything up immediately, because what if that asymptomatic carrier out there and start to spread suddenly, and then the spike that we avoided with all the hard work we did last four weeks, and four weeks down the road, we have to deal with the surge again? The last one is, do you agree that everybody in New York that got sick or died was because of flu? Not the virus? No, it is because of the coronavirus. That's all, yes. That's all I wanted. Yes. And, and I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to ask you one final question, which is we're going to be, I guess, at some point today talking about masks. And the reason that I brought it up was because of mass transit. And, you know, we're not New York. I want to be, I want to go on the record. You know how I know we're not New York? Because I have two daughters that live there. Mm -hmm. I know a lot about New York because every day I have to hear the stories of New York. And, um, and so I understand what's happening there and I understand what's different about here. I also have two sons in California, so I'm a pretty good barometer right now <laughs> from what's happening in the hot spots. But what I wanna say about the things that I have learned is about mass transit in Texas. And we're not Houston, Dallas, or San Antonio either. But it's concerning to me, doctor, and I want to do know your medical opinion on this, that if we can prevent people from riding on buses, okay, that would sit down close to you from coughing, sneezing, or breathing in conveying these droplets, if masks would be helpful in mitigating, it's one of those thumbs that I have on the water that keeps coming out at me, would that be a positive mitigating factor if we would require masks in, ma masks in certain public spaces where it's reasonable to believe that you cannot social distance? Um, let me get back to you on that, Judge. Okay. I would like to confer with Dr. A absolutely. That's, that's what I really want to know because my concern is, is that I believe that the governor is pivoting to opening up business in the next few weeks on a phased approach. I can support that if we have the factors that keep people safe. If people want businesses open, and I know they do because I know I do, I believe it's worth the trade. You know, that there's an old saying, that's a good trade. It's a good trade for me Again, to I, put this on. Again, you know, I want to say wear a mask in the public places, in mass transit yeah. and stuff, but I'd, I'd like to get opinion of my colleagues. You bet, I want that. Before yeah. I can give you a, because the thing is the mask, you know, it, it does help the person that's wearing because it prevents you from touching your nose or touching your mouth accidentally. Yeah. And it could be a double-edged sword because you have to know how to properly put it on, properly take right. it out because when you're, that's one of the things what we have seen with Ebola is like one of the nurses that got in. It's about when you're taking it off, if you accidentally touch outside or so. Right. So much to learn about that. Yes. <laughs> and that's what I'm doing. When I have to make these hard decisions as the emergency manager, and this is a perfect segue uh, to explain to the public why I have to make them and why they're not a collective decision by the court. Um, when I have to make these decisions, it's really important that I do seek out counsel. And, and I, I try to at every step of the way. I have, as they say, bosses, and they have bosses and bosses. And that's through the uh, Texas Department of Emergency Management. So we're, I look for guidance where I can find it. But when they ultimately say, it's you that have to make that decision, it helps me when I know what, I don't want to give people a false sense of security either that this does not protect me from getting the virus. If I put this on like this, and I w had a dry mouth here and I was coughing, it protects you 
from my cough, but it doesn't protect me from you yep. unless you and I are social distancing, right? Again, I instinctively want yeah. to say that, but I, I'd like to get the opinion. Sure. So, I mean, those are the things that we're talking about, and I just want you to know that's what this court is interested in because I'm not one to say I want to make government. I, I don't believe that I should – make you do something. I'm not interested in taking away people's liberties. What I am interested in is keeping people as safe as possible, and I think the trade could be a good one in certain places. And that's what I want you to go investigate with your with the hospitalists. And I've, I've asked Dr. Ram to do the same, and I'm going to get all these this information. It won't just be you I put on the, on the spot, so sorry. I'm getting collective information. But I think that it's going to be an important discussion for us to have because this business of social responsibility, if everybody were responsible, we wouldn't need any laws, would we? No. Would, would we need laws to prevent people from stealing or from causing harm to people? If everybody's so good, if everybody can just behave, if everybody can just take care of themselves, we would be need for no laws. I would not need a jail. We would have a lot more money to help people. But I'll tell you what I do know as an officer of the court is that laws and rules and order are also very much a part of our framers intent and I'm very sensitive to the balancing act and that's what we're bringing forth so please take this back to HCA to your colleagues and I'm also extending the same offer through Dr. Ram and through the health authority and they're all going to be giving me information and then I'll have to make that difficult decision and these commissioners are also getting information from their uh, folks and their constituents as well. But um, I just think that uh, we can't say it enough. Thank you for your valuable insight and your information. And uh, we'll transfer as to why in the world would I have to make that decision, Gary Barney. Uh, if you will come up, and Dr. Papanini, would you make yourself available for questions from commissioners by email? Yes. Is it all right if I share with them your yeah, email? Please share my phone number. Because you're going to think of something. Is that okay, Commissioner? You, you're going to maybe want to know uh, Dr. Papanini's name is going to be memorized now for you. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you for the opportunity. Again, um, we, we are heading in the right direction. In next four to eight weeks with the extensive testing and the data collection will show us a lot more when, how we can uh, relax and everything and stuff like that. So, again, thank you so much for the opportunity. Please feel free to call me anytime. Thank you so much. Gary, I might have met you maybe when we did our drills. I never knew then how important you would be in our lives here in Nueces County. And um, would you please tell everybody who you are, what you do, and how you've been interacting with us? Thank you, Judge. Uh, pleasure to be here in front of y'all. Uh, don't like being here for the circumstances. Uh, my name's Gary Barney. I'm the district coordinator for District 20, which is Corpus Christi, um, with the Texas Division of Emergency Management. Uh, I'll give you a condensed version, if you will, of TDEM 101 and, and emergency management in the state of Texas. Uh, we'll back up a little bit in Texas overall, big state, large footprint. We can hit the Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, cover Mexico, and almost hit Canada. The, we have 254 counties in the state. There's 250, I believe, cities over 10,000 of, of the population. We're number one in all the states in, in disasters. We have a major disaster in the state of Texas av on average every 10 months. We lead every other state in the nation on that. We'll come down to this level and who's responsible for what. It's set out in Government Code 418 on exactly who is responsible in those counties. On the county level, it's the judge, is the emergency management director for that county. On the city levels, it's the mayor, is the emergency management director for that county. They hold the sole responsibility of those of that process, as set out in the government code 418. Now, the way emergency management is set up, we've got six districts in the state, plus the capital. Within those, I say six districts, six regions. Within those regions, it's split up into districts. And there's 24 districts in the state of Texas. I happen to be the coordinator in District 20. Um, 
the way emergency management works, every incident starts on the local level. Doesn't matter what it is, it's that local level. Um, in this case, uh, it happened to be the, the coronavirus issue. The local level does everything they can possibly to manage it as best they can. When they need resources, they reach out to their neighbors, to their mutual aid agreements uh, for resources. Once those resources are exceeded, they'll come to the state uh, and ask for resources. In this case, we have a disaster district, a DDC, disaster district chair, and that's the highway patrol captain in this region. That, he oversees a, a disaster district council, and that council is made up of, of folks from TDEM, uh, American Red Cross, Texas Parks and Wildlife, um, 211 districts, uh, the, the United Way, a bunch of different agencies in one think tank, if you will, to be able to, to vet out supply requests or assistance requests. That's done through a STAR process. It's called a state assistance, state Texas assistance request, and STAR request for short. They'll come in, be filled out at that the local level. It'll come to the DDC level. If we're able to fill it there with the, the people on the council that are there, we'll fill it at that DDC level. If we can't fill it at that DDC level, that will then go to the state level, and that's at the State Operations Center in Austin. Through there, it'll go through a vetting process, determine where that request needs to go. In this case, uh, the most of the medical requests are going to the Department of State Health Services. They are the lead on this incident. We are tasked with uh, assisting them in any way we can for this incident. And so as the requests come in, they get processed, They'll get processed at the local level, through the DDC level, and then to the state level. From there, if the state cannot process that, it'll go through FEMA. And they'll request that. Uh, the governor will reach out to the president to request that. The local component is always engaged. It doesn't matter if we have a type one team, FEMA team in our town right now that judge and that mayor are still the emergency directors, emergency management directors and say what goes. So I hope that answers some of the questions. It, it does, and, and of course I wanna tell the audience that we're very blessed in Texas because the governor put together a strike force as well. So there have been times where Gary's tried his best and said to me, I can't help you, Barbara. I'm, I'm, I'm out of resources, but we are gonna transfer your request to the governor's strike team strike force team, and he put together a world-class, in my opinion, procurement team and also specialists, and one of them was in charge of uh, Dell Computer's world global procurement, and so he kind of plucked him out of the private sector and put him in on behalf of the state of Texas. He also put in a chief, uh, well, director, Nim Kidd, who has been through, as Gary said, I mean, think about that. We, it's not a distinction where we want to talk about, but it does make us battle-tested. So this incident command structure that you're talking about, is it the same for all 254 counties? It is, it is. And everything's set up through the National Incident Management System, or NIMS for short. Um, it's adopted through FEMA. It's what everybody in the state, everybody in the nation trains on that level. So when we talk about people having classes um, and going through processes to become emergency managers, emer emergency managers that's part of the process yeah. of going through those steps. It's a, it's a fascinating system, and like I said, as a baby judge, so to speak, only been here a year and a half, it's the first thing that they teach you, right, through your conferences and through your drills, and, and you sort of recognize right off the bat that it's so different than the normal role of judge. In the normal role of judge, I always tell everybody that I meet with, even if I think you hung the moon, even if you're the best thing I've ever seen, I'm one vote, I'm one I'm just one person who can be advocate. I, I try to run a court that's a certain way um, because I enjoy the process very much of, of bringing input. And But in this role, it's completely almost the opposite. And because of Open Meetings Act, it also creates the issue of we're all not in uh, EOC. And I just wanted, I know the commissioners know this already. This is preaching to the choir. But what I really wanted was for the people to hear it. I really wanted the people to understand. I think I probably get, I don't know, I mean, hundreds of emails, um, you know, a week that 
99% of them are unbelievably supportive. And then there's always that one that I wish I could, you know, there was a way for me to connect with them personally and say, the reason I get to make this choice for all of us is because this is, this is the law, this is how it works. And by the way, it's got a proven track record, right? It, it works well, and that's why we keep it. But I'm just a soldier at the end of the day. I didn't make the law. I didn't create, I didn't, you know, I didn't, I don't even administer it. I just, I just execute upon it. And so it's one of the things I thought, Gary, is that I've enjoyed yesterday for the first time. I met your boss. And so above you, tell us how this works. Okay, so we've got the district coordinators, and that's exactly what we do. We coordinate everything on our level. Then above that, we have assistant chiefs, and they cover the region. We've got six, seven assistant chiefs. Um, and from there, we've got another assistant chief overseeing everything. And then we've got Nim Kidd, who's the vice chancellor of Texas A&M. And so yesterday, I was able to visit with uh, Chief Pena, who is uh, just, he's, he's in the Valley, I believe. He's out of uh, McAllen. McAllen. And he, he covers a 31-county region. I want to say Harlingen, actually. More. Harlingen, yeah. So it's, it's a fascinating system, and it's one that we should all get more familiar with. And when we do the town hall, I'm going to have a big flow chart, I've decided, behind me, because it'll be on Zoom and so I, I wish I could, like, and we might be able to do this maybe through our YouTube portal. But I really want people to understand it because whether it's a hurricane or an environmental or chemical, it doesn't matter what the disaster is, we, this is the same protocol. And I also want you to know that most of these disasters, it's not that they're ever over with. Look, we're still recovering from Hurricane Harvey. But the incident of EOC level readiness one is over quicker and say something like this. This is, as we all say, unprecedented, but it, it puts us in new in new territory. And so I think that the, the folks would be comfortable to know, well, how come my, you know, I, I want to go to my commissioner and I want my commissioner to tell me why she made that decision. And it's uncomfortable for people to hear that they didn't get a chance to make that decision. And it's important that they know that that I'm not making any of this in isolation, that I I have a whole team, and in fact, if my team couldn't be here, or if it needed help, could I call the state of Texas and they would bring me a team? Exactly. And that's the way it's set up. Um, and, and we go back to 254 counties, and I think what you're looking to, um, just the size of the state. You know, what's happening in Lubbock is not the same thing that's happening in Corpus Christi or the same thing that's ha happening in Houston. And one of the reasons that the, that local authority comes into play is just that reason. They're able to know what's going on exactly in their jurisdiction and meet those jurisdictional needs. So that's right. one of the reasons it's set up that way. And and I will say that one of the interesting things is is that um, I guess if I could stop time, and boy, have I prayed for that just for a few days. If I could stop time, I would um, really be able to say, come and, come and listen in, because the, the governor calls upon his county judges and mayors on one call. And then we call upon our EOC in another call. And, and it's interesting. The, it's a layered cake, if you will. And you're, it is you're peeling an onion. It is. It's peeling an onion. And you really get to see why isn't he calling all of us? It isn't because he doesn't value you. Of course he does. You're a public servant elected by the people. But it's because of the layering of the approach. Um, I heard somebody who, you know, said leadership by committee in an emergency, you know, is not possible. And and I think that to some extent, what I want the public to know is that that's true, but we also have tremendous resources through you to get experts and answers. When I've needed dishes on the phone, I've said, help me get dishes on the phone, that's, right? That's exactly one of the things we're here for, to fill that gap for, for, for that need. Um, not necessarily the decision-making end of it, but to give you as much information as you possibly can to make those decisions and get you in touch with the right people that can inform you correctly. And I wrote something down your chief said, and I'm going to take it to heart, and he said, the minute we mobilize, we prepare for demobilization. That's how it is in war as well. And this is a war of a different kind, and even though it hasn't impacted our community, thank God, in the way it has New Orleans and even Houston or Austin, it, it has impacted us. It's cost us a lot of money. 
uh, from preparation and preparedness from our own county services. It's hurt. Um, I wanted to address the behavioral health issues that Dr. Rose mentioned that are very real, and we've had to make those uh, adjustments to get more help to people. And it's affected us um, in the economy, and we just happen to be sensitive to the two economies that it's hit the worst, the energy industry and the tourism industry. Uh, we happen to sit in the corridor of both of those. So I think that um, TEDM is, is a great resource for us, but when Chief Pena said that, I wrote it down because I want to memorize it and that what you're seeing this workshop is, and I'm going to need your help, commissioners, is we've got to prepare for demobilization. So that means every major industry is going to need our help and guidance, and I'm going to need your help and guidance. Uh, and we've talked about this, and I know Andy's here to tell us more about how to work with the Restaurant Association. Pastor, I've been watching that you've been here so patiently. I, I asked Maggie to reach out to you this morning. I need help with the clergy. Uh, we got new guidance yesterday. I know that you're ready because you've been ready. How, do, how can I get worship services back up and running safely? I want to keep I want to keep encouraging remote wherever we can be remote, right? But I know now that we can do things safely if you help me, if we're partners. And that's where I, I reach out to this colleague um, orchestra. I mean, that's mobilizing to demobilize. That's exactly what Chief meant. And he said, Barbara, I don't envy you, but this is our role. We're not here to talk about what's good. We're here to prepare for worst case scenario every day. So you must be a different Barbara. And you may not like that and people may not like that about you, but you are no longer uh, Barbara the consensus builder. Bar you, are, you have to act for the worst case scenario and prepare for that and prepare for demobilization as well. And that's a, that's a hard thing, but if you rely, if I can rely on you guys to help me with the industries, uh, I think we can reopen CC, reopen Noesis, when the governor says it's okay to, first and foremost. People are really confused by this, Gary. Who's in charge? If, if the governor has an order, can I violate that order? That's between you and the governor. <laughs> exactly. I might get thrown in jail. The point is, is that I can be more restrictive than the governor, but I cannot violate that which the governor has put forth. And, and that's really important. So when people say, just open them up, for God's sakes, woman, just open them up, I cannot do that. I can, I can do the opposite, but I cannot do, and, and that's what happened with beaches. And, um, and so I think that it's really important to, um, to just kind of understand the structure, and, and I hope that will you also make yourself available to the commissioners? You bet. Okay, because does anybody have any questions before we let Gary go to his next meeting about structure? Or, okay, this is the guy you want to know right here. <laughs> well, one of the things that comes up is communications, and I've got to say this uh, – this whole community has been fantastic with communications as, as far as the emergency management network and making things happen. Uh, the counties, the mayors, the judges, and everybody is in, in it for the fight, and they're, they're looking at the number one thing, life safety. And so. And Gary, um, I'm not on these calls because they're mainly for, uh, like, directors uh, like um, uh, Melissa and Billy Delgado from the, from the city, but you guys also talk every week, right? Yes, almost daily. Daily. I'm sorry. Yeah, almost daily. And, and that's like Rick, that's like, uh, help me out, Rick Adams in Port A, he's on that call too, right? Yeah, so it's all emergency uh, management teams on, on those calls. We'll set that up. We're doing it twice a week right now, um, just so the emergency management coordinators in one county um, can talk to the emergency managers in the other county. And okay. We're all on the same page looking at everything um, with as much information as possible. Great, great. Okay, sorry that uh, we made you wait so long, but... Um, that's, that's, we appreciate it. I'm going to um, uh, recognize that I've, we've been here through three hours, and um, I'm going to take the liberty of, of having you text or, to, or Tyner, just take a five-minute break for bathroom and for getting your lunch ordered, and we're going to have lunch delivered to you here, if that's all right, and that way we can keep on. We're not, we've got a lot of wonderful people that are here to share information with us. I think we'll want to have Mike or Andy. We're going to have Andy next, but Andy, we're just going to take that five-minute. Andy, are you here? 
Andy, I've never met you. I'm Barbara. Thank you. Give us five minutes just to recess for the for the quick protocol. And if you guys need water or coffee, my office can, you just have to tell the deputy and we'll bring that out to you. Okay? All right. Let's just recess for the clerk at 1212. I'll be back on the record at about in five minutes. Okay? Or f Thank you. Hello, sir. Hold on. Give me one sec.
brought you a delicious meal, sir. I have mics back on, and I'm going to gavel us back in at 12.25 p.m. for the clerk. And the court recognizes and thanks Andy Taubman for, for coming today and to talk about an initiative that I only time and maybe a week ago, maybe two weeks on the radio when you were first starting it, and now it seems very timely to discuss some of the efforts that you've put forth on an initiative to, we're talking about that re-mobilization. Well, Judge, thank you it. very much for the invitation and the county commissioners. Um, my name is Andy Taubman. Uh, I have a degree in economics from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and I was a Wall Street banker for eight years in New York City living in that hot house and now understanding why there's so much problems there. But I left that. I left that for a better life in Texas because, let's face it, this is where you want to be in the good times and the bad. There was a lot of good things that were said this morning, and I must say I agree with some of the things and I disagree with some of the things, but from each of those speakers I think there were valuable things to be learned. I would like you all to understand my comments in the context of both what happens if we keep the economy closed, but also in light of decision making in the time of uncertainty. Those are two aspects that I think are very important and very timely to discuss. Let me just say and start out by saying, I believe this virus is a killer. I believe that it is something different than the flu. So uh, a response uh, to that challenge is something that's very important. That would also lead me to say, I think that the activities of government to date have been absolutely masterful. The stay-at-home order was very well crafted. It was, it was, you could read in there the precision of what was trying to get accomplished, not too much, not too little, and I think it was very well done. And people that know me know I wouldn't say nice things if I didn't believe them. I know that. Right? Okay. So what the government was able to accomplish that is nothing short of miraculous was to get the people in society to change their behavior. That's the hardest thing that can be done across a society and I think that government has largely accomplished that. People understand that social distancing is important and it's their responsibility and I think by and large it has been something that has been very successful. So congratulations to that. But I'm here to tell you today that as the situations change, I think policy must change along with that. In my mind, we're at the most dangerous point in the viral challenge because we're facing a fork in the road. I call that fork in the road the battle of the hypotheticals because we don't know what the future holds but yet we do have good data at to what, where we've recently been and where we are. So the battle of the hypotheticals on one side will be the medical community who will tell you that it is their medical opinion to save every life medically. I respect them for that and I know that's their charge and I know that everything they're doing is sincere. On the other side of the battle of the hypotheticals, are going to be the economists of which I would like to consider myself part of that group. And I am here to tell you that your decision, which is very difficult and very profound, is that if we open up the economy, there will be COVID deaths. There is no doubt about that. But if we keep the economy closed, there will be deaths associated with the closure of the economy. So. You and your decisions are facing death on either front, and it, it's just something that's going to have to get weighed and understood, and then the decision's made because there is only one path forward. Now, for a moment, I'd like to discuss the models that are being put forth by the medical community. I believe that the models they put forth represent the best science that is available to them and understanding. Now, I don't blame the modelers, I blame the people who believe the models. When we get to our 10th pandemic, the models will be perfect. But in our first pandemic, nobody knows 
how to really understand what the future holds. And to put one's faith solely in models is, I think, a misplaced faith. Is it a data point that one should consider? Yes. But I will tell you, while they may have some understanding of what the model looks like in an open society or a closed society, what they do not have an understanding of, because it hasn't happened yet, is what does a reopening of the economy look like in a responsible manner, subject to guidelines and limitations of social distancing and other medical advice? So what's going to be discussed in the media, where there's not a lot of deep thinking, is that should we open or should we close the economy? I think that's a false choice. I think that the choice in front of us that meets both the medical needs and the business needs is a responsible opening of the economy subject to guidelines. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but, but I just want to hit the punchline first so I'm not misunderstood when I, when I say we should reopen the economy, that it just means going back to where we were. Now, small business represents about 45% of the gross domestic product and about 50% of the private workforce. And there have been some recent data released of the Coastal Bend in particular that says, as of their recent surveys, 35% of the business operating capacity was closed down and about 40% of the workforce is now unpaid and laid off. So what we're talking about is an enormous impairment of the business community and not something that's small. So let me talk through specifically the hypothetical situation I'm putting on the table that will become very real very quickly. If a substantial number of the small businesses declare bankruptcy and close, the first casualties will be of the business ownership. As you can imagine, small business is largely funded by the blood, sweat, and tears and money of the business owners, many of whom have mortgaged their house and spent their life, entire life savings to put in their business. When those businesses fail, and they will, you will have an entire class of people who are now facing personal financial ruin potentially homelessness, and everything that comes along with that. Will there be death and destruction associated with the closures of that business? Absolutely. That death and destruction will visit us in several forms. There will be suicides, there will be increased drug use, there will be family violence, and there'll be all other types of, of problems that lead ultimately to misery and death. So the small business closure in itself is enough of a catastrophe that makes me come before you and say we must do something different. But then let's talk about the consequences of that. Each of those small businesses have a series of vendors and lenders and landlords. As those small businesses close, entire categories of vendors will be wiped out. For example, if a substantial number of the restaurant community close, everybody that supplies wholesale foods to those vendors will be wiped out as well because there's receivables involved in that business. And when those businesses close, those receivables will vest as a loss in those bigger businesses, and that's the cascading events. As when businesses close, landlords don't get paid. Landlords still have mortgages that, that, lend, that are associated with banks. You have bank lending directly to those small businesses, and those people will close. So what you will see from the closure of the small business is a cascade into increasingly larger businesses in the industry, and then ultimately into things like the banking sector. Banks typically hold about 10% capital against all of their loans. So if 10% of their loans go bad, you're going to have problems. As a derivative of all those business closures, you're going to have substantial structural permanent unemployment. When businesses reopen, and let's all pray that they do someday, you're going to have thousands and thousands of people who are permanently out of the workforce. Right now, the estimates are maybe 20 to 30 percent unemployment as this thing gets worse. Some substantial fraction of that will be lost forever. Some of the media seems to indicate that 80 percent of the businesses 
uh, in the restaurant community are thinking about not reopening. So it's a really substantial fraction of, of whoever's out there. That, that debt cycle will cause um, lending seizure because the banks in their own struggle not to lend to people out of work or businesses that are struggling or for limitations on their own capital will mean that the access to credit will unfold very soon. And when the access to credit stops, businesses will be able, unable to reopen because of the lack of ability to funding. But let's face it, most of our assets that we own personally are indirectly supported by credit. The value of your housing is supported by credit. The ability for people to buy and sell cars is supported by credit. Capital items are supported by credit. So as that cycle ceases because of this cascading effect, you're going to see everybody become relatively poor. Another consequence of business closures, and let's just continue with restaurants as an example, is that you're going to see chain of events in their suppliers that lead to bankruptcies and problems, even as far down as the farm community. How do things like that happen? There's a very different structural supply chain that gives you your steak in HEB or your hamburger in HEB than there is to the restaurants. When you butcher a cow, the lower value cuts, primarily hamburger, go to HEB. The higher value cuts typically go to restaurants. The value of that cow is the sum of the value of the hamburger and the steaks. If the restaurants aren't buying high dollar steaks, then the value of the cow goes down. The margins are thin enough in that industry that when the value of the cow goes down, it's no longer valuable to produce beef and you're seeing herds and various things slaughtered because there's rigidity in those systems. There's not the capacity in the packing. There's not the capacity in the packaging to have everything shift over one way or another very quickly. And because the consumer behavior is very different, you will see those entire supply chains get wiped out. It's been reported in the press that that's occurred in beef, pork, potatoes, and milk, but I'm sure it's occurring in all the other sectors as well. There will be the same disruptions of the supply chains in manufacturing. So when it comes time to manufacture something sophisticated like a car, 99% of the car parts will show up, but you know what? 1% of the parts won't show up, and you can't build 99% of a car and put it on the road. So if this blooms into a catastrophic chain reaction among the businesses, you will see forever lost, forever being the defined timeline of you know, 10, 20 years, these chains of businesses that are necessary for the functioning of the economy. My point is, it's not possible to put the economic life of America on hold for an extended period of time and then just to reopen it and start up where we were. That cannot happen. Now, we're lucky enough to have the largesse of the federal government and other sources lend money to small business to give them a period of time to allow for the closure and then the slow reopening will occur. But let's face it, the lending of money is not a substitute for revenue. And when that runs out, we are all toast. Now, when does that run out? I don't know. The SBA PPP loans are sort of an eight-week fused effort. So here we are a couple of months in, and people will stretch it and everything else. But we're probably talking about the middle of May when all of these decisions come home to roost. And I will tell you, if businesses get far enough behind where their debts are mounting, even the ones that aren't covered by government loans, then they just won't reopen. It'll be cheaper to have everybody be bankrupt and then sort it out on the back end. So let's talk about some of the other uh, downstream effects here. Government finances will be harmed to an irreparable degree. I see that the city came out and said that there'll be a $21 million shortfall. I'm sure the county is experiencing that. 
while I think that that analysis was in part correct, I know that it does not incorporate, for example, the revaluations of property taxes, which everybody's going to claim the value of their businesses have been impaired when it hits in January. So while I think that number is the tip of the iceberg, I think that you're going to see substantial hits to governmental budgets. And I'm sure that you all think government is important. I think government's important. But if the money's there not to fund it, and you guys can't print money like the feds can, there's going to be severe consequences. Now, the value of all this business destruction will also impact the stock market and people's financial assets and their pensions. So right now, pensioners are relatively isolated from the chaos of the day-to-day. -day. But if this continues through a cascading failure, people's pensions and their benefits will be uh, severely devastated. And frankly, that also is a nexus with government funding because your, your pension funds have been promised a certain rate of return in terms of the discounts for what people are expecting. But when those get revalued to the current asset values, you're going to find substantial shortfalls in your pensions. The next thing I'd like to address is the impact of the extended closure on the court system. Right now, there's nothing being adjudicated anywhere. And as the time goes by and these business failures escalate and multiply, you're going to see enormous claims for damages come before the court system on the civil side. You're going to see debt claims. You're going to see landlord-tenant claims. You're going to see performance issues and contracts. And while it would be a Herculean effort just to unwind the backlog of a normal court closing for months at a time, I think that the, the wave of demands on the court system whenever this thing reopens is, is going to be something that we can't even conceive of. And I know that you're an attorney judge, and so that's something that, that's considerable. Right. I just I don't want to stop your flow of, of thought, but I just want you to know that, and the public that while I agree that we do not have the courts operational like we normally do, we have a suspension of both civil and criminal trials, it is important for the public to know that we are operating all of our courts, all district courts and all county court at law courts and even the appellate courts as in, in a different way, right? So you can still file your, your suits, uh, prosecutions are still going forward, and we're doing everything remotely. It has taken a Her Herculean effort to get remote, but we've done it. Um, but you're right about the, um, the civil and the criminal trials and, of course, the suspension of, of jury impanelment. So all of those things are, are being discussed, but we did kind of set some parameters from the Supreme Court, and, and we're getting close to those being over. And then I have a feeling that in this new normal, we will have to recreate. That's part of that morning part of the workshop where I said to Timothy as our safety officer, hey, you're going to have to work with the judges to figure out how we're going to impanel juries from now on. Sure, um, but just the caseloads associated with right. bankruptcy are going to overwhelm the, the amount of the court. And, and we have suspended truancies and, um, and evictions as well from the statewide level. So all that you say is, is certainly, um, it, 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 it does not fall on deaf ears. I appreciate it, that. It does not fall on deaf ears, all of it. What I am wondering is, if because I've heard you on, on radio, you do have some suggestions, however, that you'd like to suggest that maybe we pivot to. And I'm going to let you finish. I just want you to know that, that I want to make sure that, that you also get to, you know, once we accept that our fate is maybe not sealed, but certainly in motion, there's also hopefully the opportunity to address many of the things that, that, you, that, you, that we fear if we act. Sure, and, 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 and realize that, that I, I, I am not suggesting that by saying all these things that, that everybody in this room isn't sensitive to what I'm saying. There's a hard choice, and all of this list of horribles have not vested yet. They will only vest if we continue with this closure on an extended basis. So this is not necessarily this is what will happen, but this is what will happen if we don't make a decision. And are you, um, 
encouraged at all by the governor's um, assemblage of the advisory council that's really made up of a who's who of entrepreneurs at the highest level in all different industries that, yes, that would assist him in that new I'm, opening? I'm encouraged by a lot of things. <clears throat> I'm encouraged by this discussion that we're having today. I'm dis encouraged by things that politicians tell me. What I'm discouraged by is the lack of action on several fronts. And I'll, ge I'll get into those in just a Fair minute. Enough. So the largest failure that we're collectively going to face if this business cascade of events occurs is a loss of social cohesion. What do I mean by that? I mean that people are going to come out and start actively or passively disobeying government. That will come from people who feel that the political bounds have been overstepped. It will come from the substantial number of business owners or unemployed who now feel that they've lost everything and they don't have much else to lose. But frankly, it'll also come from people who have no source of salvation through the government largesse. There's a large number of people, whether they be the immigrant community or otherwise, that sort of seems to be outside of the safety net that's been put forth. And their lives have been affected to a degree maybe even more than some of the people that have received the government assistance. My point is, there's going to be a lot of people who are very unhappy with the future of this unemployment and rightly or wrongly, they're going to lay the blame at the feet of government. And that social cohesion is a very part of what makes us a functional society that if it gets to that point, it'll be very hard to go back to. Federal government lending and other sources of lending, I know that the city, for example, is lending, are very limited resources. The federal government cannot support the replacement of revenue for an indefinite period of time. So let's use this time to regroup, to plan, and do everything else we need to do, but ultimately that's not the source of salvation. Now let me just close with another hypothetical and then I'll get to some recommendations. The hypothetical I'd like to put forth is what we have to do to protect grandma. Because let's face it, not everybody bears the infection of COVID in the same manner. And grandma will be disproportionately affected. Now, how is grandma going to get it in her home in a multi-generational family under the roof? Well, was it her granddaughter who was sneaking out to be with her friends, but is afraid to admit that to anybody, but brings the virus into their home? Was it grandma's son who works in the hospital with the doctors that were here today and became inadvertently infected because a substantial fraction of the, of the health workforce gets infected? Is it the daughter-in-law who was one of the ones who was unlucky to touch the door to the restroom right after somebody was infected and then inadvertently touched her face? These are all ways that grandma is going to get infected. So one of the things, I, the reason I'm putting that forth is to say, if we think grandma is the one that's going to die, are we really putting forth the resources in the right place to keep grandma safe? And there's issues of money that will help that, and there's also issues of policy. But people are going to die that way, and they're also going to die if they're too scared to go see the doctor because they have heart pains, but yet they think that, that the doctor's offices are closed or that they're going to get infected. So let me get to what I think the, propo the proper governmental action is. I think it's important for government to impanel a force of industry experts, health advisors, and governmental oversight locally, if necessary, in order to understand and promulgate a set of guidelines that represent the best practices for a particular industry. For example, the Texas Restaurant Association has put forth a set of guidelines. Now, do I agree with their guidelines? No, in certain ways I don't think they go far enough. Let me just give you an example. I think there's a role for the health department to play in the restaurants. And it could be something as simple as having a 10-minute video that all the employees have to watch so each and every employee understands the proper method to wash their hands and sanitize things and the importance of that. 
And let's face it, the, the health department has a relationship with each and every employee through the, the safe handling of the food certificates and everything else. So that's an example. But here's the number one thing that's critically important that's missing from the government right now that you have the power to grant, and that is hope. Right now, if you're a small business person and you're sitting at home, there is the perspective that this closure is going to go on forever. And forever sure seems like a long time. What I think all levels of government have been remiss at is to say, we have a plan for reopening, it's something we want to do, and to communicate with those businesses so that there's the beginning of the prospect that this reopening is going to occur. It was mentioned in the city council meeting yesterday that, for example, the health department hasn't communicated with the restaurants. I think that's a mistake. Because I think once hope is lost, that's what starts the cascade in motion. And that is something that I think can be rectified at no cost, but will have a large effect. Second thing I, I think should happen is that government should change its warnings to specifically focus on guidelines to the vulnerable population. There's going to have to be a change in their behavior because what they will do to stay safe is different than what healthier people might do, and I think that's pretty important. Let me address the, the grandma living under a multi-generational roof situation. Most of the deaths, or many of the deaths, have occurred in situations like nursing homes. So if nursing homes are the venue for the death, then let's see the nursing homes get the response that they need from the various levels of government, such that that is where we fight the fight. Another suggestion is, if grandma is capable of living independently, and we have all these empty hotel rooms, of which I'm a hotel owner and I will tell you they are empty, let's figure out some sort of a FEMA type grant situation like we had during the hurricane that allows grandma to get into a hotel situation and live independently because let's face it, grandma's primary mode of infection is going to be through people in her own home where social distancing can occur. Next, I think it's up to the politicians to ratchet down the fear in society. All of this discussion of the death of corona and the death of corona and the death of corona really looks beyond the current situation where there are fewer infections and there are recoveries of people who have been infected. I think by stoking the fear in society, you're going to see bad outcomes. The next thing I would like to see is for government to help educate the media and the population as to the catastrophic consequences of cascading business failure. This is for your own good, because at some point, you're going to have to reopen the economy one way or another. And if everybody is sitting in their houses thinking, oh my god, if I go outside, I'm going to die of COVID, and I don't understand why Judge Canales made the decision to reopen the economy, she's a meanie, then you're going to suffer the consequences, even if that's the right decision. So I think starting the discussion of what the list of horribles are if we stay shut is an important part of getting the buy-in of the community. And let's face it, even if we throw open the doors tomorrow and reopen business, if people aren't comfortable going out and being part of the economy, then the economy is not going to reignite either. So the combination of them understanding that, that the irrational fear of maybe just being outside and all the COVID death and the not understanding why oh, reopening business is important or things that you can do that will, that will change the direction of this thing apart from any other decision that must be made. Now let's talk about what I think is something that is truly, I reserve the word evil for other things, but I can't think of another word for the moment. In various venues in the city, there's an overreach of government that is costing lives. 
fishing on the beach is an example, okay? In certain parts of the county, fishing on the beach is prohibited. If you're trying to have people live within the, the laws and you want to make laws that are going to get respected and the parts of the laws that are really important like social distancing where there is a medical consequence associated with that, having other sets of laws that are both uneven across the county and do not tie to a health recommendation I think are absolutely destructive. But you do know that Noises County has always allowed fishing <clears throat> my order, I was actually, I predated the governor, and I'm pretty proud of that. That's because I'm a fishing, I come from a fishing family. Judge Canales, when I said at the opening of this that I respected your stay-at-home order as being I very, very finely crafted, I am here to tell you that I don't think the problem is with your okay. order. I think the problem is with orders that are downstream of yours that, that are problematic. Yeah. Let me give you another one that I think costs lives, okay? There is a helter-skelter, stay-in-shelter rule against the short-term vacation rentals. Is that medically necessitated? I don't know. I can understand why some people have put that in place. But let me tell you, I know of several examples of people who have come into that community to say, let me stay in your self-contained, isolated, remote, short-term vacation because there are people in my household who are infected with COVID and I'm trying to get away from that. And, and, that's, my, and that's my second home. Well, I, I, I don't even care if it's my yeah, second no, home, but, I mean, but that's even a higher. I, I wasn't even going to go there because that's a property rights issue. That's what I was getting to. Yes. No, there is a property rights issue associated with that. I'm talking about the fact that if it has been widely said here that the mode of transmission is going to be between people under a single roof and you have something in place that is trying to keep people under single roofs. That's an example of a political dictate that has medical consequences that are contraindicated from every piece of the discussion that we've heard today. So last but not least, my plea is that everybody get on the same page with between the governments because it seems very chaotic between what the governor's doing and the judges are doing and what the mayors are doing. I know that our events are unfolding in real time, and it's very difficult to do that, but that's just the, the, the situation. Now, let me address testing, if I may, for just a moment, because there's a certain segment who say, we must wait until there's more testing in order to make a decision. How can you make a decision without knowing more testing? Let me just address that. I think that this catastrophic unwind starts in May. We all know judge that you have done absolutely everything in your power to get as much testing done as possible and I believe that and I believe people have bent over backwards to help you not only in the capacity of you being the county judge but because you're Barbara Canales and you have a hold on the facts and you have contacts and you have abilities that are far beyond just the average person in that seat. So I know that when you say you've done everything, that, that it represents more than everything. But let's face it, if it is believed that, sufficient, that testing has been insufficient, that's just our reality. And if it doesn't show up in time before all these cascading failures happen, then what good was it? The known damage associated with the cascading failures can be orders of magnitude greater than whatever information we get back from the testing. So just saying we're arbitrarily going to wait for something isn't avoiding the known death and destruction that I know is going to happen on the other side. That's not a failure of you or government in general. It's just we don't have time to wait for something that may or may not show up. Now, here's a slightly different take that I think is equally important. I do believe that the testing for the active viruses, at least we're keeping up with that. There's nobody who's, not, who's seeking that test that's not getting done, 
right? So that's fine. The next discussion of testing is going to be the demand for antibody testing in the community, okay? In general, there are three states of reality that can come back from that testing. There is reason to believe, uh, there, there, the, the first possibility is that the testing comes back very high and that a substantial fraction of the population has already had the COVID virus. In that case, there's an element of herd immunity that's out there. There's the fact that everybody's already had it. There's the fact that there's not more people to necessarily be infected. So if it comes back very high, I would say that the indication is let's open up this economy because let's face it, most of the people who've had it, the benefits of social distancing diminish if everybody's had it. Let's do this, right? That's one possible scenario. Let's say that it comes back intermediate that some fraction of the community in the middle has had antibodies. And I think that there's really, that this is the most likely case. Um, one of the doctors mentioned that there's a study out of the, from the CDC out of a Boston homeless shelter that showed about 30, 40% of the people in the homeless shelter had the disease but were asymptomatic. I think that's a data point. I think another data point is, uh, I've seen studies coming from the aircraft carriers that have been infected. And my understanding is 60% of the people there who were infected did not show any symptoms of the disease. So let's, let me just stipulate that one of the things that we've learned medically that people would agree on is that there's a large fraction of people in society walking around who have the disease but are showing no other symptoms such that we cannot use a symptomatic approach. I would also argue that that makes contact tracing of the spread of the disease almost impossible because there's just too many people once it reaches community spread that are showing no symptoms that you'll never be able to track it. If that is indeed the case, then I think that we can get some comfort that the mortality rate from the disease is much lower than we expected that we should protect grandma to the maximum extent possible, but we should reopen the economy because clearly there's a substantial fraction who are out there who have it and have not been affected. It also comes into the play, what was the purpose of flattening the curve? The purpose of flattening the curve was not to overwhelm the hospital system, but the initial rationale given for flattening the curve was that the ultimate number of exposures was gonna be about the same. So if we're most of the way down that pathway and we can't stop it because of this community spread from people who are asymptomatic, I would argue that opening the economy with giving people the strong instructions to protect themselves is how you maximize value. Now last but not least, let's take the example where there's very low indication of community spread. This would also apply to the situation as was reported in the South China Morning Post of high viral mutation. My point there is if there's low spread in the community, then what are we going to wait for that is going to rescue us and tell us to open the economy? Is it gonna be a vaccine I'm assuming? And a vaccine is 12 to 18 months away. And I will tell you, while there's some uncertainty as to when we hit this catastrophic cascading event, it is definitely happening within the next 12 months. So even if there's low community uh, incidence of this disease, you've got to reopen if you believe that the horribles associated with cascading events are, are real. So my point is, we can do a lot of testing. Testing is extraordinarily valuable. Testing will give the medical community the ability to fine tune treatments. It will give them an understanding of what conditions in society lead to the 5% that wind up in ICU or whatever that number is. Testing is vitally important. But from my perspective, there's no testing result that is definitive that says, okay, now we've reached this milestone, we've got to do it because this disease is so insidious and has so many other ways around it, whether it's mutations or the super spreaders or otherwise, 
Just having that information is not sufficient. And in fact, the World Health Organization has said, there's no, this is a quote, there's no evidence to support the belief that people who have recovered from coronavirus will not catch it again. If that's true, I don't know if it is, but that's what the, CD, that's what the World Health Organization has said, then frankly, testing has much less value because if we're going to be living with coronavirus in our world, we've got to get on past it before the economy craters. So now let me just conclude. We've had a death in the community that's COVID related, okay? The other day there was a suicide in Port Aransas and maybe others. So if we're scoring this at home, it's one to one. COVID death, suicide death. What I'm describing to you in terms of the death pathways, whether they're suicide or drug or family violence are very real. So your choice is very difficult. Now, let me give you another thing that I support. I know that there's been talk, it may already have been voted on, to support the reopening of the county hospital as a COVID facility, right? Yes, sir. I'm fine with that. If the goal post is not to overwhelm the community medical facilities and we're worried about a second wave or recurrence, which I personally don't believe will happen, but I think is a realistic possibility, then making the choices now to expand our medical capacity actually gives us more of a reason to reopen the economy because it increases the margin of safety that we won't overwhelm the medical facilities, which is really, frankly, the wet mm -hmm. red line that I think is out there. That was definitely the <clears throat> one of the justifications. Okay. So let me just conclude by saying, I want to say first and foremost, thank you to the first responders and hospital staff because they are really the people on the front lines more than anybody else. And they're heroes because they're rushing into danger every day to do what they love and their jobs and to save lives. I would also like to thank the HEB cashiers and the baggers because here are people in society that are standing forth with risk to service the community and keep all everybody safe and, and fed, which are, which are fundamentally important. So now here's the challenge that I would like to issue to the rest of the community. People take risks every day when they go to work. They drive to work and driving is very dangerous and sometimes people die in the car on the way to work, but they do it because work is in such an important aspect of what a person is and what society is. So along with that risk, we need to add another risk in place. And that is that they get back into business, take the risk of, of getting COVID, but just like they took the risk to drive to work, there's risks that we have in society and because we need people at work for the economy and for their own health. And so it's not a promise given by government that we're all safe all the time. There is going to be an increased level of risk. There's going to be death from COVID, but I, it's my opinion that if the economy stays closed past the middle of May, there's going to be this cascading death that, that really changes who America is. Anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I know Commissioner Vaughn has a question and, okay, I'm gonna yield. Go ahead. Okay. First, I wanna thank you for coming. Um, you're the perfect one to come and have a different thought out of the box. And um, you're very intelligent and I know that. Um, some of you may not know this, but I, I've met him when he was on, when I was on council and he served on the street committee. I think you were chairman, weren't you, Andy? That's correct. And you know how terrible our streets were, Judge, back then and still are, but it's improving. But he's part of the reason that we have a different process now. So thank you, Andy, for that. Um, I, so many things that you're saying are happening right now already. I mean, I can just talk about because the oil industry, they're already closing businesses. You should see my yard. I've got so much equipment in there from closing three offices, and that's not the end of it. You've got businesses that are going to be filing, are and are going to be filing bankruptcy already. The oil, in, oil industry was given a double whammy. The oil price and then the COVID virus. So what you say, I agree. I think it's just, it's a domino effect. Well, the, 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 the collapse of the oil industry is multifaceted, but the, probably the largest 
element of it is the lack of aggregate demand of the products exactly. of the oil and its energy intensiveness. If we just had people drive around the block 10 times and then sit back in their driveway, we would save the oil industry, right? Now, that's not realistic, but my point is getting back to business saves the oil economy, and if we think that that's important, then that's part of the consideration as well. And I think, Judge, you suggested this while ago you were talking about it as a task force for reopening business is what I heard. Yes. And that is what mm -hmm. you're suggesting as well, isn't it, Andy, to get moving on it? Y yes. I, uh, let's, let's take the restaurant situation as an example, right? We're not talking about things that are rocket science, right? Test your employees to make sure they don't show up sick. Uh, clean the tables use single-use items in terms of uh, plates and cups and uh, menus, right? And there's a list. That list is no more than 10 items, and, and right? Andy, let, me, let me just tell you, uh, let me jump in if I can. I don't mean to interrupt, but sure. Judge Canales is kind of a, ahead of you on that, too. She, she has already asked me to um, talk to Kathy Snapka, who's the head of the Restaurant Association, and kind of put together some suggestions for her to look at in regards to that. So she's, you know, she's kind of on that as well, and, and I think it's important to, to note that those are the kind of things that she's been looking at. We've, we've been looking at That's exactly why we're having this discussion, and I couldn't agree with Commissioner Vaughn Moore that you – you made a great presentation. I really appreciate you taking the time and just sending us that information because a lot of times people send us information and don't think we read it or act on it. But as you can tell by, you know, you only sent us your information last week and we got you here and to make this presentation because we felt it was so compelling. So, um, but those are some of the things that, that are really, that are happening on a regular basis. And I wanted to make and, sure. And I appreciate that. that. I, I think you've got to set up, it's, there's 10 industries maybe, you know, when you consolidate the classes of white collar office and low traffic retail and some of these others, you've reached, you know, 90% of it. What's missing here though, is come up with the five steps for each industry, it's not particularly hard, and then communicate with business. Yep. It's the communication mm -hmm. with business step which leads to the absence of hope. You're, you're right, and just to piggyback on what you said, Commissioner, it's just because we're trying to keep people out, but she's been here. Right. She may have had to leave already, but Ms. Snapka was here right. in the hallway. And Alyssa got with her to get her contact. Okay, good. Her so she's good. been here, but okay, I, yes, in the vein of communication, we recognized early on from the stay-at-home orders. To be honest with you, I recognized it hours after we issued them, maybe like the first 30 minutes when Laura and her team, this is the county attorney, and uh, the truth is is that when I say here's what I want, it actually has to be crafted, and for the first time publicly I get to say the reason it was done so well, in my opinion, is because of Laura Jimenez and her team, and I'll give a little credit to Miles, he's a good guy, Miles Risley over at the city. I'm just joking. Uh, equal credit, equal credit. But but Miles and Laura together, again, this is unprecedented, right? We don't have to collaborate with the city. That's not in my mandate. It's not in the rule book. It's not in the playbook. And in many occasions in hurricanes, it didn't even happen. But we did it during this time. And as a result, we must have fielded, I don't even know how many thousands of calls. And so those calls indicate there are problems. That's what a call is. Now, some of the calls we were able to say, you're okay, and that made them happy. But the overwhelming majority of the calls were, this isn't going to work for us. And so we tried our best to, on a case-by-case -case basis, honestly, interpret the rule of law in the most liberal way possible so that we could get people who, who, who could find a nexus to essential business connected. But it was in the communication of the hotline, Andy, that really made that possible. So what we've done is we've set up a parallel hotline. But oh, so much of this is like logistics, right? As they say, I mean, that supply chain, it's very real. And so is logistics. But we are, we are really ready now, in my opinion. I just need this task force to kind of get going in the different industries. But we actually have a whole office dedicated to it with a real person. And I see him kind of in the... Back of my, you know, he's also in the hallway, and he's dedicated to help bring these business leaders together along with a commissioner and, let's say, a head of a restaurant. So it's not just going to be good enough to get Ms. Snapka, who represents Texas Restaurant. It's going to be important that Commissioner Chesney, if, he's, if I say, Commissioner Chesney, will you please lead restaurants, 
then he actually has to go beyond Kathy Snapka. He's got to get, because honestly, it's not the same for Water Street. I'm just picking on someone I know really well, that it would be for a taqueria, let's say, on the west side or the south side or a barbecue place or even a food truck. Okay, so I think that what's going to be incumbent is to do this now. And we're not only agreeing with you, at least I'm agreeing, um, I'm agreeing, but I think that it's imperative that you know that we've at least done a lot of preliminary to try to get us there. And I'm always looking to see what best practices are. And Sylvester Turner, who has a lot more uh, breadth of resources than we do here, but doesn't matter. We might be small, but we're very mighty. Um, he put in a CEO uh, who was a former Shell CEO in charge of his whole task force. I've already started to make calls to, to men and women in banking and in business of all sizes to say, would you serve as an advisory council? You know, the governor can have his advisory council, but as you said or somebody said earlier, look, what's good for up here doesn't necessarily translate what's perfect for here. And so I think that we need to um, – we need to really pivot on that, and I want to address short-term rentals. I did not include short-term rentals in the county. I did so for a reason, but I do want to say to the public, because I think you would be okay with this, me explaining why Mayor McComb did put that in along with some other mayors, and that was that we were in that, that honey hole, if you will, of La Semana Santa, the Holy Week, and we were in that 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 very intriguing area that is spring break and Holy Week, and we knew we were going to get pounded with lots of visitors. And, in fact, that was just a huge dilemma for our community, and they were trying to stay off, if you will, outside travel. However, we've already begun, I've already begun those types of discussions with our senators and to say, look, we would like – you also to recognize that we're not just an energy community, we're a tourism community. And that also has a huge economic impact. That sales tax you're talking about is that hot tax, you know, um, and that hotel occupancy tax along with the sales tax is going to be a, a really big ding for the city. I do want the public to know because I do want you, I take what you say to heart about hope. And so I want to give a little hope here. Number one, we've already been given guidance by the Attorney General of Texas that the property values will stay from January 1. So we receive 50% of our revenue here in the county from ad valorem. But the other, which is big, but it's not 90, right? The other 50% might be off a bit from fees and fines because they make up like 10%. But overall, I predict that the counties biggest concern has to do with the county's concern for indigent health care and our court system and associated behavioral health concerns and all our unfunded mandates that are already on our backs. Those might be exacerbated and that could be a tremendous burden on social services and veteran services. I'm super mindful of that. That's why the task force is really important. When the CARES Act, when we knew the first supplemental bill was coming down, I created a project, and I want to emphasize this. It's just a project. It doesn't mean it's going to, like, have a standalone forever and ever, but it's called Code Blue. It's just a project, and it's the way that we believe that we could have a vehicle that already existed in our budget to say, you, Nueces County Development Commission, you have to get on this, like, now. Get your team, get your phone centers, get your hard lines, get your Internet, compile all the data, and you're going to be a navigator. You're going to be a almost like a patient navigator. Someone's going to call you, and you're going to not just send them to a website. You're going to pick up that phone and get them to a volunteer who has been trained to help them truly navigate these waters. And it's going to take time and manpower, but that's how you save people one at a time. And in addition, we're going to help the overall business community. And we just talked about restaurants, but I bet Commissioner Vaughn would be happy to take an industry. I bet Commissioner Modest would be happy to take an industry. I don't even have to really look to the left, or to the right, or to the front. I know them. They'll do it. They just need to find the one that they want to do because I think you've nailed it. Um, and you might even write me an email because I certainly would appreciate it. I think you have in your mind what the top ten are already. I'd like to know to make sure they match up with what we're seeing, but like – you know, hoteliers, restaurant, um, personal services like grooming, 
okay? But I bet you have them in your mind, inner faith. Let's, let's find those, and we're going to need lots of time to, as I say, unpack this. But if you're willing to be a resource for us, it would be a gift to our community for you to do so. Uh, I just want you to know that you're right. We have a ton of work to do, and hope is I'm in the business of hope. Um, in fact, you know, this is a little silly, but it's really not. I'm, I choose what mask I bring to work every day. Like a girl who chooses her favorite, you know, accessory. And mine today is appropriate because it says faith, hope, and love. So I just want you to know I'm a believer. And I mean that on multiple levels. And I've tried my very best to the tune of exhaustion to convey hope to the people of Noises County. But I will do more. And I just want to promise to you as a citizen and to everybody that's listening that I believe in hope and hope is coming. But I also want you to know that you're seeing a trend in Texas to do this responsibly. And I think you advocate that. And I appreciate it. And we will do everything in our power. Retail to go doesn't seem like much, but it's that first piece of hope. And elective surgeries being opened is another sign of hope. We did those orders, Laura, two days ago. They went into effect yesterday at midnight. I can't even remember. The days are gone, but they're in, they're in place. And um, there are so many people here. And Johnny Hip is here. He's the executive director of the hospital district. He knows how I feel about behavioral health. I mean, I am, I'm so on it. There's a, Johnny's going to hear me make this request in email, so you might as well hear it now. We had already vetted a, a system called Cloud Nine, and that's a behavioral health telesystem that we need in our police vehicles and our law enforcement. And it's amazing and wonderful. It needs more vetting to figure out how we would interact, but. We're, I'm pledging to you that this council here of commissioners will, um, will get on it. And, we're, and as I say, it's not like we're not on it, but we need to be on it more. And I'm sensitive to it. So I just want to thank you. It was a tremendous um, amount of, of information and, and thought-provoking um, you know, discussion. And I think that you'll see that it won't be the last. In fact, it'll be the first of many. And I'll, I'm going to take some of what you said and incorporate it in the town hall on, in the few weeks. But I think the first order of business for us is maybe you should pick or not an industry that you think, hey, I think I can really lend my time and talent to, and then either choose a commissioner or they'll choose you. But we need to start that those protocols. And I'll speak with the health department about um, – recognizing um, the, the nexus that you bring up between restaurants and them, but I don't want to lie to you. We may have to take that burden from them simply because they're overwhelmed. And as a matter of fact, in, in the STD category, they've already parceled all, the, all that work to another clinic. So where we can divide and conquer, we will. Is that fair? Is that a good way to transition, Brent, from some of the things that you're already working on on restaurants? I, Judge, I think it's I think it's a great start. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't know where it heads or where it leads to, but I think I think we're in the right path. I mean, we have to start sending the message that we are very much wanting to reopen this community in a safe and secure way. Um, and I think these are great first steps in doing that for sure. And I think I, you know, I, I don't like long meetings. This is this is the best long meeting I've ever been at, and I'm, we're not even anywhere near done because this information has been really good. You know, I never know how many people watch this stuff and, and and really see it but it's been good for me I think the other commissioners probably too I mean is it a long time to sit and listen absolutely but this is stuff that is going to affect our lives forever I don't think this goes away and we're going to have a new normal so I think these are steps that we are well you'll down. recall after 9-11 that before 9-11 we never operated in airports the way we operate today it changed our social norm, it changed our behavior, and it changed our protocols. And I predict after COVID-19, we also won't look at the world in the same way. And it will change our norm, our behavior, and our protocols. And I just want the citizens to know, as I want my commissioners to know, that I am an open-minded person. Um, you know, we all, we all come in with our picadillas, right? We all come in with our personal biases and our experiences. And I'm human, so I'm no different. 
But what I do know is when I take my deep breath and I do every hour on the hour, that I'm able to receive the information that you've given to me. I'm able to process it in a way, honestly, I know this sounds weird, but I'm thinking more clearly than I've ever thought before. And I'm also more tired than I've ever been before. And so it has, there's no correlation with my ability to bring in information and how hard we're working, we're working as a team. So it's very appreciated. And, and we'll just, if it's all right, I know you have some written comments. If you wouldn't mind giving them to me, I listen to every word, but I sometimes would appreciate the right to go back over it. My office is right next door. They'll do a quick copy for you. And, uh, and maybe, and then I'll disseminate it through Tyner to the other commissioners. Yeah, let me send you that by email, if I may. It, it's even better. Okay. I, I think your comments were pretty much the email you already sent us, though. Yeah. Very close. Pretty, very yeah. close. Point, point by point, so. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, thank you very much for the opportunity, Judge. Time is of the essence. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andy. Okay, speaking of time is of the essence, I'd like to know in the crowd, not from my EOC team, but... Um, Pastor, would you like to, are you here just as an observer? Would you mind coming next? Okay. Absolutely, sir. Thank you. I just think it's, I want to try to be sensitive of people's thought times. Johnny, you're allowed to take a five-minute stretch, like a seventh-inning stretch. There you go. Fair enough, sir. Long way from over, buddy. Well, I'll try to be uh, brief. I, I have appreciated everyone that has spoken, and especially Andy. Um, appreciate everything that, that he has said. And I, I personally feel that uh, his warning uh, really needs to be taken. I know we are taking it seriously, but I just want to echo. I feel the importance of that. My name is Mike Failauer. I'm the pastor of New Life Church here in Corpus Christi. And... Um, uh, I first want to acknowledge a couple of other pastors that are here, Pastor Glenn Holland with the Net Fellowship Church and Pastor David Bendette, Rock City Church, and as I said, I pastor New Life Church. Now, I represent an active membership of about 4,000 plus on a, on a, well, before all of this, on a, on a weekend basis. And, um, and what I, I feel was so uh, important uh, in regards to what Andy shared with us regarding uh, this, these red flags that he was waving as far as the dangerous territory that we are moving towards in regards to our businesses here in Corpus Christi, I would say the same is true in regards to our churches. And uh, the longer, as far as the churches are concerned, the longer that we're not able to meet together, uh, the more ineffective and weak we become in our ability to serve this community that we all love so much and to serve our people. Uh, I know there's been a lot of talk about live streaming. Uh, being a large church, we live stream. We have for years, and we were able to put together a pretty compelling experience that way. But for churches, live streaming is akin to a restaurant trying to, to sustain itself on drive-through business. It's the same thing. We, the, the church, by its very nature, is um, it, the DNA of the church, by its very nature, is community. It's connection. And it's not connection through Zoom calls, ultimately, or email, or text, or even live streaming our, our services or our messages. And so um, when this happened, when this crisis took place, uh, we quickly put together uh, a council of churches that represent, there's 30 different churches so far, and that's quickly growing. Almost every day, uh, the number of churches are being added to this council. And they're from all different backgrounds, all different backgrounds and they represent a wide variety of the churches here in Corpus Christi. And so what we did is, is we began to meet uh, together as pastors, and we began to reach out to our congregations together as pastors, both individually and together. In addition to that, uh, last week sometime, uh, Todd Hunter reached out to us and uh, was uh, explained to us that there was a task force that uh, the governor was establishing uh, specifically for churches and their reopening. And uh, Todd reached out to us and asked us to give our input so that he could relay that to the task force. And so we did that last week. 
and um, I'm not sure how much, I mean, it seemed like almost everything we've su we suggested to them, they incorporated in his statement. I don't know how much of that had to do with us. I like to think some of it had to do with us uh, since they asked for it. But um, he sent this notice out yesterday uh, entitled Guidance for Houses of Worship During the COVID-19 Crisis. And uh, one of the things that he said in bold is that the government must give special consideration to houses of worship when issuing orders related to COVID-19. And of course, he mentioned the First Amendment, which honestly, for many, many of the pastors, if, if not most of the pastors on the council, one of our concerns is the overreach that we're feeling right now uh, as far as the government dictating when and how we worship. Governor Abbott mentioned in this, in this statement the First Amendment to the United States Constitution protects the right of Texans to worship and freely exercise their religion according to the dictates of their own conscience. He also referenced the Texas Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which provides additional protections to faith communities, and uh, that the government must ensure that it, com that it complies with the RFRA. Uh, he goes on to say, thus, when the state or local government issues orders prohibiting people from providing or obtaining certain services, they must ensure that these orders do not violate these constitutional statutory rights. I would be more than glad to, uh, uh, Judge Canales, present to you um, what we presented to Todd. And basically the way we approached it was the same way that uh, we're seeing now as far as the state and the federal government opening in stages. And so we presented him uh, our proposal in opening in stages, and I'd be more than glad to, to make that available to you. Um, the reason why I appreciated so much also what Andy had to say is because even though I'm not an economist, we're not economists, we're pastors. I've been doing this for 35 years, uh, and the people, the 40% that are unemployed, those are our people. And the, the spike that we're seeing in people going to the food banks, 440,000 pounds of food, uh, 23,000 families, almost 8% of Corpus Christi, those are our people. Those are people that we pastor. And the emotional impact, even though we, thankfully, because of the quick, decisive action, Judge, of all of you, um, we're looking at, we don't, we're not seeing a spike in COVID-19, but we are seeing a spike in child abuse, and we are seeing a spike in depression, and we are seeing a spike in domestic violence. So we're seeing, a, and we're seeing a spike in unemployment. But thankfully, because you, uh, Judge, you acted so quickly and decisively, the council members, thank you for doing that. But man, now we have to, I think, reshift our focus. And I know as pastors, we need to get back to the business of being able to pastor our people. And we just can't do that virtually. It, it, it was never meant to. And I, I know this is, not a, uh, this is not a church service, but I will say that the birth of what we know to be the church is recorded, that moment was recorded in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, and here's what it says, that they were together, the disciples were together in one place at one time when the church was birthed. And there was a multitude. It was birthed in the midst of a multitude. It's a part of our DNA. So it just doesn't work for us to be able to minister to the emotional and spiritual needs of the community and continue to do that virtually. So, uh, uh, Judge uh, Canales, we would humbly uh, be willing to offer our services and, and helping in any way that we can and uh, being a part of uh, some type of a task force that, that addresses the churches. I know many of us are already looking at how we can do this. And again, I don't know if you were, I don't know, I don't know, I apologize if I don't know how the communication works. I don't know if you received this. Oh, or, I, I did. Yeah, and, I'm sure you did. And I, I, I really I just wanted you to be able to finish, but I yeah. did want to tell you that I did receive it. That I, I don't know if you were in the room when I said I was preparing for my 5 o'clock briefing, and uh, I had all my talking points, and then I just said, okay, throw those out. Somebody, read this. Let's get us going again. You know, we, we got this yesterday afternoon, and um, we were able to quickly disseminate it to the commissioners, to our legislative folks, kind of give them the thanks that they got it to us so so quickly and then I went and had a press briefing and spoke about how I was already in contact with clergy and the reason that happened is because Pastor Bill Cornelius contacted me probably within minutes of, of I guess you know everyone receives it and he just happened to catch me on the phone so I caught him 
or we spoke for about 30 minutes and we really talked about how we saw a task force. I mentioned my affiliation with David, with you, Pastor, because I just wanted to at least try to create that cohesion. So Pastor Bill's probably going to reach out to you today. What I asked him to do was to reach out to you. It sounds like you've already done it and put together the protocols, right? Which is really almost outlined here, yeah. but you might think of you might think of one more, or you may think right. of a caveat to one of these. Right. For example, communion, I don't think was mentioned in here, and I think it'd be a great idea to talk about some of the things that you and I, we all yeah. talked about. Remember the kits yes. and things like that? Yeah. We did mention that, and that was part of our proposal to okay. Todd Hunter that went to the task force about self-contained communion elements. Yeah. And right. It would be great. But like, for example, I spoke with Bishop Mulvey yesterday, and we don't do kits in the Catholic Church, at least in, in the main part of the diocese. And so we talked about, okay, well, could you help me? Um, I mean, one size doesn't fit all. So could you help me come up with a way that a Eucharistic minister could be present communion? And we talked about that. And he said, um, when are you thinking about this? I said, I'm thinking about now. I'm thinking about Sabbath this weekend. He said, that may not work for us, but you have to understand he's got a lot of his diocese. It goes way beyond Noises County. So he needs to speak with other county judges and to make his rule more consistent so that every Catholic church, let's just say, has the same rules, perfect sense. But what I conveyed yesterday in the press briefing, and I'd like to do it again today, is that I'm ready it, when you are ready, which I guess is always right, to go ahead and get these started. But it would be really wonderful if we worked very, very hard before the Sabbath, because a lot of people do worship on, on Saturday, if we could get the protocols out before Saturday, as in by Friday. And that would help all of us uh, distribute evenly and equally to all faiths. And then the second thing that I was going to ask of you is um, not just to write them, but um, to also seek input from other faiths as well, other than the Christian faith as well, just because, like we know, uh, Rabbi Emanuel was on some of our calls. I mean, that would just be a good thing. You don't have to, but I think that it's a wonderful gesture so that we could also say we're all in this together. And I think that um, this guidance really does illustrate uh, maybe striking that balance. We couldn't do it then, but we can maybe do it now if we practice the safe protocols. And I know I sound like a broken record, but lock in those gains because we don't want our congregate. We don't want the very people you want to minister to to have to also deal with the extra layer of illness. And there's so many ways to that aren't in here that I think we could address. I also want you to consider where people um, can continue the remote. You know, Mr. Taubman, you talked about the vulnerable population. That, vi that, th that population, that's not just grandma. I'm not really um, saying this to rush my children, but like I'm old enough to be a grandma, but I'm just not a grandma. But I'm old enough to be one. And so what I want to say is that that older population isn't just – but if it, that does rush your children, that's okay, too, okay, right? Okay, that's okay, right, too. Well, well, they do need to get married first, but okay. <laughs> but the point is, is that the 65 and older doesn't necessarily um, – we need to create the, the, the remote listening for anybody who thinks of themselves as vulnerable. You could be vulnerable because you're 65 and older, but you could also be vulnerable because you've got diabetes and you have dialysis twice a week. Or Does that make sense? I really yes, want us to continue the remote – talk right and and i'm not that makes sense yeah i'm not advocating uh not doing that at all matter Good. of fact if, if i could if yep, i could please. uh just an example of phase one our suggestion now they weren't that uh they obviously weren't that specific in in this document mm -hmm. but one of the things that in phase and again I'll, I'll make sure to get this to you but um one of the things that we proposed for phase one judge was uh several things number one request those exhi exhibiting any symptoms at all to stay home Request anyone, strongly request anyone who is considered high risk or immune compromised to stay home and take advantage of the live stream. Uh, encourage anyone who's uncomfortable attending to freely, uh, without any sense of guilt, to stay home. Uh, to make available self-contained communion elements. Sanitize all surfaces, classrooms, bathrooms, before and after every service. We have multiple services to be able to accommodate our crowds. Um, and of course, avoid handshakes, high fives, 
Uh, we also are prepared to make available masks to anyone who wants them, and uh, as well as all kinds of hand sanitizer. And, and th those were just some of the things that we had in that oh, in that phase one. And so I would be more than glad to, again, get that to, I don't know how, I guess I can get it to County Commissioner Vaughn. I don't have your yes, contact we'll information or whatever. Would, yes, she'll, she'll forward it to me. We're, yeah. We would love it. And then I'm just going to ask one of you to reach out to Pastor Cornelius at Church Unlimited. And he's got some too. Fuse them. And let's, I mean, the quicker we can get them to me, the quicker we can publish them. And just remember, this won't be an order coming from the county judge. This will just be a guidance, guidance. right? It's just yes. a guidance. But you, as they say, now we become co-leaders. You as spiritual leaders and myself as a elected leader and an emergency management leader. Now we transfer power to one another. Right. You transfer to me in the realm of guidance, and I transfer to you in the realm of your flock. And boy, is that a trust. And it's a, it's a tremendous trust that we're going to have with one another to keep each other safe. And, but I believe that, um, that he's spoken and that the Attorney General has spoken and that this is where we need to go. And I pray that it will bring healing to those families that are in search of a way to, you know, that really need, as you say, that touch. But there's so many things that we talked about yesterday that I bet are on your list and including if we at the county can help anybody with sanitizers, there's actually a movement afoot to buy them in drums. You know, you, we can give you our vendors. and That's beautiful. Yeah, because we think that if you were to sanitize on the way in and sanitize on the way out, that's a really good thing. And then I really want us to, this is just guidance, not spiritual, but just guidance. We want to talk about this. There's been a lot of talk about the vulnerable, and I don't want to diminish anything about what, Andy said or what the doctor said, but I don't know about you, but I had a hard morning when I saw that little girl's picture again, that little girl named Skyler, who's five years old, whose mother was a police officer and whose father was a fireman in Detroit, Michigan, mm -hmm. and neither one of her parents were, were positive for COVID, but she was, and she died, and, and she died as a direct result of COVID-19, and so I want us to teach our young people that they have a responsibility to. And I don't know if there's any better place than in church to teach something that's higher than you. We all live under authority. I believe the Bible says that too. And under that authority, we should really take to heart that it can happen to any of us, including our children. We don't want to scare them, Pastor, but we want to educate them. We teach them a lot about things that are scary, a lot. And I just want to appeal to you because I know you all can say it in the right way where they'll hear it, where it's not coming from a, mm -hmm. a judge, right. but somebody that they love, somebody they trust, and somebody that, that can protect them. And Because I, I do fear without that, we're losing that teaching opportunity. Um, that Because I want them to take it seriously. To If you ask them, a volunteer crew, to clean, that they clean, or that, you know, does that make sense? Oh, absolutely, and it needs to be taken seriously, and mm -hmm. I think it's a valid point. And I, I, I would, I think I speak for, for us saying that we take it seriously, and it is Thank serious. You. It needs to be taken seriously. And so I, again, I so appreciate this time. Thank you so Likewise. much. And, um, and again, the council, uh, we're, we're here to help and assist any way that we can. I'll reach out to, I've got Bill's cell number. I'll reach out to him yeah. as well, and, uh, and we'll work together with this. That's great. And so we'll try to get this guidance out by Friday, and I'll work with Commissioner Vaughn. Would you maybe take that as your charge? I would love to. And like, can Done. I ask something? <laughs> um, someone, just, someone just texted me, and they're listening. Okay. And they said, so what you're saying, if you give them the guidelines and they yes. go by them, they could actually have service. That's, that's correct. That's correct, and, and we should say that. You, um, we still, the governor's guidance still says if you feel more comfortable doing drive-in, drive-through, right, remote, right, keep right, on. Right. The one thing that's in this that we didn't talk about was church gatherings. I, I really want to believe that this phased approach is a smart approach. So I know at my church there's all kinds of amazing, like, women's groups. And, and again, whatever practices we put in church service let's also implement put those that. in the yes yes, yes ma'am i so totally agree there's a lot to talk about still but i know but between now and friday we'll get there and please reach out through your networks and keep these tentacles are growing and they're growing for good and this is part of andy's message of hope as well this is this is a message of hope so the answer is yes but commissioners when you post this Please make sure that you reference 
that guidance is partially available to you now, because that's what this document mm -hmm. is from the government, from the state, but that we also would include guidance that's particular to our community. And that goes into the communions and some of the things they didn't address here. Right, right. I bet you can think of others. Is that is that a fair uh, assessment? Because honestly, you guys, the what when when we couldn't go to church all these weeks, I'm sure every day you wish we could, but you know what? You didn't. And I just want to say thank you for protecting your congregation and how much I know how much that hurt. And how about the fact that you supported me personally during that time is really valued. And more importantly, the people that there was only one or cup two, but the pastors that didn't, you were critical of them. And that's important too, to see leadership when you're saying we can't do it that way. And, and you did that for us. And I, I just want to say it's through that sacrifice, that shared sacrifice that we're better for it. And now where we can help you, we're going to return that favor. Well, we, I appreciate, we, do, we all appreciate the, your acknowledgement of that, and it was our desire to do that because we love and respect this body yeah. and, and our local government, and we love and respect our people. We do want them safe. We do want them well. So I so appreciate Thank that. You. Thank you very much. And um, I know this is such a pastor thing to do, but can I just pray real quick before I go you need for to. all of us? Fine by me. Is that okay? That's awesome. Yes. Okay. Father, thank you for uh, this body and thank you for your faithfulness to us. Uh, and as we heard, so aptly put, um, we are people under authority and there is a higher authority and we acknowledge you as that. And we are so thankful for your kindness. We're th so thankful, Lord, for your wisdom and your direction and we lean heavily on that. And we continue to pray for our leaders, our governmental officials here locally and nationally. We just ask that you would continue to strengthen them. These are difficult times for all and, uh, and difficult times for them. So, uh, God, again, thank you for protecting us. Thank you for helping us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Judge, can I ask him something? Yes, of course. You know, I think all of us will post the orders. But before we do that, if you can come up with some of the ideas, because a lot of churches don't have things available like y'all do, thinking out of the box and how they can hold their services because you've got small, medium, large. Mm -hmm. Can you get us that? Because that would be something That's good. That's what I, I was asking for. I Friday, thought it was. But, but, I, but I was going to put yeah. you in charge. Yeah. Um, they're going to work with Pastor Bill and, and their group, okay. and then they're going to get it to you by Friday. It's okay to post these, but I think we can do better even. Yeah, I, I do think too. we can I, be I more. I don't, I don't think I want to post I don't mine. think this is going to help a lot of right. people uh, that have really small church. I just think that you might need to. I think what you guys can come up with can even be better. That's what I was saying to Friday. Nothing wrong with posting, but can you just please put and more guidance okay. coming? Mm -hmm. Something like think, that? Yeah, I mean, you're right. Small churches, medium-sized churches, large right. churches, excessively large churches like my, like ours or, or uh, Church yeah. Unlimited, those, those, those all present their different challenges. And so I think that's a very great idea to be able to, to offer that, Judge, yeah. I, I think it's incredibly important because uh, this to me is – uh, a huge ray of hope for people. Um, if, if we can't get the churches back opened up safely, then there's going to be, as Andy's talked about, a lot of hope lost. Mm -hmm. So I am, I got this from Todd as everyone else did, or Tyner sent it, everybody sent it. And I, this is inspiring stuff. So I really appreciate y'all being Thank here. You I so really much. appreciate what you did to, as judge said, support her and her efforts. This is, this is stunk for all of us. Nobody enjoys this. Certainly, yeah not Judge Canales and the pressure she's been under, not any of us who've had to take calls sure. and field calls. And, and it's not easy, and there's so much misinformation. But, you know, every once in a while, we got to grab onto a little ray of hope, and I think there's been a lot of ray of hopes that have yeah. come today, and yours is certainly the biggest ray of hope we've heard today, in my opinion, so I really appreciate it. I, I thank, thank all of you for and your and service. For all of you, not and, just you. And one thing I was thinking, I don't want to just put this bug <laughs> in your in your seat, plant the seed, is choirs. In other words, there's... You need to give some guidance for the choirs because they have robes, they have books. And so I know there's a way we can do it. But like uh, my right. daughter sang in the choir and, you know, just the way we, we – anyway, I know we can figure it out. But almost every – all the wonderful churches have music as a part of it. And we just want to give some guidance. That's what I'm saying. This is okay, but it's not really – 
it's not going to give everybody, so I'm going to let put that in your good hands and work with Commissioner Bond, and she'll get it to me. And what I can offer is the platform of Noises County's website, Noises County's Facebook, Twitter. I'll even do with you guys um, a YouTube portal that once you get your protocols, you can maybe talk about them, give ideas, stuff like that. But let's say it's it's great but we're going to make it greater. Let's do it that way. Can we do it that way? It's not just okay to me. This is really good. Right. I mean, I mean, and right it, now I think it's people good. need some hope. What I mean is is that, um, like anything, I I was, ask Laura how interpretation I know, goes. I, I we're going to get a 1,000 calls on this. I know. So I just think the more detailed we can be, the better. Remember, these are not orders. Right. They're guidance. Yeah. If it's not perfect for your service, but our goal is to keep people safe. So the better ideas that you get from the small, medium, and large, and then we say – People are going to say, well, does this mean I can have Bible study? Yes, but you're going to social distance in your Bible study. What about, choir was the one I thought of, um, what about a church picnics, you know, or social gatherings that are big? I'm still going to say as the emergency manager, um, not as my parishioner, but as an emergency manager, I'm going to say, can we, is there any way we can hold off on those? Can we just start with church so that we can work our way and see where, what things happen? Because, Otherwise, I don't want us. I don't want us to go backwards. I only want us to go forwards. I think those are reasonable requests, but when you say them as leaders, as spiritual leaders, it's going to change the conversation. Yeah. Well, I think we're we're all. I hope my guys say something if I'm misspeaking here, but we're all uh, understanding that we need to do this in phases. And for us, the first phase is being able to meet in our homes of worship, because again, as was so aptly said, the the hope that 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 communicates. So yes, thank you so much. That's great. Uh, just to make clear, Judge, we're, not, we're not lifting the ban on on churches, right? As yes, sir. The, the governor's done that already. But as far as, as, far as the, the the amount of people that can yes, sir, go to the church, yes, sir. still have to be this no, sir. distance, right? The social distance, yes. You so still want to be able to do the social distance. 300 people or 200 people in the church, they all have to be social distance. Yes, that, let me... I just want to make sure. Well, well that's the that's the. I just want that, to make sure we're not giving somebody that's a mixed the guidance. message here, right? So the, that's the guidelines. That's the guidance or the recommendations. It's not, re it's not mandated anymore, sir. It's just the guidance. That's why I'm working with the clergy so closely because that which is not a law can be abused. Correct. And therefore, what I'm saying is, rather than me just say, um, now, I, and I don't, I'm not doing this. So be, we're going to make sure, I'm going to preface, I'm not doing this, but a county judge can be more restrictive than the governor. And that's why it's really important for us to have these dialogues, because I'm saying, I'll do, I'm going to go ahead and... Um, now this says differently, just so you're, I know you No, know no, no, that. I know, but, uh, but we're just talking about, right. what they're saying is that there is a state compelling interest, right? Right. And so the governor has said they're essential services. But, for example, if we said everybody has to wear masks in public spaces where there's more than 200 people, we could do things like that. What we're saying is let's do it a different way. Let's work with the churches that can basically do it better because they're going to come up with a set of rules that are going to work really well for small, medium, and large. But for, for Commissioner Gonzalez's uh, – what to answer his question – they're now essential, so there's only the rules of guidance regarding social distance. But what we're working out is that they should do that, and they're saying that they will. Yeah, we can't. Uh, there's 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 so many things that we can do to mitigate uh, chances of people getting sick or, or anything like that, uh, and 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 those will be different. Uh, judge with uh, the different sizes. So, for example, with a church our size, if we only had uh, if we separated the chairs six feet apart and we could only put 200 people or whatever in there, I'd have to have 50 services to serve our, our folks. Right. And I'm 61. I'm in pretty good shape, but I don't think I can right. do 50 services. I was trying to find the, the piece here so I could refer to Commissioner Gonzalez, but it talks about... Well, how would you do the social, social distance then? Well, we, there's an aspect of that we wouldn't be able to do. That's why our proposal was masks, making masks available, self-contained communion elements, sanitizing vigorously before and after each service, all surfaces. Um, we, could, we could imply some, uh, some mitigation within our classrooms because that's easier to manage. But even if we did it in a worship center, you're, you're not going to have that in a, in a lobby. 
Right, and I liked this one. It yeah. said clergy should dismiss attendees by family by, units. By family units or in stages or in phases, yeah. And it says maintaining social distancing. So yeah. there's very good guidance to, but that's why it's so important for us to be able right. to work it out. Right. Yes, ma'am. Is once, once this gets accomplished, you don't want to just say, okay, everybody have at it without trying to give guidance. And they right. recognize that, and that's why... I and think that's what important. we proposed to mm -hmm. Todd as well, is we didn't want to just, we weren't proposing, let's just open up the gates and everybody just rush back into church without there being any sense of responsibility or measures that were taken. And so that's why we came up with these three phases. Um, so you have 150, 150 wear masks, you know. That's what I, that's what I would see. What we're doing is we're prepared because we have, like I said, we have a church of thousands. So we're already preparing to purchase thousands of masks to make available. And we know that families can sit yeah. close together because yes. they're from one household unit. And Correct. so we can work. That's what we were talking about and yesterday. People, and if people are comfortable going, they're not going to go. You know, and that's the bottom line. That's right. A lot aren't going to go. And we want to give them that freedom to not go without even feeling without bad any, about it. Without any guilt. Without any guilt whatsoever. My, Encourage my them to. That's my wife, if you're I Catholic, said, no guilt. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I said this that's to my right. Wife. Yes, ma'am. I said this to my wife yesterday, and she said she's not going no matter. She's not going yet anyway because we can watch it online. And that's okay. So. Yeah. Too. And that's okay, and we're letting our folks know that that is, right. we're, we're providing the best experience online right. because of that, because we want them to feel like they can do that. You know, Pastor, I support everything you're doing, I really do. I, I mean, I'm dying to go to church, too, you know, and get my communion and everything else. But, you know, I just I don't want to feel like somebody opened the door and now everybody comes, you know. I, I just want to make sure that we just, again. Right. I just, I, 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 I agree. That's why I'm so, I'm so, I'm so happy. When I got this. Okay, m maybe other county judges would have panicked, but I, I didn't. You know why? Because I already knew that I could call the Moral Compass Initiative. But literally, I think Bill was like instantaneous text. From the time I got it, Bill was on my, on the, Pastor Bill was in my ear. And then I did hang up and call Bishop Mulvey because we know, of, we know the population mm -hmm. of, of Catholic churches in our area. Yes, yes. And I also know that communion wasn't addressed, and I thought, right. I need to get on this immediately. And they don't do the kits in a lot of the churches, so I thought, okay, I need to. So yesterday afternoon, we begun at 5 o'clock. It, it was a very short day, and then, of course, today. But I really wasn't as concerned. Of course, I'm, I'm always wondering how it's going to work, but of course, here it is exactly as it should be. Yeah. We're working together, phased approach. We'll make sure we communicate really well. I can tell you there'll be a lot of confusion, so let's work together, commissioners, to really start communicating carefully. Um, and again, you know, we'll pivot, we'll adjust, we'll, we'll do everything we can to, to keep people you know, safe and and soulful. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank, thank you. you. I didn't mean thank to take up so this much. much time, but thank you. So well, it much. was an important subject, yeah. and and of course, it was timely as well. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank, thank you so thank much, you, Commissioner Vaughn. Okay. Um, as they say, we now have um, we have so many things to do. Um, I'm beginning to feel that COVID has invaded it has invaded Commissioner's Court. It feels the same way as it does every day so much to do and not enough time, but we've had lots of good opportunities to visit with folks. The one thing that I notice is that Johnny has been here for a long time, and I know um, uh, there's he this. He loves being here. Huh? He, he does. He loves being here. Well, this is what I was going to I, like I was gonna say, like is that let's have Johnny Hip come up, and then I would like to at least get through the consent agenda and some of the things. Melissa, I know our EOC rideout team has been waiting to visit, but the truth is is that they're here at the courthouse, that they work here. So we can do that at any time or even create a new time. I just want to make sure that the people that have traveled to be here, uh, including our regular agenda, get heard. And I'm a little, I'm, I'm a, I'm a little worried about that um, on about 10 different fronts. Um, so, Johnny, thank you for being here. I, I'm there's a part of the workshop that was going to get addressed with regards to, it says hospitalization options. That's probably not the perfect verbiage, but at least gives you an opportunity to introduce what happened at hospital district last Friday. And then actually, um, Melissa is here and she was on the call with me to Tetum yesterday. So we can provide an update 
to commissioners and to even you, although I did call John Martinez and say, call Johnny and tell him. There's just not enough hours in the day. I got that. I got to talk to him this morning at 8 o'clock, but we do want to update uh, everybody on what Tatum said. But um, why don't you give us a synopsis? And honestly, this um, all, all the info you've heard about increased suicide and, and depression, anxiety, is really those are the items that you guys are addressing um, with um, – with our behavioral health initiative and opioid task force. And I just want to say that I was going to ask you anyway to contact our friends at Texas State of Mind, um, the Meadows Foundation, and just tell them that, you know, we need to be monitoring these this new data. And they're already monitoring data, but now they need to look for new data. And we need to see how this uh, COVID-19 is affecting our behavioral health uh, scenario here in Noasis, and I'm, I'm sure that they would be happy to pivot and do that for us since they're working for us. Well, uh, good morning and good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, it's been nice to be here. It's been very informative for me. And in order to answer your question, Judge, and your directive, let me just go back, and it's probably better if this is done in sequence. Go ahead. So um, when uh, the uh, pandemic emerged, uh, the governor uh, issued orders uh, that affected hospitals for them to not do elective surgeries anymore. And the thought behind that was to uh, make beds available in the hospitals to handle any potential overflow, anything that had to do with uh, uh, the local facilities not having space, stored, whatever, to take care of potentially an overflow patients. So uh, that's been in effect for a while, and uh, that effort has had some uh, effect. It's not just some effect. It's had a large effect on all the facilities in terms of um, – other finances, they've laid off people, they've done other things in response to that. And those things are not good. But today, and to fast forward to today, uh, the hospitals have the ability to go back and start doing elective surgeries. And while the surgery schedules are not full at those hospitals today, it's going to be a slow increase, as earlier speakers have talked about, the economy coming back in a slow way. So what's, what we're concerned about and what led to the action last Friday by the hospital district board is that the, the board was requested by uh, the judge in, in her capacity to uh, consider making additional beds available in the community uh, in light of the fact that the hospitals are going to be able to start doing surgeries again. In other words, their bed capacity, uh, their occupancy would start going up and their bed capacity would be smaller they would be able to take in less patients and so uh, coupled with that uh, and the fact that corpus has not yet realized its surge and or reached its peak or anything yet uh, there was a request by the judge that the district consider making a portion of memorial available again uh, for care of essentially overflow or extra COVID patients that could arise in the community and I believe that, and the judge could probably speak to this, but I think there's a request by, by the state to also uh, put up a facility uh, that could handle capacity outside of Corpus within our region. And I think, Judge, also a couple with that was the county's desire not to have a bunch of white tents uh, scattered all over uh, parking lots and places like that to handle any potential overflow patients that came. So the, the request before the board was to consider uh, steps that were necessary to make those bids uh, available. And so what the board uh, acted to do was they approved uh, using up to $3 million to do the things necessary to operationalize, if you will, not renovate, but operationalize that portion of the memorial that would be used for these bids. But they went a bit step further as they established some conditions. And the conditions first were that Spawn agreed to use of that facility because it's covered. They, we contribute our use or lease that facility to them, however you want to describe it. So they first had to agree. The second one was of the three health care systems in Corpus, that being Christus, HCA, and Driscoll, that at least one of them had to agree that they would use the facility. They would put patients there. They would provide the personnel, the equipment, sharing the cost of operating that, that space. So that space is basically, um, it's the uh, two-story building that's right above the emergency room at Memorial. It's the most newly renovated space at Memorial. 
It's uh, the district's last bond issue in the 1980s, but took care of building out that space. And that space has three ICUs. They're all located right next to each other and also has a patient care unit that's located on that floor. And so the thought process behind the board's decision was that uh, it could make available to, to either all three health care systems, R1, uh, but there's three units, there's three health care systems, so each, each health care system could use a unit. They could use it independent of the others. It would work that way. So the uh, projected uh, cost, if you will, of putting that unit back into operation was around $3 million. So first of all, let me tell you a, a couple of things. So $3 million is a lot of money, but when you talk about spending money inside a health care facility because of all the regulatory things they have to do, the life safety codes, the redundant systems and stuff they had in it, $3 million to me is not surprising. It is to the public, and I understand it's $3 million. Uh, but in, in terms of health care dollars and in terms of spending on a health care facility, that is not a lot of money. So the other thing that the $3 million is designed to do is to basically uh, segregate that area of the hospital from an HVAC system standpoint uh, from the rest of the hospital. And the, the other thing I want to add is that uh, Memorial has never been taken offline. It's always had patients in it from back the time we made the decision to demolish it. It's always maintained a psychiatric care unit up on the seventh floor. The emergency room has been in use for um, emergency patients up until last year, but it still continues to be used for triaging mental health and psychiatric patients that go up, come to the hospital. So the infrastructure of the hospital has always been running. It's always been there. It's always been turned on. The gas is still run through the walls. I mean, everything it takes to run a hospital, they still do. So the three million is focused on basically fixing, if you will, that part of the hospital so it can be used for these kinds of patients. So the deadline for the three health care systems to respond to the district uh, is today. I have not yet received anything, but they still have until five o'clock to let us know. I suspect that they're they're probably caucusing. There's probably a lot of conversations going on out there about how they will uh, respond to the letter I sent on Monday laying out the board's conditions for proceeding with this. So the changes that, that the changes these, these things that would take place at Memorial in terms of making that area operational do not do anything to the mental health care or the seventh and eighth floor or the floor in the hospital where the mental health patients are still kept. That's still there. It's still in place and it's still operational. So all the money that would go into this project would only have to do with making the facility available uh, for handling these kind of patients in the event that they're needed. So instead of the district, they could have just said, well, let's go get the thing ready and see who comes. The board didn't go that way. They said there's got to be some conditions. Obviously, Spahn's got to agree, but at least one of the three of y'all has to agree to come use this unit or we're not going to put it up. I put the money into it. So these things are in play in the background among all the facilities locally and how they're going to do. Uh, the timing of it is probably, it's a good timing because today they could start surgeries. And so now they're going to start to have a sense of, you know, how long is it going to take them to get back to normal? How many people can they put back to work? Are they going to need these extra beds? And so that's kind of where we are in terms of what the district's board did last Friday. They continue to monitor this. Uh, you know, then we may need to make adjustments and stuff. But the first thing we have to do is hear from Spawn, and the second thing is we have to hear from at least one of the other th one of the three uh, facilities in the community about whether this thing goes or not. So um, there, I guess there there have been concerns about why would you put uh, three million into a facility you may demolish, and that's a that's a legitimate question. Uh, but given the situation that we're in and the, op the options that we have to deal with it, uh, going into a facility that was already up and running and could meet, it already meets licensure code, it already meets all the codes and stuff, and with spending $3 million, you could make these all three of these units available. There's about 15 beds in each unit. You could quickly make these things available. The, uh, we, there's an architect that has been involved in helping look at these. He's a local architect who's very familiar with Memorial and the work that's been done to it over the years. And the uh, proposed contractor, uh, or not proposed, but who might be doing the work, uh, was taken off of, it was selected off of the buy board. 
and I think that that contractor has done some work with y'all. And just coincidentally, that contractor has to be happens to be probably the preeminent hospital contractor uh, in Texas. So if you ever drive through the medical center in Houston, this company's name is on every one of those buildings that are being uh, worked on right now. So, Judge and Commissioners, I don't know if I've touched on Judge everything you wanted yeah, to talk I, about. That's a good. But. It's a good synopsis. You know, like any of these issues, you could you can. It's it's a matter of how much time and how much you know knowledge do you want to really pack in an hour. The only thing I think I might add that I think is is very important, and Melissa just stepped back in, so she can always chime in too. She was on the call. Is that what we what we didn't know? At the time, we've tried to get some answers since last Friday for you and for the board that we'll send to you, is that Texas Department of Emergency Management, through the feds, provided a booklet for communities to look at, um, uh, and it's really called an alternate care site, is really the proper name for them. We started calling it a dedicated COVID unit because that's really what it would, the way we thought about it. But of course, the feds have their own vernacular, their own, we're always talking about their, their verbiage, and that's what they like to say, alternate care sites. And there's a big booklet. So this site would be contemplated to be, uh, to follow, right, the guidelines that the federal government through this, and then through the states, through their emergency management, would say is appropriate. In addition, um, we learned that uh, even if you had no supplemental funding at all, which we do, but let's just pretend we had no. This would be eligible for a 75, 25% FEMA reimbursement, okay? However, we're fortunate in the state of Texas that we have a supplemental funding source coming to us from the CARES Act, and this would meet the qualifications of a reimbursable expense. Again, nobody makes you promises. There's no, you know this from Hurricane Harvey, right? You don't just get what you submit, but if you document, 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 and you can show justification for your region, which the other thing I'd like to get to, this would be a very good possibility, a very high possibility that you would be eligible, just like, by the way, the other cost that this county has expended um, uh, for COVID. For example, the city's expended over a million dollars for COVID preparedness so far. Here at the county, you'll hear from Dale, we're about the half a million mark on all kinds of preparedness, right? So there's, just like any disaster, there's going to be hard costs, and this is one that could be submitted. But we did learn that FEMA, separate bucket of money, has a 75-25 match on these alternate care sites, okay? But from the supplemental funding, you could be potentially made whole. Now, the other thing that's important to, to recognize here is that this doesn't have anything to do with Johnny said hospital beds, and I would agree that that's one justification. On these types of analysis, I've learned that you have to have door A, door B, and door C, or door one, door two, door three, however you like to look at it. One possibility has to do with capacity, okay? When we first got into this COVID-19, the way we looked at it as emergency managers, and again, we get our direction from upon high, was be very concerned about PPE and be very concerned about hospital capacity over, we got lucky in the way Texas did because it took a while to get here compared to, we were weeks behind the East Coast, weeks behind the West Coast. And in those weeks, we were able to, to organize ourselves from a medical standpoint and create ventilators and create hospital bed capacity. PPA, PPE took a while and I'd submit to you, we're still not great on PPE, okay? But we'll put that aside for a moment. But more, more so than all our neighbors, for certain, we did better in that regard. But what this has always been about is like an insurance policy. The way I described it on radio yesterday, because I think it's a way that most people can wrap their head around, is that you've got a storm in the Gulf. And, you know, when you see your storms, they have like a big old yellow line and it says, here's our projected path. There's this line, there's this line, there's this line. Lots of, but you're in, you're in it. You're in that projected path of this Category 5 hurricane. And you have the opportunity to buy insurance. Is that insurance going to be cheap? What do you think? I don't think it's going to be cheap because you already know the storm's there. 
This is an insurance policy that the state of Texas has charged us with seeking out. I want you to know the United States Army Corps of Engineers. I tell you what, a group and an organization, I've, I've, only, I've only had kind of two dreams in my life, and, and one of them is uh, to be involved with the Corps of Engineers, because I just think they're just the greatest thing since, I mean, remember they've existed since George Washington asked them to help them build bridges back in 1775. The Corps of Engineers came to our community here in Corpus Christi, and they searched our entire region. Remember, you remember Gary told you about Region 20? And they looked and searched for ideal uh, locations for an alternate care site. Our alternate care site is one of the best, according to Chief Pena, that he has seen for the entire region. In fact, the only one that he thought might work in the valley has turned out not to be an, an acceptable location. It is very hard to find these locations. And again, I, as the emergency manager, was charged with this duty. By the way, we've also looked at hotels for other types of alternate care sites. Somebody, Andy, you said, I bet we could put grandma in a hotel. You bet. And guess what? We already have that that set up. It's nothing that we have uh, consummated yet, but we have that contract already in case we needed that opportunity. That's also technically, by the way, an alternate care site. And other jurisdictions have done the same thing. In Brazos County, okay, they're doing the same thing. Regionally, north, south, east, and west in Texas, they're doing the same thing. I just read that the governor's office, I think they just approved um, in Dallas, Gosh, I, I want to say it's the K. Bailey Hutchison maybe arena that they're also doing an alternate care site. These are not only um, normal in this type of emergency, but they are requested and needed. I think that it's it's really an amazing opportunity that presents ourselves because Memorial is operational today. So everyone needs. I'm glad you reemphasized that. But what's special about it is that it has ancillary services that are up and running now. And again, when I think of Memorial, I think of that big kind of off-white, almost yellow building. This is not that building. It's a smaller two-story building that's connected to it. And, um, and like I said, and it's operational right now. The, um, the interesting thing is you have a pharmacy there, a lab, an OR, a surge room where you could put extra possible 10 other beds besides the three pods. And I'm missing something, Johnny. A lab, a pharmacy, an x-ray. You have x-ray. And you have your medical gases that are operational. These were all the factors that went into the discussion with CBRAC when we vetted all kinds of sites. Now, is it a gift that the hospital district could advance funds? You bet it is. And this is what the state looks for when they say, which one makes the most sense? But it's never been contemplated by our emergency management team to sort of make somebody pay for something that we wouldn't go seek the reimbursement for. Just like our half a million we're going to go seek reimbursement for, these are the ones that you pre-check, you pre-vet that are eligible. In addition, I would say that while the hospital capacity was fine a week ago, as we transcend to, transcend to business being normalized over time and elective surgeries being normalized, you're going to lose those hospital capacity beds. You're going to keep, the governor's order right now requires 25% as a hold. But over time, that might diminish. And so if there is such a thing as a second wave or a resurgency, a seasonality of this pandemic, and nobody knows, if anybody has a crystal ball, I mean, show it to me. But I can tell you that the CDC doesn't have a crystal ball. But what they know is that it's most like the Spanish flu of 1918, which did see a seasonality in a second wave. Would you rather have a county and their emergency team be prepared or unprepared? Would you rather have a county who could take, as awful as this is, the scenario of a jail being infected, a homeless community being infected, a western county, small city being infected, or a neighbor like Clayburg who sits in our healthcare region, 
we have to be prepared for that. That's the whole purpose of emergency management. And so I took that uh, earnest um, job uh, seriously, and we prepared all the things they asked us to do, cost estimates, um, vetting, BCA analysis, and we did everything. And yesterday on the phone, Chief Pena of the 30 counties said he's going to take our plan straight to Director Kidd, Johnny. That's the part I haven't had a chance to visit with you about. This was yesterday. Um, and this is excellent. Now, I want you to know I've spoken with all since our Friday meeting because of the board's directive. They asked me to go figure out if any of these institutions would utilize the facility. I've spoken to all three CEOs. So while you haven't received a letter, I can tell the commissioners that the result of those conversations are all three of them support the concept. All three of them uh, would not rule out the possibility in the future that they could utilize it. But let's take Driscoll. They have not seen one pediatric COVID patient at all. So they're never going to sign on the dotted line, don't make me utilize it. But would they or could they see that there could be a potential possibility? Sure. But they have not had a demographic that's highly affected. But they do have an ECMO machine, a heart and lung breathing machine. And they recognize that there are some synergies there. And, of course, the way we pitched it to the hospital district board was that all because this is what CBRAC explained to us. And remember, your rack is your, a lot of people don't know much about the racks. Probably you've never heard that at home if you're listening. But your rack is the most important, in my opinion, counsel for, um, for hospitals and for trauma that exist. And while they might fly under the radar, they're the ones that are really there for you when you have a traumatic event. And this is one, by the way. And so the rack is going to supply, make the request to supply everything for this event, for this unit. And that's one thing you didn't mention that they mentioned to you, that they have, they have committed to that already. So they would bring every hospital bed, every IV pole, every they would put all the stuff, so to speak, to get it operational. And then they would also request a state incident management team to come and tell us how to do it. But theoretically, the state could license it, or each hospital could come in with their own license and their own billing. So there's this business of why would they do it they couldn't bill? That's not true. They could bill. They could bill everything as if they were in their own hospital. And let me just say we have three providers. One is a private institution headquartered out of Nashville. The other one is a nonprofit that is a regional hospital system. That's Christus. And then we have Driscoll. But make no mistake, we are the region's healthcare center. Everybody that gets sick in our region comes here. San Pat has no hospital beds at all, zero. And that's the same for Duval. It's not the same for Jim Wells. It's the same for Live Oak. B's got a Christus system. Alice has a Christus system. And Kingsville has a Christus system. These are the complexities of where we happen to live. So when we brought this to the hospital district, it's meant to be a regional um, solution for CBRAC and for the state. And I think that it's – I'm, I'm going to let Melissa at least chime in, but the, the state of Texas is very appreciative and very um, excited about this opportunity that it presents as a backstop for health care. And if we never used it, you might say to yourself, if your glass half empty, that was three, it's a potential of three million, but it also has a floor of a million and a half. It's somewhere between a million and a half and three. And that has to do with the negative pressure system. But anyway, but let's just say three for the conservative, that's the most, that could be a, a worse. On that, that could be it. That's, what, that's in the light most unfavorable. $3 million to protect hundreds of millions of dollars in our, in our standing health care is a small price to pay, and you wouldn't want there to be a scenario where you didn't have it because then you would be intense, and, and I'm talking regionally now, um, and we just happen to be that entity that can be that rescue boat, and I think that it's going to be something that 
when we look back on, I hope we never have to use it, Johnny. Honestly. I hope that $3 million, you know, when we pay a million dollars in insurance and maybe up to $3 million here this year, you know, I, I don't want to use it because you know what? That means a storm hit us. But if this storm hits us, and just so you know, if you don't think it could happen, just ask me to email you the 10 counties in Texas that have had horrible, horrible stories with their nursing care facilities or a vulnerable population, a cluster. Ask Victoria what they think about this. And that's why everybody who has heard the idea believes that um, from, the, from the emergency management side that it's a protection. And so we will continue to vet it, Johnny. It's, we're not done yet. I don't think um, HCA, um, because they don't have to take any of those vulnerable populations. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, I do. Driscoll doesn't have the population, and I think Christus will utilize it, but I think there's other issues at work that we need to go through, and they have always told me we would utilize it if you stood it up. They've never, ever said no, so I expect that they will – maybe put some conditions, but I think you're going to get a letter saying that they would utilize it. But the most important person isn't Christus, and it isn't HCA, and it isn't Driscoll. You know who it is? It's the state of Texas. And that's what we are going to need some more time for. So I'm going to have to uh, respectfully ask you to tell your board that we need a, 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 a director kid to weigh in on this, and he and they will. But they asked for something yesterday afternoon that I have not had a chance to type out. But CBRAC is working on the written plan, and we're going to get it to uh, Director Kidd and the what's called the strike force. But again, this is something that's being done by the – just like the governor deployed the National Guard, the feds and the governor deployed, deployed the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And while they were looking all over and couldn't find anything – we were able to find something. We were able to give a cost to it. We were able to get the board who – Memorial is not owned by this county. It's owned by the hospital district. Memorial is run by a – we have a tenant there. That's Christus. Right. So Christus Spawn is the tenant. They have to agree. The owner of the property has to agree. And then it's our job to present the plan – that gets vetted by the state, and that's where we are in the process. And um, it is a complicated one, and I'm leaving out about a million themes, but I've tried to hit the highlights of what you didn't hit, Johnny, and I can just say to you that it means a lot to me to have Driscoll CEO and CMO, Driscoll CMO, I'm sorry, uh, uh, blah, 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 HCA CMO and CEO and Christus's to all say, you bet we think this is a great idea, and this is so important. And But what you're not going to get them to do is without explaining the licensing procedure and the billing procedure, you're not going to get them to respond to you in 48 hours. That's not only an unreasonable request, it's not practical. But I appreciate your zealousness very much. But I think what's, what's going to happen is you're going to hear back from them in a different way. And then if you'll allow Melissa to work with Hillary Watt, let them get to you what Tedum needs. And we're going to maybe need a few days for that. So you may not be able to get your answer till next Monday, if that's all right. Judge, that's fine. And I, I just wanted to, to add to your comments, but also to kind of go to a close, is that that information of how the, all the reimbursement was going to work, possibly from the state or from FEMA, right. are all goods. And all those things, Judge, do is enhance the reason why this should be done. Uh, because if we, we, the district has the cash, we can put $3 million, we own the facility, Spawn's probably going to be agreeable. They may ask for some other stuff, but right. they're probably going to be agreeable to the hospital. So if we can put this thing online, have it locally, have a facility that rings 9.5 out of 10 bells in terms of the ACS requirements and stuff that need to be done, we can keep the patients in our community in the event that we have an overflow. We don't have to send them to McAllen. You don't have to send them to Laredo. You don't have to send them to San Antonio. And on top of that, if we can get, you know, 50 cents on the dollar reimbursed, I mean, we're really in the end only out a million and a half or a million, whatever the final number is. Uh, but the hospital district's commitment to this would be the $3 million. We're not underwriting operating costs. 
the providers that would be in there. We expected to do the billing and collect. You're not going to be the hospital. You want to right. make sure you tell everybody that right. you're not the operator. We don't have a, we don't have a provider number. We can't be the operator. Right. So what we felt like our role in this was to benefit the, the community. What was needed now was to put the money in place to make sure that it was ready to go when it was used. And we asked the providers to commit at some point uh, to using it. And if the federal government or the state's willing to come back in and help pay for that, that's even better. Uh, but we think it's a bona fide role for the district to step up and do this kind of things because we can. We own the facility. It beats the alternative. And given our situation, our uniqueness, it seems to make the best sense. And just for the public, one of the things that we brought up to you all that's super important to understand when we talk about vulnerable populations is that we have a 20% uninsured population here. Nobody knows that more than you, Johnny, because from the indigent care that the hospital district provides. But it, it when you're 8% higher than your state's average on uninsured, it's an issue for your community. And when you look at our standing versus all the counties that are in our rack, I mean, I think it runs from 100, in the rankings of counties, there's 254. We're anywhere from 150 to 224 on low end what our outcomes are for our people in diabetes and re in all these things that people are talking about. So we had a, a strong justification to put this forward based on our own health care statistics. And that was one of the things that we're going to um, point out in our written plan is that you can't go forward not no, make, b basing information on eight weeks of data. That was the one thing that all the, that all the speakers said today, is that the data drives the policy. Whether it's an economic calamity is part of your data, or whether it's surge capacity, PPE, or lack thereof, data drives decisions. And the data that this county has and this state has and our RAC region has is that if you get hit in one pod, you will use those 40 rooms like that. And that's why it was so important to um, to bring it forth and to give you, you're the only owner, you're the only one that can decide. This court cannot make a decision for your building. And this court cannot make a decision for the tenant. And so I think that was really confusing and I recognize that now and I'm sorry that we created that confusion. Uh, but I think it's really important that, that um, that we keep going forward in this process. We're not um, anywhere, there's no commitment that's been made that says we're ready to go start work because we need certain things to happen. But you were phase one of that work plan. And I'll just continue the dialogue with you after this meeting and until we get the answer that the state says. And if the state says no, well then we'll know that we've done our job anyway, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, there's a lot of things that we do every day in emergency management that don't pan out. But this, of course, is it might affect our community, but it really affects our region. And um, we're going to have to really give a lot of thought to why we should fill out that census. But that census is absolutely critical because when you start thinking of the fact that it's your backdoor hospital that's treating a million people, you better get your federal dollars <laughs> because that's that's what's required. And so I really think that we're understanding a lot more about our hosp about our political processes. Our hospital districts play a very important role. Um, and the other thing is on our next workshop, there's been a lot of talk about behavioral health. I think it's a good idea for you to bring Mike in and really give us an update. They've done a ton of stuff to improve behavioral health access at times where group therapies aren't happening and people aren't going to their counseling. And I know maybe the court would appreciate that. I think I'm going to ask you to, I mean, I'll ask him too, but through our, and, and same thing with our opioid task force. I think we should bring in our communicators and have them tell us what's going on. How about some questions for Johnny? There's got to be a lot of questions for Johnny. I have some. Go ahead. Um, if no provider comes forward, what happens to the project? If you have no, none of them that say, okay, I'm going to do it. Um, Commissioner, I think the way the board laid it out is if none of them come forward. Well, let me first say, um, I'm not sure what they're going to say. I don't know. It's like the judge said, whether it's going to be a straight up and down answer. 
because they also internally don't know what their what their abilities are going to be or not be. But to to get to your question, I think we'd have to come back to the drawing board and see what the next step is because part of this uh, it has to do with a, uh, what could be a local problem, but it also could be whether it's a regional one. And so the question would become is whether we have a role or not in uh, in in doing something on the regional basis. But we're trying to take it one step at a time, Commissioner. I don't want to presuppose a decision because there are a lot of dynamics at work right now. Uh, but the for the board felt most comfortable if we could be assured that at least one of the local health care systems was going to step forward and use it. Um, like I said, I don't want to presuppose the answer. All I can say is we'll go back and take a look at it and see where we go from there. Okay, well, and I, I know the judge well enough to know that she probably – probably has visited with them or she wouldn't come up with something thinking it would fail. But so w weren't y'all come up with a timeline at for 48 hours? Where'd that timeline? I don't know because I didn't get that memo either. <laughs> <laughs> Judge, it, it all has to do with some collateral communications we have going on with Spawn. You may recall there was a list of things I asked the district to consider. So the letter was really meant to be something that um, stimulated the conversation. Uh, I think we all full well knew that they couldn't reply. But it was enough to stimulate the conversation for them to uh, come back and give it some thought. It also is to allow some uh, stimulation of what the process could do with TEDM and, and all these other factors that came in. Uh, is it short timeline? Yes, but that was by design. And so we can come back when we get the responses and take a look and see what's come in and reevaluate. I mean, we, we can get a special meeting called at any time, satisfying the posting rules, of course, uh, to address it. And the reason I say that is when you're considering something like this, to me, to rush it is not effective. It just I just don't think you should rush things. But everyone knows where I stand on this. I just and it's not a criticism of you, Judge. It's that's not. okay. I just I, I don't like the idea. We know and Jack, I think you're the only one that's here in the court made the decision to tear the building down. And I'm assuming that decision is still stands. But to spend three million dollars on a building that we know we're gonna tear down, it was like when I brought up Hilltop. You know, you don't put that kind of money into a capital improvement for that for something that is that old. And um, so that, that's a real concern for me. And, to me and, and that's not saying that I value this money over life. That's not true because we do have hospital beds. Even the governor said we had plenty of hospital and hospital beds. And at that time it was two. I think we have five now. And so that's a concern for me because of taxpayers, because I know what taxpayers are going through right now. They're losing stuff. They've lost their jobs, and they look at us, and we're spending $3 million for this. So that's a concern of mine, which doesn't matter because the judge gets to make that decision as EOC. Do I wish you had came to us? I do because you didn't have to. But to me, just out of respect for us to come to say, hey, look, this is what I'm thinking of doing. What do you think? Would have been appreciated. And, and I really do respect exactly what you said, and that's why I thought, honestly, when we had that, meeting of controversy I called Tyner and said Tyner get get a workshop I mean planned because I want to make sure that everybody gets to hear what the genesis of it was what the concerns are what the criticisms are and there's no doubt in in any dollar is important and I'm not trying to portray the hospital district as uh, a, a miser over there but their bonding capacity is probably 240 million and they have zero debt zero debt and they have a, a charge by the state it's one of our unfunded mandates and that's to take care of the health of the community if they don't use their money then what good is us paying into it and so i think as a taxpayer you can also see it the way you see it as boy you better make sure it's a wise decision but i can also say that if you don't prepare you don't have time to do it when you have a problem if we have a nursing home or a mirador any any place that has a lot of people and you have a major outbreak there you will you will be not only on the news but you will not have the type of segregation and sequestration that we really thought that this a hospital could provide and I want to emphasize about the demolition you absolutely are t on spot target on we are demolishing memorial it has a date of 2023 but it's going to actually happen before 2023 and the reason it's expensive anywhere from one and a half to three million is because in order to the contagion we could do it a lot cheaper but the contagion that the disease needs negative pressure system and these these are specialized units that are very expensive and so the
the reason it's up to that amount of money is because of the nature of the disease. Let's say we were just in war and we were triaging people, just normal battlefield wounds. You wouldn't need negative pressure, even though it's still life or death. But because of this disease, it has to have this specialized air conditioning, if you will, um, that creates a vacuum so that the, the air doesn't contaminate, right? The little droplets and stuff don't get and infect other people. So that piece of it is going to be expensive no matter where you do it. Um, I just believe that um, having an OR and a, a lab, I mean, just having it where it is makes it so great. And then I don't know about you, but I'll be glad to tear it down <laughs> after COVID has a vaccine because never want to think about that again or see it again. And it's slated, nothing changes on the demolition. We did, just so you know, because the taxpayer money matters to me and, and the, 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 what is it, the stewardship or the fiduciary duty, I tried to convince them that we could, and I still think we can do it, but Johnny's a skeptic on this, but, but I still think that you could separate the buildings, the bad building, the tower that has the asbestos from this two-story addition, and we could use this building in the future for something else. Um, given that we're going to put some negative, some good systems in. And Johnny's skeptical because, you know, it's an old building and you don't know what you don't know. But I think that we'll know that once we, that's something that we talked about. He said, well, maybe you're right. Maybe we can get five years out of it or 10 years. And I said, well, that's a good value if you can get five years out of it afterwards. It's not a, a building that you'd probably want to put 20 million in, but but somewhere between one and a half and two and a half, you if you could get five years late, uh, five years life after it for like a jail diversion center, or ten years life would be really wonderful. That would be worth it. And we talked about it. And it's not that he uh, that he knows better than me or I know better than him. We both agree that it's a fifty fifty. We just couldn't promise you or the taxpayer that it could be utilized in the future because we would have to run the analysis to figure out from an engineering standpoint, uh, how good the building is. And we're really not going to know that until we start moving, until we start doing some of the stuff. So it's, we, could, we could get lucky, but we could get unlucky and that it's, it can't be used again. But I will say that um, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's Houston or, or, or Dallas, you're hearing about these massive amounts of money being put into these sites. We don't have to worry about that because we don't have the population that Harris County has or Dallas County. Uh, and they're into the double digits and millions on preparation for these sites. Ours is really a regional site. And again, because I don't know a lot about hospital administration, Johnny's been in it for over 30 years. I do trust him when he says that's a reasonable request. In fact, I was like shaking almost when I told him two million and he said, ugh. You know, in the hospital world, that's not that's not the an expenditure that you need to worry about. When I talked to the FEMA person, he said the same thing. I mean, that's 